So where is Manas has come? He is coming, sir. He told the charge. Yes, sir. Okay, where, where is my talk now? Okay, here, here. <coughs> Uh, this one, huh? Hello, hello. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we are already 20 minutes late. We start off with the program directly, the PG teaching program by, by Dr. Suresh and I will say. Yeah, okay. The most difficult part of the brain, parietal lobe. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, and surgeon's good perspective. Good morning. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, uh, actually, you know, I lost one of my very close uh, friends, professor of neurology past head of the department at Chitra, Sanjeev Thomas. So this is a sad thing for me, but still, I have to do this. And, you know, I, I was asked by Manas to uh, take a, a topic. So I, I thought I will do parietal low functions. Eh? And then yesterday, uh, I saw the beautiful presentation by Professor Subhash, and then only I realized. And then Manas told parietal low for the neurosurgeons. Eh? So I was just wondering what is there only, you know? All these days, intrinsic lesions, we used to put a section and take it out. Eh? We never used to bother. And now, what has happened, you know, uh, say, for a eloquent area, frondotemporoinsular, especially if it's a low-grade glioma, the fashion of the day is to do radical resection, uh, preserving neurological functions by doing awake surgery with... Uh, the cortical mapping and subcortical mapping, intraoperative mapping. So that has become the fashion of the day, especially for left-sided lesions. Because of deep uh, speed circuits, so this is mandatory to preserve a good functional outcome. So I was just wondering what parietal or what thing I have to talk. So I thought I will look at the deep circuits, subcortical circuits, and uh, what is happening in the world today for the intrinsic lesion of the uh, parietal lobe. So I'll just run through the slides. Anatomy we saw, you know, it, it has got a post-central gyrus and behind that two, a big area, which is uh, divided into superior and inferior half by intraparietal sulcus. So intraparietal sulcus divides that part into superior parietal lobule and inferior parietal lobule. Superior parietal lobule doesn't have much of... Uh, uh, function which I will tell, but uh, inferior parietal lobule has got a big function. So you know, all of us know about Jetsman syndrome, other things and all. And uh, so this is, you know, surgery under general anesthesia with cortical stimulation and SSCP cannot assess language and visual function. And because, you know, low-grade gliomas, they often infiltrate eloquent parenchyma where function may be at least partially preserved if, if we can do awake surgery. So now, over the past few years, decades, glioma surgery has benefited from advances in MR, intraoperative MR, functional MR, intraoperative fluorescence, everything. But, you know, the white matter surgery, white matter tract-based surgery, with cortical and subcortical electrostimulation under local anesthesia is a very, very valuable tool for balancing the trade-off between functional preservation and maximum resection for low-grade glioma. So I will talk of these uh, circuits inside the uh, parietal lobe. So be before that, as I told, it has got four components, four central gyrus, then these two lobules as seen here. So what you are seeing here, I think I can, you have this thing here, right? So this is also not working. Eh? It's working. 
is it work is it working yeah so what what you are seeing there is you know that red one is the post central gyrus behind that yellow is the the so that that green one is the uh, supra marginal gyrus and behind that you have the angular gyrus they are below the intraparietal sulcus which is seen in that white dot again you can see so this one and three are very eloquent area especially on the left side while two above the intraparietal sulcus superior parietal lobule is not that eloquent and immediately you can see the medial hemisphere you can see that two the superior parietal lobule extends to the medial hemisphere and it is called the precuneus and in front of that the red thing is the uh, sub uh, parietal sulcus so they are also uh, eloquent and then you can see the precuneus extends to that uh, uh, core this cingulate gyrus that red one there so they are all that is a part of the temporal lobe so this is that uh, zones which we have seen and uh, the posterior part of the cingulum is uh, part of the limbic system but it is incorporated into parietal lobe as we have seen here so the parietal lobe surgery is related to the ventricular system and main white matter tracts of the sagittal striatum. I will tell about all this in a few minutes. So, uh, so the white matter tracts are, you know, these tracts run above the sylvian fissure, which is called the dorsal system. And one which go below, it's called the ventral thing. So these tracts either cross the central sulcus or the lymen insulae. So dorsal stream, which is upstream. So in the forest, it is the arcuate fasciculus and superior longitudinal fasciculus. And this is called the where or how pathway. Yesterday, we heard from our neurologist everything about this. And the ventral stream, it is the it carries information related to the object form and recognition, which is called what pathway. It is So it is associated with semantic processes while arcuate fasciculus and superior longitudinal fascicular are for verbal repetition. Then this is uh, this is these tracks we are seeing. This is the dorsal stream here. Dorsal stream and this is the ventral stream, which I will tell a little bit in detail. So what is this arcuate fasciculus? This is probably the most well-known association tract and it is so named because of its arc-like trajectory. Uh, so and you know what it is thought to be the primary neural substrate mapping sound to meaning and it connects the Wernicke's area to Broca's area. And it connects the lateral temporal gyre with ventrolateral frontal gyre. It is one of the most important tracks uh, which we map during uh, all surgery, all parietal lobe surgery. And then we have the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is another part of the dorsal stream. And it is the purely parieto frontal tract traversing the upper white matter in the cerebral hemisphere. Many a time people used to confuse it with arcuate fasciculus. So superior longitudinal fasciculus is a two-part system, a cell of dorsal and a cell of ventral. And a cell of one, in fact, is part of the cingulum. And a cell of four also, no people know that it is the arcuate fasciculus. Just to tell about the ventral stream. Ventral stream, you have the IFOP. This is also related to sagittal striatum. So what is the sagittal striatum? Sagittal striatum is a group of white crossroads of white matter fibers, which is just lateral to the uh, tapetum. Uh, tapetum of the ventricle, uh, tapetum of the atrium. Lateral to that, you get the optic radiation. Then you get uh, lots of fibers. One is this. IFOF, which has, which has a big function, is thought to be is a semantic deficit you will get, and it is one of the tracks which we monitor during surgery. And then, of course, optic radiation is just lateral to the tapetum. So, when you go to the depth of uh, angular gyrus, in the depth you get the tapetum, which is the lateral boundary of atrium. Then you get the optic radiation. And then after that, you get the IFOF, and then below that, you get inferior longitudinal fasciculus. 
So this is inferior longitudinal fasciculus. It is implicated again in semantic memory. Yesterday we heard from neurologists is, uh, uh, about I, uh, inferior longitudinal fasciculus and its implications in facial recognition and all. So this is what you have a ventral stream, you have a dorsal stream. And then what is it? these things are the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula. It is closely related to unsinate fasciculus and IFOP, while the superior limiting sulcus of the insula is related to the SLF and arcuate fasciculus. So this is the insula. You, you can see this uh, beautifully, this uh, ventral stream uh, of fibers. This is unsinate fasciculus. And this, this is what... Uh, what we call the uh, sagittal striatum. So this is what I have told. It is situated deep to the arcuate and SLF complex. Arcuate and uh, fasciculus and SLF complex are in the depths of supramarginal gyrus, while uh, optic radiation and IFOF and inferior longitudinal fasciculus are in the depths of angular gyrus. So this is that beautiful picture again. And then... The, now the location, you know, uh, the, I will just skip all this uh, just to show subcortical functions cannot be assessed in unconscious patients. So uh, the functional limits of resection can be identified only by awake, intraoperative brain mapping. So this is what we do in uh, tumors located in supramarginal gyrus and uh, angular gyrus. This is lateral position, while those located in the superior parietal lobe. This is now super in position, and uh, uh, the white. This is what I was telling you. The white matter tracks beneath the supramarginal gyrus. They correspond in the depth to the horizontal fibers of L SLF and uh, arcuate fasciculus. While and uh, this is what you can see that uh, fibers there. This is the area of the parietal lobe. And so, again, to show that. Uh, uh, the area which which we are interested this is a crossroad between dorsal and ventral strip and also the sagittal striatum so what we do is you know we do brain mapping with direct cortical and subcortical electrical stimulation also one can use preoperative uh, diffusion tensor imaging intraoperative navigation and also intraoperative mri they all work hand in glove and uh, Neuro navigation lacks accuracy while this is, you know, direct electrical stimulation gives direct feedback. So, what we do is say uh, all procedures are done under a sleep awake, a sleep technique, wide craniotomy, tumor margins are verified with ultrasonography. Then, prior to tumor resection, sensory motor mapping, these are the settings, uh, how they uh, map this thing. And uh, in a patient at rest, involuntary movements and paresthesias are induced when primary motors and sensory cortex are stimulated. Positive language sites, cortical sites are identified. And uh, the, the resection above the uh, intraparietal sulcus is more, most commonly negative to mapping. So after completion of cortical mapping, tumor removal is started. And at the same time, subcortical stimulation also is started. And from a lateral trajectory in the supramarginal gyrus area, ALF, SLF complex is at a depth of around 2.5 centimeters. So when you stimulate, when you are reaching that area, AF, SLF complex results in expressive aphasia, paraphasia, repetition disorders, etc., etc. On the non dominant hemisphere, Stimulation of AF SLF complex may result in contralateral hemi neglect syndrome, which was taught to us yesterday. And then about the angular gyrus, I told you it is in the depth, it is a sagittal striatum formed by the optic radiation, IFOF, and inferior longitudinal fasciculus. This is also at a depth of around 2.5 to 3 uh, to centimeters from the cortical surface. And stimulation of this IFOF may result in disturbances, reading and writing tasks. So we anterior border of the resection of low-grade glioma is the primary motor cortex 
posterior border is limited by the calcrean sulcus and Wernicke's language area is located mainly within the posterior segment of uh, superior temporal gyrus. Sorry, I'm just finishing. So these are some of the images, you know. You, you, you can see the corticospinal tract in blue is ventral and you can see the tumor is medial to these uh, subcortical fibers and these are the images and post pre-op area and post-op resection. And this is at another where it is medial to the uh, fibers and this is with cortical mapping, uh, total removal. So in conclusion, awake surgery with cortical and subcortical mapping using direct electrical stimulation has become gold standard technique to improve the extent of resection and reduce morbidity while resecting tumors. So it not only monitors motor function, but language function and neurocognitive functions and vision. I think I'll finish here. I have got one more talk there. Actually, that is approach to the ventricle. I will skip that. It will be there. I am giving that uh, all the approaches to atrium, which is also part of a parietal lobe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Any of there's any no questions. Everyone is clear about the parietal lobes, surgeon's perspective. Yeah. Uh, next, I'll call Dr. Vivek. I think Vivek, you are giving two talks to back to back. One is clinical approach to large and abnormal shape of it, and another is I think advances in MRI. Over to Vivek. Vivek is professor of neurosurgery at Ames, New Delhi. Thank you, Dr. Subodh and Dr. Nair, and uh, thanks to Dr. Manas. I am here to present a talk on clinical approach to large and abnormal head shape. I think the talk initially was on large head, but Dr. Dhawal was very considerate. He added abnormal head to it also. <laughs> and this topic cannot be finished in 15 minutes, honestly. So I thought, how should I be speaking? And then I thought, maybe all these people here are residents yesterday, I realized, and I believe that you want this talk to be tailored in a manner so that you can go back. And maybe if you have a question like this in exam, you should be able to write it. And um, recently I was framing questions for DNB and we keep on asking similar questions in OSCE where you are supposed to write one, two line answers and maybe a paragraph on things. So let us see if you look at these pictures here. So all these children have got an abnormal head and you can make out in this picture itself. But the thing is that all of them have got a different diagnosis altogether. The first child has a tumor. The second child has craniosynostosis. The next child has communicating hydrocephalus, which is congenital in nature. And the last child has a growing, uh, growing skull fracture because of which this child has abnormal head. So what you can realize is that abnormal head or a large head is just not related with hydrocephalus. It is related with many other pathologies which are there. So how you should be approaching that? The first thing that is taught in the clinics is that you should be very thorough with your clinical examination. You should be good at history taking. And you can only be good at history taking if you have a background knowledge at how many pathologies can present with this kind of problem. So always ask the parent, what about the details of the pregnancy, the delivery, the subsequent development of milestones, whether there are any changes in the child because of the raised pressure is there any fever, neck rigidity to rule out meningitis? Is there swelling anywhere else in the body? A lot of patients with lumbosacral meningomyelocele, they can have hydrocephalus. Is there any history of trauma? And what about the family history? Neurofibromatosis, tuberous sclerosis, all these children can have abnormal head size. And then when it comes to examination, a very common mistake done by our residents in outpatient clinic is that they do not advise the patient, they will measure the head circumference of the child, but they will not advise the relatives to go back at home and continue to do this measurement. You should teach the parents how to measure the head in your outpatient clinic. It is an orbitofrontal uh, circumference that is to be taken and you need to teach this to the parents and they should prepare a chart and when they come back to you again in the next OPD, 
they should come back with this chart. And you need to look at the growth curve, which is there, and look at where the child is featuring. Is the, is the head circumference increasing? Has it stabilized? Or is it a problem? You don't need to interve intervene immediately when you see the child in these kind of cases. You can delay the surgery and look at the progression. You look at the cafe all spots, depigmented spots, which can be in tuberous sclerosis. Look at cardiac, liver, and splenomegaly, because many disorders related to deposition diseases, they can also have these kind of problems. Look at fontanelle, cranial brui can be present in vein of gallon malformation, dysmorphic features are present in craniosynostosis, and abnormal digits are also related with uh, craniosynostosis. And what are the causes? This is a very, uh, a very, very busy slide according to me, but the points that I've highlighted are the cases which you are likely to see in neurosurgical OPD. Sometimes we get patients with achondroplasia, fibrous dysplasia, craniosynostosis, but more often than not, what you will see in your outpatient clinics are patients with craniosynostosis and hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus, you can all understand, it's basically either an obstructive hydrocephalus or a communicating hydrocephalus. And you all know the variety of uh, hydrocephalus which can be there, it can be infective, it can be because of an obstruction, because of a tumor. And then comes the last point, which is the parenchymal uh, or megencephalate in megencephaly due to metabolic or developmental causes. These patients, when you see them, you refer back to neurologist. So I will not talk about much on these th on these cases. But there is one more entity which is very common that is benign extraventricular hydrocephalus, or you can say benign enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces, which is there. And you must be clear about these cases, these children usually present in very young age, and this is not a pathology which requires or merits any treatment, but they can have macrocephaly. And interestingly, I read the literature two days back, and Dr. Manas, you will be surprised that this is one of the commonest causes for macrocephaly, rather than any pathological cause. So you must be clear that how you are going to define that this patient has an abnormal head. So you have interhemispheric fissure, you have sinocortical width and craniocortical width. And you need to know that these are the uh, figures which are mentioned there. These are the normal. If something is beyond that, that is only that is labeled as abnormal. So epidemiology-wise, the 5% of the pediatric population will have this kind of a problem of macrocephaly. And when the child deviates from two standard deviation, it is only then that child may merit any form of intervention. And some books also say that it is three standard deviation from the normal. It is only then that you need to merit any form of intervention. But my suggestion to all of you is that always look at the clinical aspect. Is the child deteriorating in any form? If the answer to this question is yes, it is only then you should think of intervening. Otherwise, you should wait. This is my common philosophy, and there are many investigations which are prescribed, but the ones that I've highlighted, you are all aware of that, that you can require, you will require a CT scan, an MRI. If a patient has an open fontanelle, you can do an ultrasound, which is a very good investigation. But I think you should have a friend in the neuroradiology department, and you should refer the patient to the same person again and again, so that he is able to really check what was the what was the ventricular size? If you send the patient to another person, he will come up with a different measurement which will not be correct. So same person should be evaluating. Then obviously you should look at the vision and lumbar puncture. And again, this is a very busy slide. I've just highlighted the points which are related with us. If the child has got progressive hydrocephalus and signs of raised ICP, then do these all kind of investigations which I've prescribed. If the child has got any other problem which you think is related with the deposition diseases, then all these parameters and tests can be done, but they are to be done by a neurologist, not by us. And this just shows how we do that, measure head circumference. The largest diameter is to be mentioned, and this you need to teach the parents. If you have a child where you think craniosynostosis, these are the things that you should know. I will give the slides here. You can take it, and you can write these points in your examination. And this is how you should be doing it. 
and always look at the eyes. Many children, they have problems which are related to the vision also. They are not able to tell initially, but get a VP examination done whenever it is required when you think the child is not following the objects correctly. And again, the same point, the only point that I want to highlight here is PET scan. It has got a role when you are not sure what is happening with the child. For example, when a child with craniosynostosis comes to our outpatient clinic, so occasionally when we are not sure, we do, we do get the spec scan done and we look at the perfusion studies, how much is the perfusion? And if the perfusion is lesser than what is considered to be normal, then we also again think of intervening. And this is how we do it. Now coming to the management aspect, I think I should be talking about some practical things which are not given in the books. So obviously when it comes to the medical management, you can start estrazolamide, osmotic diuretics can be given to the children, but very more often than not, I see the dosage of uh, estrazolamide being given to the children is higher without realizing the fact that these can lead to problems. Estrazolamide, as you all understand, is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and it can lead to metabolic acidosis in children. And also the tingling sensation and uh, rashes can happen. So one should be very clear that how much dosage we are going to prescribe, for how long we are going to prescribe it, and when we are going to stop. It cannot be prescribed to the children for n number of years altogether. When you see a patient with hydrocephalus and you see that patient has arrested hydrocephalus, you tend to sometimes prescribe, you come back to the next OPT and then you will stop the drug and you forget to stop the drug and it continues. This happens with us because we are consultants, occasionally a resident next resident will see an outpatient clinic and the resident will just not stop the drug because the consultant had started it. So think about stopping this drug. This is not a drug without side effects. It has got side effects. So you need to stop the drug. And then these are the surgical management options. And I believe that all of you understand the shunt and the ETV. These are the two best management options that these children have. But shunt has got its own myriad set of complications. And we must realize that the complications uh, if once they are created due to shunt, they are not easily curable. It's a very simple surgery, but at the end of the day, it can have a lot of complications. Look at this. The child had hydrocephalus. We did shunt from one side, again get blocked. We did shunt from the other side, again a problem. We did shunt from the frontal side, again a problem. We did shunt from this side, that side, every side, again a problem. And I remember there was an AIMS faculty whose son had uh, hydrocephalus and we had to revise the shunt at least 15 to 20 times. And this kind of issue can happen. But what we as surgeons should understand is that the, what are the physical principles which are related with shunt. And if we don't understand these principles, we are likely to make the mistakes. So one important thing that you must have read is during your class 9th or 10th is that the formula called as rho gh the problems associated with shunt can be it can drain less or it can drain more why will it drain more because we don't understand this formula we think that if the pressure is say 40 in the shunt then it will not drain if the pressure is less than 30 this is what we feel as surgeons, but this is not what is going to happen in actual life. Because the moment a person is sitting, the height from this place to the abdomen is more than 40 to 50 centimeters. And if you look at this formula, rho GH, it will always be more than 40 centimeter of water pressure, which will be there. So always in sitting and standing position, the shunt will drain. The most common shunt that we, we use is the Chhabra shunt. And the Chhabra shunt is based on a differential pressure valve, which is there. So this shunt is going to drain come what may, whatever pressure that you are going to use if the person is in a standing or a sitting position. Another thing that we forget sometimes is when the shunt is getting blocked, sometimes residents will take it out. They will put a connector and then they will again connect the tube to it. The more number of connectors that you have in the tubing, the higher are the chances that it will get blocked because the resistance keeps on increasing exponentially. If there is a kink in your tube, if there is an air bubble in your tube, the shunt will get blocked. And once it gets blocked, it's a problem. If it gets infected, it's a bigger problem. 
So these are the number of kind of shunt valves which are there in Vogue, differential, programmable, flow regulated, and gravity actuated. The most common ones that we use are differential pressure and programmable valves that we use. This is the Chhabra shunt we commonly use. So Chhabra shunt, remember, has got two valves, which are one is the slit valve, which you see at the end, and another is the ball and spring valve mechanism, which is at the top. And before you insert the shunt, you should flush it very well so that, so that it doesn't get blocked. There is no air bubble inside the assembly. And this is how you should be doing it. You have many programmable valves in the market. And if required, if patient is affording in a clear cut case of a congenital hydrocephalus, normal pressure hydrocephalus, you should think uh, to insert the programmable valve because you can change the setting. The thing that I te was telling you was about siphoning. So how do you stop siphoning if you see the slit ventricle? Should you just change the valve and increase it to higher pressure valve? This is never going to work because of the reason I told you. If you have to stop siphoning in a slit ventricle syndrome or a child who is over draining, the only way out probably is to put a anti-siphon device. So you must remember that shunt complications related to infections, they are horrible to manage. The only way to stop shunt complication is that you are very meticulous while you are doing surgery. There is no other way out. There are materials which can aid you, like uh, uh, this bactiseal catheter, which is shown here. It's an antibiotic impregnated catheter. It can elute rifampicin and clindamycin, which is embedded in it. And once you insert the shunt, you, it will start eluting the antibiotic. But the thing is that all shunts that you do occasionally, you dip the catheter inside the uh, saline and you flush it. But this is one of the catheters which you are not supposed to flush with the, uh, you are not supposed to dip it in the saline before you are going to insert because it will start eluting the antibiotic which is inserted in it. The other catheters which are silicon coated catheters and these kind of catheters, they are uh, good enough because they avoid uh, deposition of Staphylococcus aureus because they do not allow the bacteria to stick to themselves. And in case you have shunt infection, I think I've run out of time, but I will take just one or two minutes. If you have, if a child has shunt infection, exurize, give antibiotics, but more often than not, quickly change the shunt assembly. That's the only way out more often than not. And this is the end ISPN shunt protocol. You should wear gloves, do this, that, everything. You must practice it hard day in and day out. Only then you will be able to master the technique of doing the shunt in a correct manner. And this slide you can take from here. ETV again, I must talk one minute on ETV. Many of you think that it's the advanced procedure. And you will just go back from wherever you are studying and you will start doing it day in and day out after reading so many papers and you will land up with problems you will land up with failure why again because of the simple physics involved how is csf absorbed csf is absorbed when there is a pressure gradient when the heart beats the blood is sent to the brain and the brain pulsates the pressure increases and the csf is absorbed by the arachnoid granuli Imagine a child who has an open fontanelle. Whenever the heart beats, the fontanelle is open. The pressure gradient is not there. So if you create a stoma in this kind of a child who is very young, you are likely to invite failure because the arachnoid granuli are not accustomed to absorption in absence of pressure gradient. So that is why even if you will create the stoma, it will not absorb. So in very young children, if you have, have hydrocephalus, it is better to do shunt rather than do anything else. Craniosynostosis, I think I can't finish in one minute. The only thing is that I would like to say is pediatric evaluation, do that. Neurocognitive evaluation should be done. And obviously, you should be doing genetic tests. Young child, you can do endoscopic open surgeries required for older people. And this is how you should be doing it. Always remember that when you are talking with the parents, you must remember, they will ask you one simple question at the end. And that question is, what will happen to my child after this surgery? If this answer is not clear in your head, you will not be able to counsel the parents correctly. So this answer should be very clear in your head. And then remember, management of these children is not just dependent on you. You should have a team of people who should be doing it for you. So helmets, they can be utilized. And then comes the last part that is re related with rehabilitation. 
all these children will require neuro rehabilitation. We are very, very bad at it. At it. We don't have setups. So I think in coming years, I will propose to Dr. Manas that we should work towards developing good rehabilitation centers in the country where these children can, children can be sent. And just coming to the conclusions, we should take proper history, do proper examination, look at the radiology, talk with the radiologist, what it is it, and do a correct procedure and then send the children for rehabilitation. Okay? Thank you. So I'll present my next talk also. That is on advances in neuroimaging. So the topic was recent advances in neuroimaging, but I again saw that it has been changed to recent advances in MRI. So I've removed other slides and I'll talk specifically on MRI. But if we look at the history of imaging, so it's not something new. Probably when your father was born, it is at that time MRI was already in vogue. So what is it new that we are doing at present? But still, if you realize and look at the images of 1970s, which were there, you will realize we have come a long way. The present quality of MRI is fantastic. And it is only because of few simple reasons that the application and the software has improved tremendously in the last at least 10 years. The operating systems that are being utilized, they have improved tremendously. The hardware has improved. And over and above all, our understanding of disease has improved tremendously. Now we know that if something looks like X, it has a meaning and it is related with Y. And that is one of the reasons why it has improved. And I see there is a lecture on the basics of MRI. So I will just skip the slide so that the person who is next, he will talk about it. And interestingly, I gave this question yesterday to a software that I want an image on neuroimaging and this is what the software gave me. And I gave the next question to the software that I want how the software, how the imaging can be utilized for clinical applications? Because there are two aspects to imaging. One is diagnosis. So we'll talk about it. And one is applications, how we are going to use it during surgery. And this is an AI generated image for all of you. So we all understand, I mean, these are T1, T2 and flare weight images. As students, you must understand these three basic images at least. Because again and again, you will be asked this question in examination. In flare, the CSF appears darker and the white matter also appears darker. And if you look at these images, lot of things you can interpret. You can make out where there is tumor, where there is colloid cyst, whether there is any edema or not. And above all, if you again look at these images in T2 weighted images, you can look at the flow voids. Lesser number of flow voids is a problem. More number of flow voids is a bigger problem for a neurosurgeon because this patient is going to bleed terribly. What will be the consistency of the tumor? Whether it's going to be hard, whether it's going to be soft. Again, T2-weighted images, they will tell you a lot. So basic imaging gives you a lot of information. And for that, I can't teach you in 15 minutes. You need to sit again and again with your radiologist. Once you have seen the images, go back to OT, operate that patient, and relate it with what the radiologist had told you. Ask these questions. How hard do you think this tumor will be? How vascular do you think this tumor will be? What are the relations of the tumor with the some eloquent structures around it? Pat suppression images, we used a lot of these images during our pituitary surgery, as well as orbital tumors. We use that. Now, what are the factors which have led to development of new MRI techniques? One is that improved strength of the magnets. Now, from 0.25 Tesla, we have magnets up to 7 Tesla. We have intraoperative MRI magnets, which are 1.5 Tesla, better magnets, 3 Tesla and 7 Tesla. But don't ever think that Tesla relates to the quality. It does, but occasionally you don't require. If you want to travel in Hyderabad, if you don't have Rolls Royce still, you can go to any place from one point to another using a Maruti car as well. Improved gradient coil, better software and improved understanding of disease. This is 7 Tesla MRI, which is very expensive. I don't think anywhere in the country we have seven Tesla MRI. It is basically for research use. Ames is in the process of buying one at a terribly high cost. I don't know what we are going to do with it, but as an institution, maybe we can afford it. 
It can be utilized for epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, some neurological diseases. It will give higher resolution images, as you can see, very good quality imaging is available. And what are the newer techniques of MRI? The newer techniques of MRI are, we were speaking yesterday, it says DTI, fMRI, MRA, and SWI, DWI, and perfusion images. And we will just look at some of these pictures. So this is constructive interference in steady state. And this is what we were talking yesterday in that case where the patient had uh, hemifacial spasm. So this is a very good quality T2-weighted MRI, which you should advise a patient when you have patients where you think there is a vascular abnormality or you want to look at the nerves. Even this quality of MRI is required when you are developing some uh, thing on a simulator because the simulator will not pick up the nerves. To define what nerves are and how they do look like, this is the MRI, you remember, that you will require. Nerve and vasculature. They can be anatomically delineated in this kind of a sequence which is here. And again, for brachial plexus, you can do that. For CSF rhinorias, you can do this kind of an MRI because it gives you a good picture. Now, DWI imaging, yesterday Dr. Nair showed you CT perfusion. It's not a substitute for CT perfusion. When your patient comes with history which is related to TIA or a stroke, immediately do CT perfusion. It's not a substitute for that. But a good quality DWI imaging can be done in less than five minutes if a patient is able to hold the st head steady. And it will give you the information which you are looking for, that which area of the brain is getting infarcted, where the water molecular uh, restriction is there, that is the DWI image. But always interpret DWI imaging in relation to the ADC image. Because what happens is there is something phenomena called as T2 shine through. Remember that, you might get this question also, what is T2 shine through? So T2 shine through is when you have something which is looking bright on T2, it appears bright on DWI, but it disappears on the ADC image. That is T2 shine through. So that is not a pathology. It is maybe an edematous thing. Okay, remember this part that every time that you see a DWI image, you have to see the ADC image of that also. So DWI can also be utilized for uh, tumors, tumors which are very, very highly cellular. They also show restriction. Like here, it was a case of medulloblastoma. If patient has a GBM, there is necrosis. Again, it will get restricted because the water molecules, they will not, or the hydrogen ions, they will ha be having restriction. Again, cerebral abscesses, they can be delineated based on DWI imaging because they will have restriction. And very importantly, it is a modality of choice to differentiate between an epidermoid and a arachnoid cyst. Every time in exam, this question is asked, how will you differentiate between a arachnoid cyst and epidermoid or what is the differential diagnosis, you fib. So this is the modality. You ask for a DWI imaging, the restriction, if it is present, it's an epidermoid, right? Susceptibility weighted imaging sequences, again, they are T2 weighted sequences and they tell you where the iron deposition is higher. So iron deposition will be higher where there is blood. Where will be the blood? Blood will be in the blood vessels or if there is a bleed. So these are the sequences which will help you understand where the, what is the vascularity and in case there is a bleed, okay? And in cases like diffuse axonal injury, you can use this kind of a sequence to make out whether the injury is present or not. Hypertensive bleeds, many neurologists advise this to get the sequence done. GBM, you can see that the area is highly vascular and you should be careful while treading it. And then comes the role of perfusion MRI. So this MRI sequence is basically based on the fact that the blood to a particular area of the brain is flowing less and the software maps it for you. And it gives you a digital coding which can be red for areas which are highly perfused. It can be blue for areas which are less perfused. And in between, the color gradient will change depending upon the perfusion. So where are you interested in looking at this kind? These are the different kind of sequences. You can take the slide from here and it will help you in writing the exam. The DSC, DSC and ASL are sequences. The DSC sequence is basically requires contrast and can be done very quickly. Rest of the sequences, they, um, ASL is, can be done without contrast in case patient is not affording. So this diffusion, perfusion mis mismatch helps you identify the penumbra zone at least in cases where there is stroke. And if you see a big penumbra, then it basically means if you intervene right now, you may save some part of the brain. 
So you can do this kind of imaging to look at this. Then we do it very regularly as a follow-up in our patients of Moya Moya. And we do it because once you have done the EDAMS procedure or once you have done the revascularization procedure, we want to see how much perfusion has improved. So as part of the research protocol, we do it in Moya Moya patients of ours and we look what is the perfusion before and what has happening right now. Is it decreasing or is it increasing? Glioma recurrence, again, it's a hot topic of debate. How will you say that it's radiation necrosis versus the recurrence in glioma in a patient who has developed uh, some kind of a tumor again or a lesion after a radiation therapy has been given? So in case of increased perfusion, we think that it is related with the glioma recurrence. If the perfusion is decreased in a patient in the particular area, we say that it is radiation necrosis. In nutshell, this is it. So this earlier patient had recurrence you can see and this patient has radiation necrosis because there is no increase in perfusion so remember these are the few things where you can utilize this imaging magnetic resonance angiography we do it in patients where you have higher creatinine value where patient has got moya moya we do not want to do a dsa in these kind of patients we do magnetic resonance angiography there are various techniques of doing it the non-contrast methods, all of you know that they are called as TOF, time of flight sequence, PC, FSE, and arterial spin labeling. You can also do it with the contrast. Magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy, I believe that all of you must have seen in your outpatient clinics that in case your consultant has a doubt whether this is tumor or demyelination or something else, they will always prescribe MRS spectroscopy and they want to look at the choline peak, the creatinine peak, the NNA peak. So the lactate peak is there in patients with some kind of a infection, right? So it can be tubercular, it can be abscess, it can be anything. The choline peak you see in patients with glioma or tumors, it's a marker for cell membrane. Alanine is seen in meningiomas. In most of the meningiomas, we don't require MR spectroscopy because you just saw case yesterday that meningiomas, they are you uh, can be very easily diagnosed on simple MR. So these are the kind of MR spectroscopy, but now let me come to the last part, which is on related or relation to how these imaging can be utilized during surgery, the application part. And this has got uh, importance for all of you. I believe it's not given in books, but there have been significant improvement in this area. So what you should now advise patients is to get a volumetric sequence done. What is volumetric sequence? Volumetric sequence is you take one mm slices and they are not on a, uh, not, not in any plane, but they are neutral plane. They are at zero degree to the head. And these slices are taken up by the software and it gives you a constructed image, which helps you in planning better. So you will get a composite image like this, where you can see the tumor, where you can see the brain and if you look here, if you load this to, on any software which is available, it can be Osirix, it can be Brain Lab, it can be Metronix, it gives you a 3D image. And when you scroll through this image, whether you have navigation or not, you will realize where the tumor is. And you will be able to approach the tumor in a better manner. And I believe this is one of the biggest advances that has happened over a period of time. Then all these softwares give you the advantage of fusion. In case you have a very small lesion, if you take only MRI and you do stereotaxy, you are likely to fail. Because what happens with MRI is there is distortion. There are eddy currents which because of which distortion can happen. Whatever you may do, these distortions will persist. And when you put a needle inside brain, if you want millimetric accuracy, you are likely to miss it. So always do a CT scan, merge it on MR and then utilize it. So this is how it is to be done. Then you can utilize the software, build the, uh, basically look at the tumor. And then all these softwares, they are AI driven. They have got lakhs of MRI, which have been pushed into the software. And like old age, old years, you are not supposed to segment everything on your own. They can do a reasonably good job of providing you with a segmentation. They can identify GPI for you. They can identify focuses for you and can you please switch off this? Yeah. They can identify focuses for you. You can insert electrodes very easily. 
And then once you have inserted the electrode, the problem that we used to face in our uh, operation was that we will take the patient out, we will do a CT scan or an MRI later only to realize the lead is not well placed. Now this can be done inside the theater itself. If you have an O arm, you take an image, the image will not be of a good quality, but you can merge it on the uh, software. Once you merge the image, you will realize where your lead is and you can very clearly walk out with confidence that the lead has been placed in a good manner. Dr. Nair showed you some fantastic pictures about the DTI imaging, how it can be utilized. So you need to identify your region of interest, like you want the tracks between say frontal lobe and the occipital lobe where the tumor is, or, or is it from the motor cortex to the brainstem? And you place these region of interest and you draw the tracks and you try preserving them. It gives you the basic advantage because you know how the tumor is placed in relation to the tracks. You can plan your trajectory accordingly, approach the tumor accordingly, and the chances are that you will damage the patient lesser. Functional MRI, I'm not a big fan of this, though it's an advanced kind of imaging that is very recently talked about. But the fact is that functional MRI, unlike any other MRI, is dependent upon the user or the person who is doing it. Because what is functional MRI? You ask a person to tap the finger like this. And at that same point, the MRI is being done. But if this MRI is being done by a technician, he is least bothered what is happening to the patient. But you need to tell the software at which point the person was tapping the finger. Because the software will compare the MRI which was done before tapping and it will compare with the time when the person is tapping the finger. It is only then you will get the correct information. It is good for motor, but for speech, they're still erroneous and depends from which software you are utilizing. For speech, I do not rely on this software. I always do direct stimulation. And then you can utilize all these softwares to build the tracks and then plan the surgery. Then one more thing that new softwares have come up with is like, suppose you cannot excise the tumor completely. Say, for example, it's a petroclival meningioma or a meningioma which is medially placed in the cavernous sinus. It is present very near the ICA then obviously you are going to leave that tumor. So what at what point you are going to leave that tumor? That is also important. And you cannot do that. If you have this software, you can see whether this tumor can be given gamma knife or not. And it is at this point you can stop. So these software give you this uh, facility also. Then comes the ability to merge the DSA onto the intraoperative images. And it will tell you, Earlier, we used to do ultrasound or we used to inject a dye and look at the uh, microscope and see which is the artery, which is the vein in AVM. But here, these softwares provide you the understanding based on the DSA, which is merged, that where the artery is and which one is the vein. The artery is to be clipped first, the vein is to be clipped second. The next thing that has come up is that you can merge the intraoperative imaging with the MRI you can use this vein which is seen here and this is the last week i was doing a case of insular glamour so the vein i have traced and the vein has been merged with the software and then you can always even if there is a brain shift the software will adjust to it and you will be able to perform the surgery and localize the tracks better then there are many methods of doing intraoperative imaging modalities these are intraoperative MRI, terribly expensive, intraoperative CT, terribly expensive, 5 ALA, not available in the country. What is available in the country is intraoperative ultrasound. And we must know how to use it. It is a very good and friendly modality. If you have navigation which can be integrated with it, great. If you don't have a navigation which cannot be integrated with it, still it is very good because every setup has an uh, ultrasound and you can utilize it for cases and this is just last week that i was doing this is one day before i came here i'm using this modality to look at the tumor and these are the pictures and this is what the intraoperative impression was some residual was there and we completely excised it last part is how you look at the imaging and how you utilize it for training so comes the role of mixed reality you will have in next one and a half to two years you will have these gadgets everywhere in teaching institutions where they can be utilized for the sake of teaching and training. And this is our paper, which we have just published in the 
uh, neurosurgery focus, where it shows the use of the device to look at how you will be able to understand the craniovertebral junction anomaly. And I think our residents are doing it. Maybe Priya or Ak Akshay, they are utilizing it. And we have just come out with the soft, uh, this uh, paper, which is published in Neurosurgery Focus. So it will change the way we perceive imaging. And then comes the role of VR devices, which are there. They will help you plan better. We have the simulator in our uh, department. And occasionally, we utilize it to plan surgeries and train residents. And this is how imaging can we utilize to improve our understanding of the anatomy and how we are going to improve from there. So low field MRI, smaller MRIs, MEG, all these things are the future. And they will be there. And I thank you all for a very patient listening. And I'm sorry to exceed my time a little bit, but I think I must have at least provided you with a few food, food for thought. And this is the our workshop, which is going to happen from 7th. And whatever devices I've shown you, some of them you will be able to utilize uh, during the course of this workshop. And uh, I'm sure it is a good learning exercise for students. Okay, thank you. Philography. Sir, we do have uh, Meg in uh, our Manisa campus, which is the Brain Research Institute, and it is under Dr. P. S. Chandra. But I believe it's more of a research tool. Because again, MEG provides you with magnetic dipoles. I didn't go into that area because it's a whole new chapter in itself. It provides you with dipoles. And again, in my experience, in whichever patient of epilepsy I have seen, they're not fairly accurate. So I think they need to pour in more data into it to really understand the whole utility of it. So it's more for research purposes. I believe uh, right now, one or two residents, they have pieces on MEG and cases of tuberous sclerosis and others in epilepsy. And we are regularly, Dr. Manjari is using it for her cases for epilepsy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next, we move to Dr. Sita. Uh, sh she'll be talking on clinical approach to a child with intractable seizures. Yeah, actually, I have a talk on uh, an approach to reflexy in which I will be talking about the management in adults. So now we are going the reverse way, the drug refractory epilepsy, starting with the children. So coming to the, in 15 minutes, I will just give an overview of management of drug refractory epilepsy approach in children. So if you look at the uh, re response to drugs. Normally, all of us know that 30% of the people with epilepsy do not respond to the medication from the beginning, that is from the day one to go. And is it possible really for us to identify the 30% so that especially in children, you give an intervention so that you are um, helping them in improvement in their cognition, behavior, and also the seizure outcome. So usually non-responders are one third and there are another 10% who will be going into remission and again relapse. During the remission, the parents will say, no, no, I'll wait. And again, when there's a relapse, they will come and discuss with you, shall I go for surgery? So this keeps on happening. So it's important to create the awareness among the parents. So what is the definition of drug-resistant epilepsy when the child comes to the OPD? It is failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen anti-epileptic drugs, whether you have given as monotherapy, one followed by another, or you have tried simultaneously because the surgery burden is high. And usually in children, you wait for a minimum period of six months uh, to decide whether it is, in adults, it is two years. But in children, six months is good enough to decide whether do you go for a surgical option, especially when there is a lesion on MRI. So the ILA definition is the same, that is failure of adequate trials of two tolerated appropriately chosen anti seizer medications. Why it is a problem, especially in children, not only in adults. Children are more vulnerable to the side effects of medication as well as to the epilepsy. It has a great impact on the quality of life because of seizures, they cannot go to school, falling every day, and sudden unexpected death. There are at least two. 0.4% uh, um, of the children may die or 1 in 1,000 may die suddenly, uh, which is uh, goes beyond. You don't witness a seizure, but they are found dead. So this is also one of the common problems, especially when there is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure and they have a 
uh, tremendous risk for cognitive impairment. Their IQs are definitely always less compared to their peers. And the drugs as well as the epilepsy itself will have an impact on the personality. And uh, almost, uh, I will say, 80% of the children will have personality problems, either in the form of only a personality problem or a behavioral disorder or even ADHD. Whereas 30 to 40 percent will have associated psychiatric illness because we need to evaluate all this. It's not only about the seizures. And in addition, it is a cost for the family in the long run. So coming to the pharmacotherapy, I will not go into the details. We should follow all the guidelines, which I will discuss in the next uh, session. And then because there is something called medical management of refractory epilepsy, it's not always surgery. So that's what we do in most of the people who are not suitable for surgery or not willing for surgery. But normally, how many AEDs one should try? So ideally, it should be two to the maximum of three, but never more than three. But in all the prescriptions, we see four, five, six drugs, which never helps. Most of the time in the OPD, my duty is to remove the drugs and optimize two to three anti seizer medications. That's what we should do. And then in addition to this one, everybody should know that there is a role for ketogenic diet in children with epilepsy, especially the refractory epilepsies. This has a great role in genetic epilepsies and metabolic epilepsies and in the so-called myoclonic epilepsies where the children keep on falling with sudden injuries with a tonic spasms or a flexion or an extent type, extension type of spasms. And there is something uh, modified Atkins's diet. There's a very nice paper from Anjali's group from Ames on this. So all this, we have a dietitian who will give them the chart and definitely it makes a difference. And this is used in medically refractory seizures in children, especially GLUT1 deficiency. And all these are to identify, there are separate sessions to understand how to identify these. So epilepsy is a big, uh, it's a vast subject and each person or a child is totally different. So most important is spending the time in the OPDs and, and on the evaluation. Then why children are different from the adults? Because the seizer burden is way, always high in children. Children get daily seizures, weekly seizures. Adults get one or two in a month or even less on me medication. And the seizures are associated with developmental arrest or even regression. They say the child is totally fine till seven years of age. Once the seizure started, scholastic performance comes down, ADHD, aggressive behavior, everything starts. And we, we do have age specific etiologies. Extra temporal lobe epilepsies are common in children, whereas temporal lobe epilepsy is common in adults, which is hippocampal sclerosis. And focal cortical dysplasia is the commonest substrate in children, whereas hippocampal sclerosis is the commonest substrate in adults. And even if the epilepsy is focal, everything will look generalized. The seizure is generalized uh, and even the EEGs are generalized. Ictal EEG onsets are generalized. So it doesn't negate the child from undergoing any intervention, either surgical or medical. And most important factor is the plasticity of the brain. The early you intervene, even if there is a deficit like a hemiparesis or a language deficit, because of plasticity, uh, the child development and improvement is much more. That's why we always motivate the parents to undergo early surgery. And this point, point also has to be explained. And in this refractory epilepsy in pediatrics, uh, what is the aim of epilepsy surgery? The epilepsy surgery is not equal to lesionectomy. So it is removal of the epileptogenic zone, which usually includes a network, which is the lesion, along with the network surrounding the lesion. And it should render the child free of disabling seizures and also prevent the side effects. That is, there should be a good improvement in the physical, cognitive and social aspects of life of the child. And also improve the quality of life of the parents, family and also the social system. What are the epilepsy surgery procedures available in children? We have two important types, the resective surgery and the disconnection surgery broadly. Resective surgery is removal of the epileptogenic uh, region. Uh, so this, the typical example is a temporal lobe uh, lesion like a DNET or a hippocampal sclerosis where you do uh, ATL with AH and that is temporal lobectomy or the standard temporal lobectomy. Lesionectomy is usually done in extra temporal lobe epilepsies. Hemispherectomy or functional hemispherotomy is also a resective procedure nowadays because you are rendering them. It is one of the surgeries which has an excellent outcome compared to temporal lobectomy or lesionectomy. And the disconnection surgeries is nothing but you will you are not removing the lesion, but you are interrupting the pathways. The common ones are corpus callosotomy and also hypothalamic hematoma. In these two, you are not aiming for the seizure of freedom, but you are aiming for it. These are palliative procedures where you reduce the burden of epilepsy by 70 to 90 percent so that the quality of life of the child and the family improves. But more important for all of us to know is the surgically remediable epilepsies and you bring these children early 
uh, so that you go, you offer a good quality of life. Uh, so what are these surgically remedial epilepsies? The commonest is developmental abnormalities. That is a focal cortical dysplasia or sometimes the heterotopias and the low-grade tumors like a D-net. The battery is low. Can you please connect? Uh, or a low-grade gliomas or a ganglioglioma and the vascular lesions, especially the cavernomas and focal gliosis and infective lesions like a calcified granulomas. And then hippocampal sclerosis also contributes to around 15% of the cases in children. So these are easy and ideal candidates and should be part of basic epilepsy surgery program. I think every center can develop this because it doesn't need much infrastructure except for having a, uh, and it is cost effective for the family also. So the aim is, uh, what is the aim? Your first is most important that all of us should know, especially the surgical uh, friends that it, there should be a pre-surgical evaluation. We do get so many patients where the lesion is removed, but they are not schizophrenic. free. So the idea of pre-surgical evaluation is to identify the location and extent of the epileptogenic zone. And there are so many coincidental neurosurgical lesions and whatever you see may not be responsible for the epilepsy, which is refractory and delineate the lesions, which is responsible. There should be something called electroclinical radiological correlation. So that is how you do this uh, evaluation where first is the MRI, which is the key. If the lesion is there, the seizure freedom is almost more than 85% in, especially the temporal of surgeries and 70% in extra temporal. Uh, and irritative zone, you identify by doing an interictal EEG, electrocarticography and a MEG. Symptomatogenic zone is identified by the seizure semiology. And in addition, you do advanced investigations like uh, ictal spec, ictal uh, invasive, uh, means uh, FDG, PET, these are all functional studies. I will not go into the details because of lack of time. But must-do investigations are a high resolution, a 3 Tesla MRI, a video scalp PEG monitoring, at least for a few days and record two or more seizures, and a good neuropsychological assessment. You need to have the baseline to compare what are the improvements happening. And then, in addition, you need the complementary investigations uh, like a FDG, PET, ictal SPECT, and in addition, for the function of the brain, especially in the extra temporal epilepsies, we do a DTI, a functional MRI, and sometimes a MEG study. So these are the typical lesions in temporal epilepsy, like a ganglioglioma, low-grade glioma, cavernoma, focal cortical dysplasia, DNETs. In this part of the country, focal calcifications are common, and a hippocampal sclerosis in children. Whereas in extra temporals, again, focal cortical dysplasias, low-grade gliomas, gliosis is very common. Especially in patients who come with HIEs, usually they are candidates for posterior disconnection, especially when it is unilateral. So just to show, if you look at this child, she keeps on falling. And most of the time, it is not even identified as epilepsy. So her problem is she'll be just sitting and falling. And she comes with a, uh, the, she has daily episodes, later identified as seizures by pediatric neurologist, started on medication. She has a very good normal birth and development. She's 14 months when she came to us. And then if you do a CT scan itself shows that there is a D-net located in the temporal uh, lobe. And then the EEG, if you see, is everything is generalized. So this child has un undergone a detailed evaluation and a simple resection of the lesion guided by electrocarticography, which is a must for all the lesions to decide the extent of resection. Because following ECOGs, you do two, three extra resections beyond what you have done, and that really helps. So the next child, if you see, this child has a tonic seizures. So he, is a, he came to us at three and a half years with a high seizure burden of almost daily seizures and getting injured. There are these tonic seizures children usually develop injuries over the forehead or the back because they keep falling and he didn't have any language development. So these are the events which keep on causing injuries. When he came to us, his IQ is 68. And this is how, if you see, the MRI was reported as normal except from subtle atrophy on the left. And EEG is everything is generalized. And all of us were told to undergo invasive EEG. This child was operated when we were in NIMS. And, but however, we have done a PET which showed a left temporal hypometabolism and the parents are not ready for a CEG because of the finances. And this child underwent left ATL AH and today is 16 years old going to school uh, and also totally seizure free. But because we are scared to take up the medication, still on single anti seizure medication. And the next is a case of hippocampal sclerosis in a child. Children with hippocampal sclerosis will not have the typical seizures of staring, 
uh, automatisms, they, they can have generalized seizures, even focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. So this child presented with a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. And, but when we evaluated, the EEG is not temporal, but it is hemispherical, coming from the right hemisphere. But the only clear-cut evidence in this is a right hippocampal sclerosis. And this child underwent surgery, and he is now she is free for more than a decade. So in this the other investigations which helped was ictal spec showing right temporal lateralization and FDG pet showing a right temporal localization. With which that is what these these multimodality investigations are complementary to each other. You may not have concordance of all the investigations, but if you especially two out of three imaging modalities are concordant, one can go for surgery. Coming to extra temporal, this is a child who presents with. Uh, many tonic asymmetric seizures, which are typical of a frontal lobe seizures. So this she, when she came to us, she was 11 years old. Uh, and if you see, she gets head bending slowly, followed by asymmetric tonic movements of the upper as well as lower limbs, followed by the continuous involuntary movements of the lower limbs. So this is a typical of a frontal lobe epilepsy, where you can see that this is a typical type 2B focal cortical dysplasia where you see a hyperintensity along with a tail which is going up to the ventricles with a corresponding hypometabolism on the FDG pet. And this patient underwent surgery and now she has completed, she came to us when she was in ninth class. Now she completed her, uh, what is a post-graduation and working in, as in the hotel management and she is also employed. So this is how one can transform and this is her dysplasia on the brain when you open and this is the pathology which is a focal cortical dysplasia type 2B and when you do the electrocorticography in the theater, you can see these are the grade 3 um, uh, ECOG spiking which disappears after the resection of the lesion. And the, in the next one minute, it's about hemispherical syndromes. Usually, it can be a Childhood stroke resulting in hemiatrophy to one hemisphere causing the hemiparesis on opposite side or a progressive epilepsia partialis continua along with a focal hemiparesis over years in Rasmussen's encephalitis or hemimegalencephaly or a hemispherical polymicrogeria. These children also present with multiple types of seizures, hemiparesis progressively. So always the dilemma comes whether you operate before the child develops total hemiparesis or after he develops. And this needs a lot of discussions and follow-up. And finally, uh, when you operate the surgery, which is done is a functional hemispherotomy. Uh, uh, this is a case of functional hemispherotomy where you discuss, disconnect the healthy hemisphere from the other hemisphere. And then the next one is a hypothalamic hematoma, which typically presents with uh, elastic seizures. So you can see this child. And the last one is palliative procedures, that is colostomy and uh, uh, vagal nerve stimulation. Usually, corpus colostomy is typically done in most of the people with HIE cases where you have bilateral parito-occipital gliosis or bilateral abnormalities uh, like a polymicrogyria or a developmental abnormality or uh, in patients... Uh, uh, means it's it's important to identify the lesions are bilateral, inoperable, and then go for the colostomy. Whereas we do have neurostimulation procedures like Weger's nerve stimulation, which we do regularly, or a deep brain stimulation, which is still experimental and responds in neurostimulation. So this is a, one of the cases of vagal nerve stimulation where you implant the um, lead around the vagus nerve and the battery will be below the clavicle and they need regular programming. And it is also one of the uh, definitely good palliative procedures for, for people who cannot undergo surgery. So to conclude, refractory pediatric epilepsy surgery is safe and uh, effective. Early surgical referral should be based on the for improvement in the cognitive development, language, and motor functions in children who have refractory epilepsies. Thank you. Any most of <laughs> most of them are clear with it. Uh, the last part, uh, MCQs. 
डॉक्टर सुचन है ओके ओके हम दे हैव अंडरस्टूड सुचंद आई विल रिक्वेस्ट Who is doing? Doctor Sandhya is doing it. Doctor Sandhya is doing. Monik, we'll have the first MCQ session now. Can you project that uh, marks? No, just want to see. Who are the score? Score score mark in it. Can we? From yesterday. So they are the top ten till now. And here of the top ten, you know, who who are all here? Austin Shah. Hello. Priya Saman, Kavin Bharti, Vinod. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Only one is not there. One is online. Okay. So all the best. But but then all of you others also can climb up over the day. Okay. Start. These points are in yen or rupees. <laughs> It's in euros. Euros. <laughs> Okay, the pin is six five three zero five seven. You follow me, Mr. Kinsko. We have 85. No, we have the count of members registering. So we are at one twenty-five. We are at one twenty-five. We can start after hundred. The bow. Bahubali and Kattappa are not there. <laughs> May who Don also is not there. No. God of small things is the new name we have. Ninety-eight. Anybody else to register, or shall we start? Ninety nine. Ninety nine is the number. Yeah. All right. We'll start with ninety nine today. Um. Can we have the questions, please? So the first question is, which intraoperative modality is the gold standard while operating upon tumors near eloquent brain regions? Options are intraoperative fluorescence with five LA, neuro navigation with fMRI and DTI integrated, awake surgery with cortical and subcortical mapping, and robot assisted tumor resection. Okay, we have fifty-two people with the right answer. Okay, can we have the next question, please? Which of the following response is seen on stimulation of IFOF in the dominant hemisphere? Phonological paraphasia, speech arrest, semantic paraphasia, and reading difficulty.
Okay, we have the same 56 people answering the right answer again. Next question. What is the typical MRI anomaly? Low-grade glioma, DNET, FCD2A, and FCD2B. Uh, very few people have got it right. Can we see the scoreboard? Okay, let's have the next question, please. Name the classic seizure type associated with the lesion shown below. Reading epilepsy, photosensitive epilepsy, elastic seizures, or all of the above. Elastic seizures is the right answer. We have only half of them, right? Nickel is standing on number one again. Which of the following bundles of superior longitudinal fasciculus is most likely to result in aphasia? Options, SLF1, 2, 3, or temporoparietal branch of SLF. <clears throat> Okay, 47 people with the right answer. Can we have the scoreboard? Okay, we have all new names now. Next question, please. The commonest pathological substrate in surgical series of refractive epilepsy in children is hypoglambal sclerosis, gliosis, low-grade tumors, focal cortical dysplasia. Sixty-five people with the right quest answers. <coughs> Last question. The surgical procedure of choice for drug refractory epilepsy with left hemiparesis is lesionectomy, amygdala hypogammectomy, functional hemispherotomy, and multiple subfoil transections. Sixty-three people with the right answer. Can we have? Okay, second person. ASP. First one. APS. Can we have all three of you here, please stand? <laughs> Are you are. Okay. Who is KPS and APS? Okay. You are from? Okay. You are from which college? Okay. Okay. The second part, we need the first part, KPS. Okay. All right. Wish you luck for the next session. Yeah, it's online. Yeah, we continue with the next minute. Thank you. Uh, I request uh, chairpersons to hand over the mementos. Um, I request Dr. Vivek Tando to come on to the stage. So. Yeah. Mary, uh, I request Dr. Sita Ma'am to come on to the stage to take the memento. Okay. I request Astri sir to come onto the stage and hand over the plants to chair persons.
Thank you, sirs. Thank you. We are moving on to the next uh, the session for the day. Uh, may I request Dr. P. Dairavan, sir, and Dr. K. V. R. Sastri, sir, to chair the session, sir. It's not working. That's why I'm trying to be. Yeah. So, though we are running late, we will be going for the second session of the day. And uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, eminent speakers. And uh, let us see and uh, try to catch up with them in this 15 minutes uh, frame. It's very difficult, but anyhow. Now let's have the first talk by Dr. Sandeep Mohindra on the clinical approach and management to a child with swelling in the back. It's a very common finding. Let's see. Dr. Mohindra. Good morning, everyone. So I am presenting you the clinical approach to a child who has got a swelling in the back. All of you as neurosurgery residents, we are going to face this case in your examinations, either a short case or long case or grand viva. Either way, this case is going to be there for sure. You are going to get one long case, two short cases, one grand viva, one radiology part. And either way, this case will enter into your examination somehow. somehow. So the description, the child with a swelling over the back, I'll start with the examination of a swelling just like you read through near or far. Yeah. So I'll be taking you the as the examination of a swelling just like you people have read in your general surgery training in your clinical examination in as thus and from there how to move towards the neurosurgery part. So introduction. Finally, what is the case? How a child is brought to you? A child is brought to you with a visible swelling or a palpable mass over the back. This mass can be located near the lower back or in the middle back and even at the neck part also or even at the occiput. Protruding from the surface of the body, it can be midline or it can be paramedial. And do not presume that you know the diagnosis. It's not like that. And it may be present since birth or may develop later. Either way, this, this swelling can have all these parameters. The most important part starts from the history, which has to be taken now from the parents, because the child is not going to tell itself, herself or himself. So after that is the clinical examination of that particular swelling, just like you people did in your general surgery part, the examination of a swelling, and then starts the imaging part. History. What is the age of the child? It's a newborn infant one year child, two year, three years, and time at which the swelling was first noted. Was the swelling existent, persistent since the child was born? The parents will be able to tell you. After that, you start presuming that which way the diagnosis is going. Are these the congenital lesions since birth? Or these lesions have been acquired during the course of their growth or development? So, because in a way, we are, we are making up our mind that the newborn, new, uh, the new development of a swelling during the course of growth of a child might not be a congenital lesion, so it is it going to be a neoplastic or something else. Location, midline or a paramedian location. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or sacral. It can be either way. It can the location of swelling can be located in any of these places. And how is the skin cover over the swelling? It is normal or abnormal. 
all these things have to be noted just like you people were noting these parameters the examination of a swelling in your general surgery part is there any discharge from the swelling is this swelling associated with pain progression of the swelling the, because the tumors may present with enlarging masses with or without neurological deficits whereas the congenital swellings are usually painless unless and until they have got a dermal sinus or get infected and develop a dermal sinus and part an abscess or so next history associated deformities or congenital lesions associated with these swellings you note then you then you make up your mind that's yes this is a developmental anomaly which the child is carrying head circumference should be noted just now in the morning lectures there was a uh, detailed uh, analysis and details were given to you how the head circumference is important and it is not the head circumference which is important rather the increasing head circumference is important how are the limb movements child is moving the limbs normally or not bowel bladder involvement prenatal history there is a huge amount of significance when you are examining a child with a swelling at the back and is this swelling or some surgery for the child has been performed in any of the children in the family in the past that gives a lot of lot of significance that the child is carrying some congenital deformity now clinical examination detailed clinical examination of a swelling is the same like inspection palpation and auscultation all these parameters should be noted detailed neurological examination should be taken head size higher mental functions cranial nerve examination sensory motor cerebellar and evaluation of the bladder functions systemic examination while you are examination examining the swelling you must note the neurocutaneous markers which all are visible notable spinal deformities which if any are there and if there is any bony deformity among the in the lower limbs bedside test like elimination may be done in these cases trans elimination test you people had been doing this thing in your surgical training and it still carries a lot of significance light is pressed against the swelling elimination is noted with the room the room light switched off differentiate it helps in it really helps in differentiating meningocele versus meningomyelocele in meningocele there are no neural tissues there are no nerves there in meningomyelocele nerves are floating in a hemlock in to just these two entities there is a hell lot of a difference and is going to be the and the outcome of these children so you should be mentally prepared and making the diagnosis that just do not write casually meningocele or meningomyelocele be very sure about it inspection location of the swelling anatomical location of the swelling whether the swelling is located at the lumbosacral region mid dorsal upper dorsal or cervical region size and shape how large is the swelling what is the shape is, is it exactly circular or oblong or having any pulsations over it skin cover over it is normal not normal associated inflammation noted over there usually inflammation gets noted in the swellings of these kind in cases of spinal dysraphism when there is a dermal sinus over this the punctum and it gets inflamed and gets infected csf leak if any is there any other discharge purulent or seropurulent associated spinal deformity like kyphoscoliosis is noted that will be obvious once you once you remove all the clothes you bear the whole whole back of the child you will be able to note any scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis there or any neurocutaneous markers palpate the swelling as we what we do you used to do in surgery what is the consistency is it firm soft hard is it tender how how are the margins being defined is the swelling mobile and if it is mobile then where then how how in which plane it is mobile the to determine the plane of the swelling the swellings which are the masses which are stuck to the uh, soft uh, to the within the uh, spinal canal they will not be that mobile rather the subcutaneous swellings which are just lipomas will be freely mobile are these reducible what is the cuff implex compressible so, like sebaceous cyst and hemangiomas are usually compressible in some patients a spinal defect may be palpable once you are palpating keep keep your keep your palpation instinct very strong that you are palpating the lower part of the spine also where you can feel the bony defect in some of the cases which will take you to the diagnosis straight away that it is a spinal dysraphism case is there any brio on auscultation like vascularly and like angiosarcoma a very rare finding 
So what are the differential diagnosis of the swelling once you have taken such detailed history? Spina bifida aperta, meningocele, meningomyelocele, lipomeningocele. These are the spinal dysraphism cases with this, with this swelling. Congenital spinal dysraphism cases. Myelosiasis, general lipoma may occur. Vascular lesion, hemangioma, angioma, angiosarcoma may occur. Now the neoplasm part. It, these are just not ruled out like that. The tumors part may occur. These patients may, the children may present with a swelling at the back with these tumors too, like teratoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, neurofibroma, osteoma, chondroma, osteosarcoma, and even Ewing sarcoma. Surprisingly, Ewing sarcoma is the commonest site is lumbosacral bony canal, not the calvaria. Spina bifida. Now, it what is spina bifida? It's a spectrum of congenital anomalies resulting in a defective neural arc through which meninges and neural elements herniate to create a swelling, which you people will get to see in a child. Now, it may have varied clinical manifestations. Aparta is complete, clearly visible. Occulta will just skip in this particular case because it is not obvious in the clinical examination. And the child, if presents with some clinical deficits, only then you come to come against this diagnosis of spina bifida occulta. That means it is not visible. Occult. It is occult. Aparta is obviously visible. Something is visible to you clearly to diagnose it as a case of spina bifida aparta. Meningocele, meningomyelocele, lipomeningomyelocele, malicious and rachesis. These are the obvious things which are visible. And first three make the child with a child with a uh, swelling at the back. In meningocele, it involves only meninges and there is no neural involvement. There, it, the skin defect may be, uh, if there is a skin defect, is associated with poor prognosis. There may be impending CSF leak. Usually it is midline. Commonest site is lumbar region, followed by thoracolumbar. Thoracic and cervical is very rare. They may present with intact skin. Progressively, they enlarge with time. Usually, they are translucent with no nerves seen on translumination test. No neurological deficits in these cases. Open meningocele commonly present with unhealthy skin, which may rupture during delivery and causing secondary meningitis. And suddenly, the, de the de prognosis becomes very guarded. May be associated with hydrocephalus or large, large head, which you must note while examining such children. Now, meningomyelocele. Suddenly, the prognosis gets guarded in these cases once because the neural tissue gets embedded in these swellings. These are again midline swellings in most of the cases. Caudal thoracic lumbar spine is the involvement, is the area which usually gets involved. Covered with normal skin, abnormally thin skin to parchment-like skin is there. Dome of the swelling usually represents the uh, place to which developing neural structures are attached. The neural structures get attached within the undersurface of the swelling. Associated with neurological deficit in most of the cases. And associated systemic abnormal, abnormalities may also be noted. Neurological de deterioration in cases of symptomatic chari, chari malformations may occur. This may be due to hydrosyringomalia or retethering of the cord. Quite a high significant risk factor. Uh, the incidence is there. 1 to 3 out of every 1000 life versus is being noted. And prevalence has been on decline. That's a good news. That is because of the upliftment of the socioeconomic strata of our society, folate supplementation, and massive increase in the antenatal radiological workup, ultrasonography, because of which the incidence of um, uh, spinal dysraphism is on decline nowadays. The risk factors, the major dominating part is the previous pregnancy with the neural tube defects. Once the child, there is a child with neural tube defects, the next child is going to have a very high risk for that. Partner with neural tube defects and uh, diabetes mellitus type 1. Seizure disorder, 1% that is usually associated with the intake of valproic acid. You people all must be knowing about it. Close relative with neural tube defects and post-pregnancy obesity. Rare, rare incidences. Prenatal diagnosis. Maternal serum alpha fetoprotein is the initial screening test. High resolution fetal ultrasonography should be done. Antenatal checkup usually include uh, the, the routine ultrasonography in almost in almost all cases across this across our nation these days. Demonstration of hydrocephalus and chari two abnormality must be done, and uh, acetonyl 
cholestasis level may also be noted. Just see this ultrasonography picture. It clearly shows it is almost a good ultrasonography. Even when we we describe the ultrasonography as an observer dependent investigation, but still, it's a very nicely demonstrated swelling and the spine. So just see the swelling at the back, the ventriculomegaly, and the corresponding MRI of the newborn. It completely correlates. So antenatal ultrasonography uh, detects quite a, it's a very good screening test to detect spinal dysraphism and this for the cases of swelling in the back. Again, the swelling, no symptomatology. Swelling at the back of the birth, symptoms may occur due to CSF leak, mainly thoracolumbar region. Neurological deficits include motor sensory sphincter dysfunctions. In severe cases, areflexic limbs and rectal prolapse may also be seen, which you must be aware in such cases when you get to examine. Chiari malformations may be associated with brainstem compressions and abnormal head due to hydrocephalus. All these things, assessment of the child like head size, skull bones, fontanelle, lacular skull defects, and size of posterior fossa should be noted. Assessment of neural placed and the level of the lesion condition of skin, extent of skin involvement, associated spinal deformities must be noted. Sensory level determination should be done. For motor evaluation, distal most voluntary motion should be evaluated. Anal tone and anal reflex must be evaluated and documented in your clinical examinations once you get this child in your exam. Repair within 72 hours. Delayed repair has got high incidence of infection. Mortality is very high. V patient placement along with MMC repair is recommended in case the hydrocephalus is noted at birth. What is the goal of surgery? Why do you want to operate? To protect the functional tissue in the neural placard. Prevent CSF lock. Minimize the risk of meningitis by re reconstructing the neural tube and coverings. This is a typical example of post-operative case. The swelling and the repaired case. Nurse in trenal back position, preoperative antibiotics, prevent fecal contamination of the wound, observe for hydrocephalus, complications like wound adhesions and meningitis. The surgeons and the best of the surgeons who had been managing uh, sp spinal dysraphism have faced the hell lot of time in managing CSF leak in postoperative cases. And it is really dangerous. And the best of the hands have suffered uh, while managing CSF leak and meningitis. Once the wound gives way, it becomes a very difficult situation to manage such children. It is not only meningitis, even hyponatremia leading on to seizures have been noted in post-operative courses. Symptomatic chiari, like ensuring functioning shunt, should be there. So this is an example of a picture of lipomeningomyelocele in which the lipoma is associated with the terminal cord. Lumbosacral meningomyelocele is subcutaneous fibrofatty mass that traverses the lumbosacral fascia, causing spinal laminar defect, penetrating dura and tethering spinal cord. Now, in this case, the fat has gone from cord, passing the, uh, the spinal canal, posterior bony element till the skin. Usually, there is a disjunction in the timing of neural tube cloyer and cutaneous ectoderm cloyer. That is the considered to be the cause behind the formation of lipoma. Elements of the ectoderm become incorporated into the in incompletely closed neural tube. So three types of lipoma, you all must have read in your textbooks. These are the three types of lipomas which have been described. Type 1, 2, 3. Type 1 in which the cord is going till, the low, till below. Type 2 is the transitional. Type 3 it is the terminal. The best one is type 3. The worst is the type 2. Because in which the type 2 in which the, the neural tissue will get damaged during surgery. The most likely, that is the most dangerous one. So this is the symptomatology, cutaneous Markers should be noted once you are managing a swelling at the back. Just see the, these hypertrichosis, hemangioma, pit, meningocele, gluteal cleft. So unrelenting symptomatic progression seen in untreated cases is the indication for surgery. Orthopedic syndrome should be noted in all these patients and the orthopedic help should be sought for all these children. It's not that you repair your own part and the rest of the things are left as such. Urological symptoms syndrome, syndromes should be noted and they should also be managed. Preoperative evaluation, like screening, it should be antenatal. Ultrasonography from 17th week onwards and ultrasonography will help, as I have told you, defining the attachment of lipomas, operator dependent and possibly miss the subtle lesions. Ultrasonography has been described like that, but it's not just see this wonderful ultrasonograph picture, which is 
picking up almost the complete fats, neural tube structures, spinal canal, cord, skin, vertebral body. So the same patient, the CT scan after birth shows the opened, the widened, there is a fusion defect in the lamina, widening of the spinal canal and deformity of the sacrum. MRI is the study of choice. Plain MRI, not the contrast one is needed. Plain MRI is the study of choice for spinal dysmorphism. It is good enough. T2 weighted image will show you the dorsally tethered cord. So, deta so details are there. How do you identify a tethered cord? Will be the is is the question will be which will be asked to everyone. How do you identify a tethered cord during surgery? First, it is the dorsal most structure which is coming towards the towards your microscope. It is carrying one single blood vessel with it. It's any fibro fatty tissue attached with that structure indicates its phylum terminate. All the eloquent nerve roots are moving ventrally. Dorsally moving structure is the phylum terminal. It is having a fibro fatty tissue and a vessel over it. And it is moving towards microscope lens. Clear? So urodynamic studies should be done. Surgical repair. Asymptomatic child older than two months is recommended whatever in the books. But seeing our socioeconomic strata, we do not pick up the child till one year of age. Presence of orthopedic pain and urological syndromes. Neurological symptoms should be corrected. I recommend prophylactic surgery, which is safe and effective in preventing neurological deficits, irrespective of the type of lipoma. Most patients benefit only to some extent, even after surgery, once defects develop. As the child comes, we give the child back. Once the deficits have occurred, we are not, we are unable to rectify them and we correct them. Remember that. So prognosis factor is type two has got a worse prognosis. Quality of surgery, age at surgery, malformation complex, and preoperative bladder, if involved, is not going to get corrected in most of the cases. So surgical goal is detethering, decompression of the cord, preservation of the functional tissue, relationship between lipoma and cord intersurface, conservative oxygen of lipoma to avoid injury. A part of lipoma left is all that is acceptable rather than taking the neural tissue out with the lipoma. Proper neural cloyer with the reservation reservoir of CSF around, around the spinal cord you just like to create a pseudo seal. I, even when a pseudo seal is considered a complication of the surgery. But I feel that pseudo seal is what we are making. So early CSF leak and pseudo is seals, as it is mentioned in the book, as a complication. Retethering of the cord. Even I was surprised to see that 20% of the cases will develop retethering of the cord. Wound infection and wound dehiscence. Necrosis of overlying skin. Meningitis and infection, obviously, is one of the complications. So for tumors... This is just a site. You should remember these cases. Sacrococcygeal ter teratoma. Newborns, four times more common in females. Diagnosis is usually made in preterm pre ultrasonography. Management is uh, by pediatric surgeons most of the times. Weekly ultrasonography to confirm and rule out associated anomalies. Fetal surgery may be performed, but I am not aware of it and neurosurgeons are not doing it. Rhabdomyosarcoma. It arises from soft tissue. Muscle connective tissue, swelling that keeps bigger and painful. Diagnosis is made on MRCT. Removal of the tumor. That is what the recommended surgery is. But chemotherapy is also strongly recommended in rhabdomyosarcoma. You ask, you all must be knowing about it in head and neck or rhabdomyosarcoma. Chemotherapy is now coming up in big way. Vincristine and cyclophosphamide. Primary malignant nerve sheath tumor. This is again one of the differential diagnosis. Land last one is Ewing sarcoma. As I told earlier, Wing sarcoma's commonest site is lumbo, lumbo, lumbar spine, not the calvaria. So it is the uh, it is one of the site. Primary bone cancer, painful swelling. Investigation is MRI and CT scan. Surgery followed by chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And even today, this tumor has got poor prognosis. Thank you. Angiosarcomas are very rarely. Yes, even I have not seen it. I just took it from book. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohindra, for your excellent uh, talk. Yes, please. Mic. Can you provide a mic? Yeah. You can take it. Oh. Something extremely practical 
a class on uh, spinal dysfunction definitely uh, there are a lot of patients who come to our outpatient clinic with in the second decade of life with incidentally detected lipomas how do you manage this is a practical question not meant for exams but a practical question a child in second decade of life that means around 15 16 year of age child under 15 years of age under 15 years of age if a child comes seven and with a swelling at the back and the child is completely asymptomatic i will not do anything in that child and i will try to elicit the clinical symptomatology in that child for example i will ask can the child climb the the stairs quickly can the child run and climb the bus can the child perform all the aero aerobic activities like playing in the classrooms normally if yes i'll put it i'll not do anything if the child is female i'll make the attendance of the uh, the child aware that the once the child grows become married become pregnant this thing should be kept in mind during spinal anesthesia for pregnancy and anterior birth okay thank you okay then we'll go for the next uh, lecture by dr vijay, vijay sarathi approach to the patient huh? dhaval shukla vijay sarathi vachana vijay sir approach to the patient to a patient with quadriparesis dr sarathi Uh, I uh, respect the chairpersons, Professor Shastri and uh, Professor Dhaniwal, who are my teachers. Respected uh, elders and uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, for the last uh, today and there, uh, yesterday, the organizers were able to pack everything, neurosurgical material, into your brain, so that overnight you want they want you to become a good neurosurgeons and uh, neurologists. This only happened twice in the history of. You know, the uh, one in a Kalidas, right? The other one is Tenali Ramakrishna. You know, you know the story of Kalidas. He went to the temple and he shut the door. And so, let me just begin my talk by saying, who is SOS? MKP? What is that? K KPS? KPS? All of you be ready. I'll ask. I'll be asking you questions. So, what is the before coming to science? we should talk about symptoms all right so if you think that is the can i have the pointer please so if this is the cord can you, can you just see that so if that is the cord then i'll put it in. all right i have my big mind is one more point yeah if this is a cord This is the anterior surface, posterior surface, right and left. All right. Suppose if you have a lesion here, what are the characteristic symptoms with which patient would present? The last row. Last row. Anybody? KPS. Who is KPS? Yeah, please. What would be the approximate symptomatology? A, a, a lesion which is present the cord from the anterolateral side. What is the tract which is there? Lateral cord. <laughs> Anybody else? Spinal thalamic tract. So he'll have symptoms pertaining to spinal thalamic tract on the same side and the opposite side. Opposite side. Why? Because the decussation that happened, right? Next. So if there is a lesion here, post to lateral side, what will be the predominant physio? Next taker, what will be the predominant symptomatology? Yes, sir. After KPS, who is the next rank holder? Uh, what will be the symptoms? Here. Suppose this is a dead ligament, just behind the dead <coughs> Anybody? corticospinal so patient usually should present with the corticospinal tract symptomatology because corticospinal tracts are there 
what is there in between this tract and the cortical spinal tract? Which tract is there? Yes, sir. Anybody? Posterior spinal cerebellar tract. I'll ask you an easy question. Suppose it is compression from here. What will be the symptoms? Posterior. Huh? Yes. Please speak out, man. Post in terms of vibration sets and joint positions. What is the commonest pathology which will cause posterior compression of the cord? All benign tumors will present on the back of the cord, like aneurysmal bone cyst, chondroblastomas, osteoblastoma. They all arise from the posterior elements, luckily, because they're easily curable. Second is what is the uh, most common uh, lesion which compresses from the front? Our friend of Telangana. Who are from Telangana? Can you raise your hands? Uh, tell me. What is the most common lesion which presses the cord from the front? You Day in, day out, you see in the OPD. Right? So most commonly, the compression is from the Aspect long. So, what will the commonest initial symptom in those patients? Spasm. So, when the motor tracks here, when there is a compression from the front, why do they get spasticity? Why? The answer is here. There is something like va watershed, vascular wa watershed. The anterior two-thirds of the cord is supplied by anterior spinal artery, which is a branch of branch of vertebral artery, and posterior one-third is supplied by posterior spinal artery. So this is a watershed. Exactly, it lies at the level of the motor tract. So hence, when there is a compression from the front, though the tract is there a little behind, because it lies at the watershed, they present with the corticospinal tract symptomatology. All right. Then, so vertical watershed, when there is a CV junction uh, case, you look at the hands, right? There will be hand muscle wasting. So when there is a compression above, the predominantly the symptomatology, the symptomatology or signs will be the hand muscle wasting because the vertical watershed lies at the level of C8 and T1. All right? Yes or no? Next. What are the C8 is a, which supplies the finger flexion. If finger flexor is active or exaggerated, the lesion is in the cervical cord. All right. So finger flexor hyperactivity or hyperreflexic finger flexion reflex indicates that the lesion is in the cervical cord. So please feel free to stop me once time is over because I have one more talk. So Suppose if you look at the cervical cord, generally if you are given a, you know, chapati, you make it half and try to have a, a each. In the same way, if you try to, if you give a spinal spinal cord, you tend to divide it into half, upper half and lower half. What is a demarcation point? You just tend to ask the patient about the abduction. If abduction is weak, it, 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 it divides the lesion into lower half or upper half. You, all of you know that abduction is carried out by the uh, deltoid muscle. So, which is supplied by which now? Axillary now. Right? Then what is the root value of axillary now? <coughs> what are the other muscles supplied by C5? Next question is. Nandi, Dr. Nandi? Yes, sir. Okay, anybody? From names? Yeah? No. Anybody? Rhomboid, very good. Rhomboidus and supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So grossly, you divide the cord into upper half and lower half and tend to look at the signs which are quite peculiar to upper cord and the lower cord. So this is a three-dimensional image, which again my uh, Dr. Ram Narayan when I was examined in Chennai, the beautiful diagram where the blue things are depicted, the Ascending tracts are depicted in the blue and the descending tracts are in the red. You have a corticospinal tract, anterior corticospinal tract. In the banks of this one, you have a RRR, 
reticulo spinal anterior reticulo spinal posterior reticulo spinal rubro spinal anybody from uh, sitting your center here all right so these are the spinocerebellar tracts anterior spinocerebellar posterior spinocerebellar you have this laminations right medial cervical thoracic lumbar and sacral that's how the fibers are distributed in the cord so this is what exactly a diagram which depicts uh, so many signs which are there in the cv junction uh, region for example the most common sign of cv junction is uh, please don't take photographs i have my copyright for this all these things okay please listen so so if you have a crossed hemiparesis what is the reason for crossed hemiparesis if you are if you are asked to answer in a single word you say differential decussation. So upper limb fibers tend to decussate a little higher than the lower limb fibers. If there is a compression here, it compresses the ipsilateral upper limb fibers and the contralateral lower limb fibers. Then the reason patient will develop the crossed hemiparesis. Okay. And you have Ellsberg phenomenon. Who was Ellsberg? Who was uh, Ellsberg famous for? He was Ellsberg, was a, a European surgeon. I don't remember exactly from which place he is. He is the first person who advocated the total removal of intramedullary tumors. All right. So that is what the phenomenon you call it a U shape. U, this invert, uh, reverse U and U. Suppose if the lesion is compressing the cord from the left side, you get the reverse U. If the lesion is compressing cord from the this side, you, you'll get the correct U. So you please go and read why, uh, what is the pathophysiology of the U, U Ellsberg phenomenon. Then you have a piano fingers. Lehmet's phenomenon, all these things are classical for the lesion which is arising at the CV junction. And all of you are going to read why this happens. It's not like... So CV junction morphometry indicators, you have a low hairline. Below which, which level you call low hairline? Yes, sir. Below? See? Five, sir. Five. Okay. Low set ears, birds index. All these things will do, uh, tell you that patient has a low um, and short neck. And other syndromic features like Mercure's. What is the characteristic X-ray finding in Mercure's? If you take X-ray uh, spine, what is the typical uh, picture of X-ray? Yes. Bullet-shaped vertebra. If you see bullet-shaped vertebra in the X-ray, it's a lumbar spine. That is the characteristic feature of Mercure's. In achondroplasia, if you take X-ray skull, what do you find? It's a J-shaped cell, all right? So what are the specific signs to CV junction? We have a rotatory restriction. You get clicks on turning this side and that side because C1, C2 is a one which catches the rotatory uh, motion of the uh, cervical spine. And C2 hypersthesia. All of you will be asked, what is the extent of C2 supply? What is the extent of C2 supply superiorly? Yes, sir. Upper side, interauricular line, right? It supplies still here, where you keep the pillow. And second is C2 hypersthesia, is a characteristically present in the CV junction uh, lesions. Suboccipital muscle wasting. What are the suboccipital muscles here? Anybody can get up and tell me what is red one, blue one, green one? What, Raghavendra? You want to try? Very nice. Rectus capitis posterior major, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. So mirror movements, there are various theories which explain why patients get mirror movements on the CV junction pathology. Probably because of demyelination, crosstalk, all those things. The theories are there. You're supposed to go and read. Of course, I'll let you about the cross hemiparesis. And respirations are very, very, very important as far as uh, cervical spine is concerned. You tend to evaluate respiration by single breath count, breath holding time. And classically, patients present with the frequent respiratory tract infections and inability to produce a cough. He can't, I mean, frequent coughs because he cannot clear up all the secretions because of diaphragmatic palsy. What is the root supply of root value of diaphragm? Diaphragm is supplied by phrenic now. Root value is C3, 4, 5. So, suppose if, I, if you open the neck, how do you identify phrenic nerve? The names are not written on the nerves, right? You should know the anatomy. 
So how do you recognize phrenic now? Where is it formed? Yes. Where is it formed in the neck? So there is there's a so many nerves which will be there if you open the neck to look at operate on the brachial plexus. There's so many nerves. It's formed on the lateral border of the scalenus anticus. It 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 runs on the scalenus anticus and it it crosses the scalenus on anticus and it it it. it crosses the origin of internal mammary artery and goes down to the thorax. So how do you uh, evaluate the diaphragmatic pulse? Which, very good. Which which line do you do? Do you do antidiaxillary, postdiaxillary, midclavicular? No. Uh, opposite. You have to do it in the back. Because well, what comes in the midclavicular? Liver delves. Liver. All right. So what are the cranial nerves traversing the foramen magnus? Two, two cranial nerves, one is the 11th nerve and second one is fifth nerve, that is descending root of trigeminal. Typically you get the onion peeling, uh, hypostasia. Suppose if you want to operate and cut, if I ask you to cut the descending tract of trigeminal when the patient has perioral painful paresthesia, where do you cut it, the top or bottom? How do you divide the descending tract of trigeminal? Anybody? Pars oralis, interpolaris. So pars oralis will supply the perioral region, whereas pars intermediate is a mid facial, and the, uh, the last one is a period. So how do you localize the descending tract of trigeminal? Where is it located? It exactly lies in line with the posterior rootlets of C2, right? You go on lesioning from the posterior, uh, above the posterior rootlet of C2, at the depth of 2 millimeters, go till the 4 millimeters beyond the obex. That's where the limit of the descending tract of, all this anatomy is important because you have to, tomorrow you may, be, may have to do the descending tract anatomy there. So false localizing signs, hand muscle wasting, right? So what is the muscle bulk here? What are the muscles which are there in the first interdigital space? Yes, madam. Fourth row. Which muscles are there? Please, please try to answer that. Otherwise, there's no point in coming wasting Sunday here. Mm -hmm. So these are all the dermatomes and myotomes. Myelopathic gait is characterized by spastic gait and broad-based. And there are three, I just go through that. I think I have only one minute left. So we have three basic uh, uh, file cord syndromes. One is extradural, intradural extramedullary. And I'll tell you a few tricks how to evaluate that. So this is how the myelographic features. This is a normal one. You have a CSF depicted by black shadow and dotted one is a cord. They're normal, right? And this is the intramedullary. When the cord expands, the CSF gets obliterated on both sides, like a tapering trouser sign. So in old uh, Devanand films, Devanand used to wear that, uh, this one. And you have intradural extramedullary where you have a characteristic meniscus sign, like uh, semilunar uh, at the top of the lesion, also at the bottom of the lesion. And of course, extradural is a compression to one. These, these things you have to remember very well in order to understand the pathoanatomy. So how do you make classified duration, variation, clinching symptoms, clinching patterns, progression, ascending or descending, mode of spread is a very, 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 very important in triangle. So in duration of symptomatology can be acute, characteristic lesions would be vascular, subacute, chronic, symptoms, symptoms can be progressive or static, always the lesions are progressive, if there is a static means if there is a vascular lesion. Clinching symptom will be painful in extradural, waxing. I have a minute extra, sir. One minute. Uh, waxing and vanning is typically you observe in the, what are the lesions which give rise to waxing vanning pattern? One is vascular, second one is demyelination. Clinching patterns, either ascending or descending. Why this pattern happens, ascending or descending? Because of because of lamination, lamination of the tract. Lamination of the tracts is, are responsible for the <coughs> sorry, ascending or descending. 
mode of spread it can be asymmetric or symmetric based on the for this one so the uh, formula for the intradural lesions is chronic progressive asymmetric ascending with radicular pain is a hallmark of intradural extramedullary intramedullary chronic progressive descending symmetrical with funicular pain is a formula for intramedullary so there, there may be some lesions which are both simulate intradural extramedullary or intramedullary they can be ascending or descending progressive sometimes they will become static typically those lesions in the neurosurgical practice, you come across the dural AV fistulas. In the neurological practice, you come across in the in the demyelinating disorders. So, other last symptom, which clinching symptomatology, is a cough, headache, and cough syncope, which is the feature of Arnold Chiari malformation. All right. Who is our Arnold Chiari? Chiari was teacher or a student? Yes, sir. No. Kiari was a teacher and Arnold was a student. And even before Kiari, he's a true leader, is the one who has described the Kiari malformation. And even before him, is a Cleland, John Cleland, who has beautiful diagram of uh, uh, Kiari malformation. Cleland is the same person who has promulgated the theory that the meningiomas do arise from the arachnoid capsules. So last question for uh, from my side. Suppose there's a descending quadriparesis. You understand that it's a intramedullary tumor. Suppose the patient is having NF1. What is the likely tumor he's likely to have? Yes? Yes? Pink shed. Which tumor? Intramedullary tumor. I'll give you four choice. Epidemioma, glioma, hemangioblastoma, and arachnoidosis. NF2, hypernema. So, other one, NF1 is astrocytoma. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. The next speaker is patient. Hello, good. So, uh, good morning. Uh, once again, I'll be giving a, a lecture on coma. So, before uh, I actually start, uh, I will narrate one story which is back based on a real incident. However, some words and names are changed for dramatization. So, I received a call about a week back from my neighbor. And uh, the person is a case of uh, CA colon, and he has undergone surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, and all possible treatment. Still, he has not sold his house. 
He's still living there in spite of exhaustive treatment. And currently he is on palliative treatment. And in Kannada, he is currently in the stage, what we call Yenu Madake Avela, means nothing further can be done for the cancer. So this stage always comes in a person's life if a person has cancer. So morning of uh, Sunday morning, he had a focal motor seizure. So wife took the patient to a nearby clinic and he was diagnosed with, uh, they told in layman term that uh, cancer has spread to brain, but nothing can be done. So anti-epileptic drug was given and he was sent home. In afternoon, he took a power nap and wife went for a walk. When she came back, she found that uh, he was not waking up. He was not responding. He was not arousable. So she called me that he is not responding. So I told, okay, there is a nurse in A block, call the nurse and uh, tell her to examine and call me. I am not at home. So nurse called. So I will just mimic. Good morning, sir. I am uh, Lectimol speaking. Patient is not responding. So Manika, that wife also told, what additional thing you want to tell? Sir, patient is GCS3. Pupils are not re reacting. He is having perspiration. He has laborious breathing. Blood pressure is 170 by 110. There is tachycardia. So what should I do? Should I bring him to Nimhans? Now you have to answer this question. I am a doctor at Nimhans. My neighbor is unconscious. Wife is asking, should I bring him to Nimhans? Now answer this question. Should the patient be brought to Nimhans? Can anybody? If yes, for what? <coughs> and if no, why? So you should be able to answer this question at the end of this talk. Okay. So this is how we evaluate. This is a real scenario. You will be receiving, if you are a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, you will be receiving hundreds of calls that somebody is unconscious, somebody is not responding, somebody is found unconscious in bathroom, somebody has fallen and is unconscious and injured, and what to do next. So you have only 10 minutes to revive the patient because if you don't treat it rapidly, patient can go in deep coma and can go in irreversible coma or may even die. So the learning objectives from uh, this uh, lecture will be that you have to do a quick neurological examination if the patient has coma and uh, assess the airway if uh, there is need of intubation or something. Establish immediately the diagnosis of coma. There is no need of exhaustive uh, diagnosis or complete diagnosis. Remember, the goal of emergency medicine physician is not to diagnose, but is to save lives and treat immediately the emergency. In emergency department, it is found that 70% of the patients who come to emergency department do not have diagnosis before they reach the definite ward. The uh, job of doing a definite diagnosis is the further specialty where the patient is later transferred to, not the emergency medicine physician. And presumptively treat the cause of coma. So immediately you have to make the patient conscious. Then you can evaluate what could be the reason for the coma. So these are the, the algorithm that you should follow. First, if there is coma, look for airway, breathing, circulation, quick neurological treatment. No need to see plantar reflex and hundreds of germs and all those things. And uh, look for the reversible cause of coma. Do a CT scan of head and if required, angiogram. And while all these things are going on, most of the time, comment of patient is not brought by a relative, but by somebody else. Then call the relative and take the past medical history, past surgical history or social history and do laboratory tests and then find what could be the cause of coma, whether it's structural, not structural, mixed. And depending on that, you evaluate further. So we'll go through each and every step one by one. So coma, basically, it is two components. Arousal means patient is not awake, the eyes are closed. And second is lack of awareness. The patient is not aware what is happening to him or her in his environment. So this defines unconsciousness or coma. So checklist in the first hour is look for the airway, breathing, circulation, uh, treat hypoglycemia, and uh, do uh, minimum uh, blood chemistry and uh, emergency CT scan. So first, to assess the level of consciousness. Before you assess the level of consciousness, there is something called checklist before you say patient is GCS 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 or something. 
that is airway if the patient has hypoxia sensorium will be down so do not uh, do gcs before correction of hypoxia if the patient has hypotension again gcs will be down so correct uh, the blood pressure before assessing gcs and look for cervical uh, spine injury like patient is found injured unconscious in hotel in bathroom or on roadside there may be cervical spine injury so do not just do ocular movements uh, for sake of completion of your uh, evaluation and then immediately have intravenous success or rise to and rise to insertion if the uh, aspiration is suspected so gcs when we record gcs in our chart that what what do you write prefix with gcs we call it post resuscitation gcs so always gcs should be post resuscitation gcs it should not be written gcs as such but so pre-hospital checklist. Now, before actually patient reaches the hospital, as I got the phone call, you also may get the phone call. So what you have to instruct the person who is accompanying the uh, patient, like it, he may be emergency medicine technician or a nurse or something, to look for the same airway breathing to GCS. What is the GCS at the time of trans, at the time of picking up the patient from the home, hotel, or road? And what is the GCS on the way? And what is the GCS when the patient reaches your hospital? And most important, rule out hypoglycemia en route. You can do just prick test uh, to rule out hypoglycemia. And the history from the bystanders, what happened before he actually became unconscious, what happened to him? So though that history can give the clue of uh, what was the cause of unconscious. Like somebody went to, like a person was just attending one of the lecture and he threw fit and became unconscious. So, you know, it is a post ictal unconscious and the patient may recover spontaneously in few minutes or even seconds. So if the patient was driving and uh, fell down, so it was a history of trauma or he was uh, at party and he must have got over drunk or must have taken some drugs of abuse and that could also have been the cause of coma. So most important, when was the patient well before lapsing into the coma that should be uh, recorded. So first is neurological assessment, level of responsiveness. So what we have like hierarchy of type of uh, consciousness assessment, like something we call as dichotomous GCS, that you ask the patient's relative. Patient is conscious or unconscious. If the relative says unconscious, it is presumed that patient is unconscious. But the relative says is conscious, still you cannot rely on that because the patient may be disoriented, may be drowsy. Even drowsy also relatives will tell he's conscious. Though he's drowsy, they may tell it is conscious. If they say unconscious, it is unconscious. That is called dichotomous, two-point GCS. Then something called four-point GCS, whatever AVPU, whether the patient is alert, whether he's responding to verbal command, whether he's responding to the painful, uh, painful uh, stimulus, or his U, that is unresponsive, that is four-point GCS. So this all uh, type of GCS, substitute of GCS are useful before you actually see the patient because you don't know the level of training the person who is seeing the patient first has got. So this is how you do neurological assessment. So GCS, all of us are very well versed of GCS, but there are certain limitations of GCS does not take uh, into account pupillary reaction. If the patient is intubated by default, you uh, rate VT or V1 or something like that. The eyes may be swollen and you can, please do not take pictures. I told you yesterday also, I hope you remember. Uh, then uh, if uh, that there can be asymmetric in motor response, suppose patient is hemiplegia or something, one side may be decerebrating, one side there may not be any response. So you are confused whether you have to take decerebrating response or no response. So best is in GCS, if you, are, if you are unsure what response you have to take, take the best response. Why you should take the best response? Because in first few hours of injury, the patient is more likely to deteriorate rather than improve. So if you take the best response, you will be able to detect deterioration. But if you take worse response, you will not be able to take the uh, uh, notice the deterioration early. That's why you should take the best response. So, and sometimes it is found that integrator reliability is relatively poor for GCS in uh, certain settings. So an alternative to GCS is uh, four score. I don't know any neurologist here. Do they use four score? Any neurologist here? So this was popularized by neurologists and uh, neurointensivists as a substitute of Glasgow comma scale. And some neurologists and neurointensivists do use four score, but most of the neurosurgeons, they don't use. Actually, we did a study in our own hospital comparing GCS versus four for traumatic brain injury, but we did not find a superiority of four over uh, GCS. 
However, uh, for sake of completion, you should know what is four score. So GCS has uh, 15 point four score has 16 points of so four for each zero to four maximum. So besides eye, motor and verbal response, it also takes into account brainstem reflexes like uh, pupillary reaction and uh, next pupillary reaction, corneal reflex, and also the various types of uh, breathing patterns. So what, uh, how is it superior to GCS? Like there is something called ceiling effect ceiling like ceiling effect so there may be something higher than the ceiling which you are not able to see that is called ceiling effect and there is something called floor effect so there may be something below the floor which you are not able to see so now there cannot be gcs less than three but you know that a person with gcs three can have one pupil dilated both pupil dilated so there can be something worse less than three now can there be something better than GCS 15? So we say obeying commands. Obeying commands means lift your leg, hand, uh, show tongue, etc. But there is no quantification. So in four score, show two fingers, show thumb sign, show fist sign. So there is a higher uh, level of obeying commands. So the four score removes this ceiling effect as well as floor effect of the Glasgow Coma Scale. The brainstem uh, assessment, uh, most important is pupillary reaction that uh, all of you know. Like there are some classical pinpoint pupil which is seen in morphine poisoning and uh, pontine damage and large pupil uh, in the midbrain damage. And corneal reflex has to be assessed after pupillary reflex and visual threat response like menace reflex and oculomotor, uh, oculo, ocu, uh, oculocephalic reflex also has to be assessed. And then at the time of intubation, you will be able to see whether patient is able to cough or gag or not. So pupillary uh, response, I already told dilated pupils uh, indicate more severe damage and uh, Asymmetric pupil is of much concern to neurosurgeon because at that stage, patient is still salvageable. When both pupils are dilated, maybe patient is nearly preterminal. So you may not be able to revive the patient much. But if there is a single pupillary dilatation, it is important. Now, uh, some sophisticated hospitals have started using pupillometer, like uh, pupil examination with your normal torch. Uh, you, there may be some subjective, like many residents will brisk reacting, sluggish reacting, marginal asymmetry. So these all are highly subjective terms. So we have, we have got pupillometer recently, but uh, it's like an additional tool, not mandatory to have. But if you have pupillometer, it will actually give the exact size of the pupil, the rate of the re construction velocity, dilatation velocity. So this can improve the pupillary examination. So motor function, like first you have to see for spontaneous, like it is very common practice. Patient is lying unconscious. You, moment you go to the patient, you just give pain. Patient may be just sleeping, just waking up, he will wake up, no need to give him pain. So first look whether it is in spontaneous activity or not. Patient is really in comatose condition or not. So then look for the responses. So any, any flexor or extensor response are reflex responses. That indicates there is definitely damage at the level of brainstem. Brainstem is getting disconnected from the cerebral cortex. That's why all this reflex movement. Like if you see a uh, GCS motor component, it's more like evolutionary biology like thing, like small insect or something. The first like obeying commands is only higher level like humans or some other dogs also sometimes they obey commands. So it is higher level. Now M5 like uh, respond to the pain. So even dogs or something, or dogs lower than animal dogs, they all respond to the pain. When you give pin prick, uh, they will move with one of the four limbs. They will try to remove the stimulus. But then you go to the lower response, like withdrawal to pain, like small insects or something. They don't localize when you give them pain, toad or something like that, but it withdraws its limbs from the pain. Then you go uh, even further, flexion to the pain. So even smaller animals like uh, jellyfish or something, they just contract. 15 minutes over so first, huh? Patient is still unconscious. So <laughs> you cannot leave the emergency room. So like jellyfish or something, they just contract. So these are like evolutionary. You see the response to the pain in improves as you evolve. But the breathing pattern, as I told you, different types of breathing patterns are seen in different uh, levels of uh, damages. Most important is ataxic breathing, where patient will definitely require endotracheal intubation and uh, ventilation and same thing is hyperventilation. Hyperventilation will cause hypocarbia, which will cause cerebral vasoconstriction, which will reduce the cerebral perfusion pressure. So it is harmful. So if the patient is hyperventilating, again, intubate, sedate, and ventilate. So these are the different uh, breathing patterns which you would already seen in any standard book. Then most important is readily reversible cause of coma. So first thing, if you don't have anything, you are in primary health center also. Only one test if you have to do in patient with coma, do glucose estimation. 
So most of the patients will have hypoglycemia and you give uh, glucose and they will wake up in no time. And one more thing, like patient change alcoholic or malnourished, do not give glucose in absence of thiamine. Otherwise, it will cause pyruvimia. So give thiamine along with the glucose. And if there is a poisoning suspected, always suspect poisoning when there is no history available in a comment of patient and treat accordingly. There's CT scan to look for the structural lesion. If CT scan is normal, look for CT angiogram, particularly basilar artery thrombosis. CT may look totally normal, but if you do see, and patient will be in deep coma. So if you CT angiogram, you will see the basilar artery is occluded and you know why patient is in deep coma. Her approach to patient like historic history or to take comorbidities, medications, uh, any other uh, exposures. So valuable clues of the etiology of the coma, like first is time course of unconsciousness, patient is worsening or improving. Where it is, is it abrupt or is it gradual? Gradual, usually metabolic encephalopathy will have gradual onset of coma, whereas brain stems, stroke or hemorrhage will have sudden coma. The past medical or surgical history, social history is very important, particularly for drug abuse. So this, this is the answer to my question. This is our emergency ward. So if I tell, bring the patient to Nemhans, he will not even get a bed in our emergency room. So no point in wasting his time. So I'll go through one case illustration, then I will end. So it's a 60-year-old man, unresponsive to voice, found in hotel room. This is another case by housekeeper, last known well night before and brought to emergency department. He had hypothermia, GCF3, BP was uh, high and bradycardia. So what do you suspect? You don't want to suspect anything, forget. So what is the next step? You will reduce the BP? Don't want to comment. So first you have to see ABC, airway, breathing and circulation. Patient with GCS3 will have difficulty in breathing. Then neurological assessment, then an emergency department, eyes were closed, disconjugate gate, but oculocephalic reflex was present. Pupils are symmetric, reactive, but large. And there was no response to pain. Motor tone was diminished and no deep tendon reflex. And wife was contacted over the phone. And uh, airway, again, after this, uh, he had coronary artery disease, he had hypertension, diabetes, he had DVT, he was on apexaban, and he had depression, he was taking amitriptyline and desvanlafloxacin, and uh, contacted uh, pharmacy for pro, uh, PCC for reversal of anticoagulation. So lab test was then blood glucose, if it was not done initially, you should do blood glucose, other uh, biochemical investigation, and look for uh, toxicology studies, microbiology, and uh, SpO2. Then now, you have to go, what do you think could be the cause of coma? It is structural or non-structural. So again, you have to look for trauma. He was found unconscious in hotel. We don't know whether he slipped and fell down and whether he had a stroke, whether he was drunk night before and whether did he have seizures, there is no witness for this. So you have to find whether it's structural like a hemorrhage or stroke or non-structural like metabolic or medication overdose. So what is the next step now? Please comment now, what is the next step? So you have to do CT scan of head. So CT scan of head should be done when you suspect uh, a structural cause, when there is asymmetric neurological findings, single pupillary dilatation, or whether there is obvious history of trauma or fall. But even if there is no history and no other clues, still you do CT scan of head. First is plain, then you do angio angiogram as well. So this was the CT scan. He had massive subarachnoid hemorrhage with intraventricular uh, hemorrhage and uh, external ventricular drain was placed. So this is how he was treated. So in patients with un uh, uncertainty, what is the cause of coma? Additional investigation you have to do is angiogram, MRI, lumbar puncture for encephalitis, and EEG. Like patient may be having status, non-convulsive status epilepticus, which could be the cause of persistent coma. So in pediatric cases, you have to use modified uh, GCS, and uh, septic shock is a common cause of coma in children. So take home messages like uh, key findings of neurological examinations, clues, whether it's structural or non-structural, and you have to do investigations accordingly. So this is the take home message. So like uh, ATLS, which is endorsed by American Heart Association, there is something called ENLS, that is Emergency Neurology Life Support, which is endorsed by Neurocritical Care Society. So all, all first year residents should, there are 14 modules in, in ENLS. So all of you should go through that and so that you can learn emergency management when you are in first year, that's it.
Huh? What answer to my question? Should I bring him to New Hands? Hmm? Yeah, you can bring, bring to New Hands for psychological support for the family. Hmm. I will randomly pick up someone to answer this question. Amrita, she's our anesthetist. Should we bring him to Nemans? She's like pro Nemans. She's working in Nemans. <laughs> so anybody, so I told no. She gave me all the information. I think the patient is sick, bed bound. They must be having a number of medical gadgets at home. I told them to do blood sugar. It was 25. When he was sent to near nursing home, dextrose was given and he became conscious. So most of the causes of coma are outside central nervous system rather than inside central nervous system. In Plum and Posner, 80% of the causes of coma listed are due to diseases outside central nervous system. So it's a medical disease, not a neurological disease. Now we will go to the MCQs. I request Dr. Ishwar to come and start the session. Morning, everyone. Uh, I still find A, B, R, C, H at the top of the list. B, I is quite close on heels. Well, all the best today for today's sessions. Uh, start. Participants are requested to use the same name. We are still facing the same problem. They're entering with the different spellings and the surnames. So we request you to use the same name so it will be very easy for the calibrations. Thank you. Prices should be on the first thing. Sure, then people will be more interested in giving their original names. Let's have the pin. Game pin. I think there should be a price for the best name. I think Japs takes it. Yesterday, Japs was the best name. And followed by Katapa and Bahamani. Okay. 100 now. You expect a touch by 120. Wait for a minute more and see if it touches 120. How's that is also there. Well, he has first to be in an umbrella in cricket. Online, shall we start? Okay. 120. Okay, fine. Here we go. Let's roll with the first question. Patient has basic biceps and brachialis been diagnosed as a musculocutaneous infrapana. What will be the sensory loss? Patient has been has basic biceps and brachialis been diagnosed as a musculocutaneous infrapana. Where will be the sensory loss? Medial side of the arm, lateral side of the arm, medial side of forearm, lateral side of forearm. Up 120 has answered. The answer is lateral side of the forearm. Oh, Jabs is in the race today again. I think she was missing an afternoon yesterday. Okay, question number two. This patient has found to have an inverted supinator jerk positive. His triceps jerk will be normal, sluggish, exaggerated, absent. 
over the years, and you have an inverted supernatal death, what happens to the trials of steps? That should be a sector. We go, 120. Fine, exaggerate. Taps again. No, taps beaten. Rajiv comes on top. Chandrasekhar is close on heels. Let's go to the next question. The third question as brain death occurs, which is the last part of the brain to cease to function. As brain death occurs, which is the last part of the brain to cease to function. There will cortex, midbrain, pons, middle of the that will cortex midbrain, pons, middle of the The answer is middle of the Chandra Shaker comes on top, calls to his back in the reckoning. Let's go have a fourth question. Can I have what man sign in patients with large extradural hematoma? In which of the following location? Over the right temporal lobe, or the left cerebellar hemisphere, or the left frontal lobe, or the vertex? Karnohan, what man sign? The right temporal, left cerebellar, left frontal, or vertex? But the answer is right temporal lobe. Who comes Sandeep Singh comes on top. Emmanuel is there in the second slot. Priya is there in the third slot. Go, we go on to the fifth question. Newborn baby with a swelling at the lower back may all except lipoma, meningocele, myelo, meningo myelocele, dermoid cyst. Lipoma, meningocele, meningo myelocele, dermoid cyst. Okay. Here comes the answer, dermoid cyst, and we got 87 people getting it right. Emmanuel comes on top, Priya close on heels. The investigation of choice for swelling at the lower back, plain radiograph, PT scan, MRI lumbosacral spine plane, MRI lumbosacral spine, contrast and plane. The investigation of choice for a swelling of the lower back is <laughs> all the answers have come on 22 answers. Okay, MRI plane. Find 68 got it right. Emmanuel remains on top. Priya is close on heels. The seventh question in the session, superlateral boundary of the suboccipital triangle is RCPM. Rectus capitis posterior major, mi rectus capitis posterior minor, inferior oblique, superior oblique. Right. The superlateral boundary of the suboccipital triangle. The superior oblique is the answer. 52 got it right. I think Emmanuel is strengthening his position on the first slot. Eighth question is, if NF2, neurofibromatosis 2 patient with bilateral hearing loss with hand muscle wasting is likely to have a cervical intramedullary glioma, a, an ependymoma, hemangioblastoma, intradural extramedullary meningioma at the cervical cord. A neurofibromatosis type 2 patient can have an intramedullary glioma, ependymoma, hemangioblastoma, or intradural extramedullary. The answer is ependymoma. And okay, Emmanuel remains on top. Okay. Which, when CNS depressant drugs are given, which of these is the first to disappear? Ipsilateral corneal reflex, reflex eye movements, reactivity of pupils to right, consensual corneal reflex. Ipsilateral corneal reflex, reflex eye movements. The activity of pupils to right, light and consensual corneal reflex. The answer is reflex eye movements. I think uh, only 39 got it right. Okay, Emmanuel is still there. 10th 
question is most cases of coma and confusion are due to hemorrhage tumor metabolic or toxic origin hydrocephalus i think uh, dr davel mentioned that as the last line of his talk i'm sure people should get it right okay 119 i'm not surprised that was the last line okay emmanuel is still there on the top 11th question swelling at the back in a pediatric case true is the swelling increases in size with age the swelling is always associated with the der dermal sinus the swelling may be pure lipoma only the swelling is always at the lower back swelling in the back in pediatric case true is the swelling increases in size with age the swelling is associated with dermal sinus maybe pure lipoma and swelling is always in the lower back so the, that is again a sitter swelling may be pure lipoma only dr strange wow there comes another character dr house is not here dystrophic spinal state is located in cervical region is always associated with swelling always associated with scar always associated with dermal sinus usually have bifid spinous process of central vertebrae dystrophic spinal state located in the cervical region is okay the answer is usually have bifid spinous process of the central vertebrae 85 people got it right Dr. Strange comes on top. Kevin is second. Thirteenth question. All of the following may be associated with lipomeningomyelocele except dermoid sinus tract, mature teratoma, Ewing's tumor. Dermoid sinus tract, mature teratoma, Ewing's tumor. Okay, the answer is Ewing's tumor, of course. And uh, how many of us got? Doctor, sorry, is that the last question? Was that, was that the last question? That is the last question. Okay, fine then. So the at, at the end of the session, Kevin remains on top. Sarthak and Dr. Strange are there in the second and third places. Do we need to identify them or... Okay, Dr. Strange, you may stand up and introduce yourself. What is ex your real name? Huh? Sachin Mahananda. Okay, congratulations. I'm from Odisha, basically, but doing MCSD and Siddhartha. Okay, the second slot and third slot? They're not there? Okay, then. Thank you very much. We move on to the Next, uh, Dr. Sarthak, Dr. Sarthak and Dr. Kevin, are they here? I thought they were online. Okay. Thank you very much again. I don't know. There is a slight change in the program, I believe. Now that Sita is going to present a second talk. Yeah, clinical approach to an adult with seizures. All audience be alert for the rapid talk. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah, managing epilepsy in 15 minutes will be rapid fire only. So we we'll discuss uh, briefly about again definitions. I will not go. Classification of epilepsy is very important before you choose the drug. So that's most of the time doesn't happen, and everybody gets only one drug that is levetiracetam. And uh, classific after that, how to investigate? There is no need to do every patient uh, an imaging required or not. These are all the dilemmas, and choosing the right anti-epileptic drug. And what are the drug interactions? Because we do see more side effects of the medicine rather. Than rather than the side effects of the seizures. And do you do monotherapy or polytherapy? And how do you manage it? See, epilepsy people will, people, persons with epilepsy will have a lot of comorbidities like depression, anxiety, 
not able to cope up. So you need a lot of counseling and uh, managing. It's a holistic approach in the management. And uh, how to discontinue anti-epileptic drugs and when to refer for epilepsy surgery. So we should know what is the difference between seizure and epilepsy because single seizure may not be treated or need not be treated in most of the settings. Treating a single seizure will not alter the natural course of epilepsy. So there are a lot of discussions uh, to decide whether you treat for six months, one year or two years. Whereas epilepsy is defined as two or more seizures which are not provoked by systemic or acute neurological insults. Whereas if a person gets two or four seizures within 24 hours, still you count it as a single seizure. It's not epilepsy because once you label somebody as epilepsy, it has a lot of implications for their career, uh, personal life. And so we should be careful in labeling somebody. And But before going into the history, I will not show any videos because the time is short. But we should at least... Do simple classification. IALE complication, uh, classification is very complex. But first, we should know whether it is focal or generalized. That occurs only by taking a good history. So if it is a focal seizure, the person will have some premonition or an aura like epigastric rising, fear, palpitations, or a sensation in the hand or leg, or a focal jerking of face or the hand. So we should ask, do you know anything before the onset of the seizure? That is a focal seizure if the person knows. And generalized seizure, usually they will not know anything. Suddenly they fall with a cry followed by typical tonic posturing followed by tonic clonic seizures. That is called nowadays a bilateral tonic clonic seizures or a generalized tonic clonic seizures. In the focal, whether it is a simple partial seizure or now called focal motor aware seizures, where it is example is epilepsy, a partial is continuous, where the person knows everything. The second one is complex partial, now called, called now it is called as focal motor unaware seizures. And secondary generalized seizures are bilateral tonic-clonic. Even in generalized epilepsies, the person usually in children can have absences, which is nothing but sudden cessation of the ongoing activity for few seconds occurring many times in the day. Myoclonic, where the person will get myoclonic jerks, typically seen in a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, but also in many of the symptomatic or structural epilepsies in children, Atonic seizures where the child while walking suddenly falls. What we have seen the child in the morning was atonic. Sudden loss of tone and fall onto the bed. Tonic seizures where you just, the hands go into a tonic posturing and you are like that for more than uh, two seconds. Tonic clonic seizures where this is followed. So the thing is in epilepsy, it can evolve into one into another. It can start as a hypomotor seizure, can go to focal to bilateral tonic clonic. It can start as an absence and or a myoclonic seizure and go into tonic and bilateral tonic clonic. So, because this is important, because the, she the drug you choose depends on the seizure type. And how do you evaluate? The two basic investigations are EEG and MRI. Uh, EEG will show either a focal epileptiform discharges or generalized epileptiform discharges because most of the people here are neurosurgeons. At least the, this, you should rely for the neurologist's opinion on this. And imaging, when do you do imaging? Uh, imaging is required in every focal epilepsy. In generalized epilepsy, imaging, you can wait for some time. Uh, but not immediate. Definitely, it's a must for refractory general focal or even generalized epilepsies. And especially when there is a focal neurological deficit, that is the TOTS policy which can occur immediately after the seizure. And usually, ideally, one should do an MRI brain, but uh, at least if the patient, most of the time, they say, right now, I cannot do at least a screening CT should be done, especially in adults with epilepsy to rule out, uh, adults with new onset epilepsy to rule out a focal structural lesion. So as I already said, this is an example of left hippocampal sclerosis in an adult with hyperintensity. And these are the other lesions which we have already seen in the previous presentation. So coming to the treatment, this is most important. What are the principles of treatment? Always choose the most appropriate anti-epileptic drug. Titrate slowly go upwards because if the side effect is there, the patient will either stop the drug and have seizures or will go to another doctor. And if the first anti-seizure medication fails, Replace slowly, overlap, and go to the second monotherapy, or you combine with another drug. So, how to combine the drugs, we'll see later. And you should continue the medications. These are all the questions they ask you in the OPD. So, the first session, you will say at least you have to continue minimum of two to three years after of seizure remission, not the duration of management, seizure freedom. And then, whenever the seizures are refractory, then you should, when two dry drugs fail, Think whether is this person suitable for any surgery. So now we have too many drugs to choose from. So how do you decide which drug to choose? Still follow the guidelines because these are time tested. 
But before you start the medicines, you should know what is the mechanism of each of these drugs. If you look at the first line drugs, that is phenytoin, carbamazepine, ox carbamazepine, esli carbamazepine, they are all sodium channel blockers. Even lamotrazine is sodium channel blocker. Lacosamide is a sodium channel blocker, but it is not a fast sodium channel blocker. It is a slow sodium channel blocker. That's why whenever you combine the drugs, you can combine a fast with a slow, but you should never combine two drugs of same action. Then yonismide also has multiple mechanisms of which sodium channel is one. And we have novel mechanism of action that is levetiracetam and bireveracetam, which act on the SV2A vesicles. In addition, the newer drug is Perempenal, which acts on AMPA. And in addition, most important is the broad spectrum drugs like sodium valprate, which has multiple mechanisms of action. It acts on the sodium channels, it acts on GABA. So this should be known before, you, whenever you are choosing the drug, you should know the action so that you identify the side effect. So how do you decide the drugs? Always, what is the Shiza type is important rather than the syndrome. So if, if so I'll, because we are discussing about the adults, the common sheezers in adults are in generalized sheezers. That is a tonic-clonic sheezer or a myclonic sheezer or a tonic sheezer or a tonic sheezer, which, which are all generalized. The first drug of choice is sodium valproate. Whereas the other drugs, these are all broad-spectrum drugs. So you can still use levetiracetam, you can use topiramate, you can use lamotrazine in addition to valproate, and you can use jonisamide. Whereas... But most important is after doing, after knowing the Shiza type from the history, looking at the EEG and MRI, you make into a syndrome. So in usually in children, you get Lennox-Gustard syndrome, where the best drugs are valproate with clobosome and lamotrazine. Whereas in juvenile absence epilepsy and myoclonic epilepsy, again, the sodium valproate comes in, is used. Uh, then we'll come to the focal epilepsies. So in focal epilepsies, in children, the first drug of choice is ox carbamazepine. In adults, it is carbamazepine even today. So the guidelines haven't changed yet. But because of the risk of rash with carbamazepine, so we should always explain to the person. And you are titrate it slowly. If you titrate, very, you should tight give uh, increase it every one week so that you reach the target dose within two weeks. And most important with carbamazepine is the, the phenomena of auto-induction. Means after 10 days of use, the levels go down. There is a risk of getting seizure. That's why you increase the dose after one week to 10 days so that you maintain the drug levels. And then the alternative drugs which can be still used for focal seizures are lamotrazine. There is a landmark SANA trial where the recommendation for focal seizures is lamotrazine. In UK, everybody uses lamotrazine. But the problem with lamotrazine is rash and you have to titrate very slowly. And even phenytoin, valproate can be used, levetiracetam, brevetiracetam also can be used, but they are not into the guidelines yet. And if you have a generalized seizures or a woman of childbearing use, uh, age, there is no option. You have to use only two drugs. That is levetiracetam and lamotrazine. And the alternatives in men, we go for either sodium valproate or even topiramate can be used for generalized seizures. So finally, the bottom line is broad spectrum drug is sodium valproate for generalized seizures, carbamazepine, ox carbamazepine for focal seizures. But still the other drugs which can be used are lacosamide uh, for focal seizures, lamotrazine for focal seizures, levetiracetam and even lamotrazine for generalized seizures. And Whenever we are using a drug, you should know what is the half-life based on which you decide whether to give twice a day or once a day. So the long-acting means the drugs which have, why TA, BD drugs usually have a long half-life, which are brevaracetam, lacosamide, even levetiracetam, long-acting preparations. But the time-tested, we call it as a very good combination for Shiza control is valproate with lamotrazine. Any person who doesn't respond, give this combination, you will achieve success in 30% of the people. Then another important thing is no adverse effect of every drug you are using, which are important. For phenytoin, all the drugs which are sodium channel blockers will have CNS side effects, that is ataxia uh, with nystagmus, excessive sleepiness. But most important with phenytoin is gum hyperplasia. So call the people after three months at least to know the side effects, even if they are she's a free. And with carbamazepine, it is again CNS side effects, but you can have always, once you start carbamazepine, these are all idiosyncratic, do one CBP at the end of three months. If they don't de develop unlikely, but over the years, that is, they can develop bone marrow suppression and pancytopenia. So keep a watch on that. And sodium valproate. So most the difficult side effect is weight gain. If somebody is gaining one kg per month on medication, please change the medication. The two major drugs which cause 
obesity and weight gain or sodium valproate oxcarb jepin do not start these drugs for people who are already overweight and the valproate will cause a lot of alopecia and tremors so if the drug if it is disabling you should change the drug and phenobarbital nowadays we are not using but it will cause a lot of hyperactivity and the three drugs which will cause hyperactivity are levetiracetam clobazam phenobarbital nowadays even the uh, perempenal will cause lot of aggressive behavior so we do have patients do who cut themselves with the taking a knife and coming to the saying that i don't know why it was done it is because of levetiracetam immediately stop the drugs always ask for any symptoms of suicidal ideation after you start the drugs the black box warning has come for suicidal ideation with perempenal levetiracetam brevaracetam so we should be careful when using this and with topiramate and jonisamide both are like estrogen like estrogenolamide they can cause renal stones because of their mechanism of action and they can cause metabolic acidosis so if somebody is drowsy after using topiramate look at the abg and then lacosamide is one of the drugs and it has taken off by use by in a tertiary care center by most of the neurologists replacing carbamazepine oxcarbazepine because of the lack of the side effect of rash and it can be nicely combined with the other drugs but whenever somebody develops rash on the anti seizure medications what are our options one is clobazam others are sodium valproate gabapentin levetiracetam these are the drugs which least likely potential for rash though these can also can cause rash and most important is whenever we are using these drugs over the years especially phenytoin and all the first line drugs will cause osteoporosis so supplement for, uh, always patient should be given calcium supplementation when they are on chronic first line anti seizure medications and migraine if it is associated comorbidity please give topiramate or valproate because it works for both if somebody has depression please avoid perempenal or levetiracetam even brevaracetam you should go for mood positive drugs like carbamazepine ox carbamazepine and lacosamide and then uh, the next is always follow monotherapy to reduce the adverse effects but most of the time it's not possible because we are sitting in tertiary care units so the most important in one third of the patients who come to us we should follow something called rational combination therapy so what is rational combination therapy it is intentional choice of the second she is anti seizure medication to enhance the seizure control the main principle is combine the drugs with two different mechanisms of action so so that you you get uh, better seizure control so how do you combine the drugs aids with different mechanisms of action that is any first line drug can be combined with a second line drugs or combine drugs with sodium channel blockers with drugs with multiple mechanisms of action that is you combine either phenytoin or carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine with either levetiracetam or even lacosamide because it's a slow sodium channel or topiramate you do not combine carbamazepine with uh, phenytoin so uh, and uh, Uh, so that's how you have to look at the different mechanisms of action and combine the drugs with favorable pharmacokinetic interactions the best tested combination is already said is valproate with lamotrigine and how many aids we already said do not go beyond two drugs to the maximum three drugs four drugs is extremely rare only 5% of the if you combine two drugs 70% of the people will become seizure free by adding the third drug another of uh, 13% will become seizure free by adding the fourth drug 0.1 to um, 1% will become seizure free so there is no point in adding the fourth drug and once the patients are seizure free uh, how do you manage this when do you discontinue the anti seizure medications somebody seizure free for more than 2 years what are the favorable factors to stop the drugs one is the syndrome if it is benign rolland epilepsy you can stop if it is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy the treatment is continuous possibly life long and uh, if the, if there is any focal neurological deficit or mri showing a gliosis or low grade tumor even if they are well controlled you can never stop the medications so consider the relatives uh, relative risks and benefits if somebody wants to drive do not stop the medication and uh, so th these are all the issues which you discuss in the opd and continue the medications and the relapse risk is high if somebody has epilepsy and started and have a low iq if there is a focal neurological deficit or there are persistent eeg abnormalities because we do an eeg before taking of medication always uh, if there are frequent seizures prior to seizure control that is somebody has started with a daily seizures and went into seizure remission for 2 years unlikely you will take the medicines off the baseline seizure frequency is important uh, and then 
uh, finally, if somebody has behavioral issues, avoid, uh, use the drugs which are uh, behavior uh, fav favorable. So that's what uh, regarding surgery we have already discussed. And another important is supportive care with uh, usually B12 folate deficiencies are common with the first line drugs. So always we give drugs which contain calcium, vitamin D3 along with B12. We have a lot of drugs which are available. So to summarize, the aim of management of epilepsy is complete control of seizures with good quality of life. Always start the treatment when you don't know with a broad spectrum drug, but later identify what is the seizure type and syndrome and put the patient on the drug and then uh, identify the syndrome and uh, give the prognosis as well as the management. Simple and rational combinations of two or three AEDs for refractory epilepsies who are not suitable for surgery. Thank you. Can you yes. highlight some guidelines on the driving, when to allow and all, because all neurosurgeons right. can make In it. India, there are no rules, but I will tell the guidelines of UK and US, because uh, in UK, you can drive. Uh, India, there are rules, but nobody follows, because in other countries, once you have epilepsy, it will be reported to the official authorities. In UK, somebody can drive, uh, if you are seizure free, on medication for two years. Two years of seizure remission is enough to drive, sir. But if you are off the medication, again, you should not drive at least for five years without seizures. That is called resolution of epilepsy. Resolution of epilepsy means you are followed for 10 years. Uh, for five, for 10 years, you don't have seizures, though you are on drugs for at least five years. Thank you, Narasita. Next, next uh, I request Dr. Sushanda. Uh, to give her talk on examination of an infant. There's a small announcement to the uh, participants. We are um, handovering all the feedback forms who are available here. We request everybody to fill it and drop it where, while you're collecting your certificates. Uh, people who are not available here, we are also sending the emails to them. Please reply and give us the feedback about the event. Yes, sir. Uh, Yes, and also uh, a very important thing. Uh, so people who have not done the, the checkout of their hotel rooms, they need to do it now. Next, okay. Okay, there's some issue with the present. Where is his laptop?
morning, everyone. So I'm, I'm just going to give a presentation on race to type pressure without any clinical localization. So this is probably the most common way patients with the brain lesions uh, come to the neurosurgical OPD. They may come, they may have raised intracranial pressure, but they will usually not have clinical deficits. And I will go through briefly uh, something on the pathophysiology of uh, raised intracranial pressure uh, and how and why uh, we should, uh, how will we manage these patients and what is the basic rationale between managing these uh, patients. And I will end with a small uh, couple of slides on idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is one of the causes of, of raised intracranial pressure with without clinical localization. So let me start with the Monroe Kelly doctrine, which we all have studied in uh, physiology, and which is absolutely essential for every neurosurgical resident and every practicing neurologist and neurosurgeon to know. So what it stated states is that the skull is a, a rigid box. It states that the skull is a rigid box wherein the volume of uh, brain, uh, CSF, and uh, the blood volume consisting of arterial and venous volume remains constant. This is in the normal state, and this helps in maintaining the normal intracranial pressure in an individual. So what happens when there is a brain mass? Which, uh, thing? When there's a brain mass, some part of the brain uh, is occupied by this mass, so there has to be a compensatory mechanism. And what is the first compensatory mechanism? That CSF starts getting pushed out of the uh, subarachnoid spaces and the ventricles, which is what we see when we see patients with uh, brain masses as uh, re reduction in the subarachnoid spaces and effacement of the basal cisterns, and then going on to have compression of the ventricular system. And then what happens is the venous return also tends to be improved in these, uh, uh, tend to become more so as to compensate. And these two compensatory mechanisms in turn keep the intracranial pressure normal. Then what happens beyond the stage, you can see here almost all the CSF reserve is run out and venous return also has whatever it can compensate by has run out and then the person has a decompensated state and there is an increase in the ICP. So this is basic uh, volume pressure curve that, that I showed, uh, described in the previous uh, uh, slide. So there is a compensatory phase where as the uh, volume of the intracranial mass increases, Still, the pressure is maintained constant. And then there is a point of decompensation when the nature's compensatory mechanisms are uh, given way and uh, are exhausted. And then there is a very rapid rise in intracranial pressure after that. And finally, that is left untreated. It leads to various clinical herniations, which I shall not be talking about. So I shall be focusing on patients who have come in this phase to us. So what is the essential symptomatology in a patient with raised intracranial pressure without any clinical signs? So they will usually come to us with uh, headache, uh, visual obscurations, diplopia, uh, acute transient loss of consciousness, episodes of abnormal limb movements, generalized seizures they may have, because if you have a focal seizure, you can localize it to some uh, area of the brain. Some of them present with uh, tinnitus, because we supposed to be because of increased flow in the region of the uh, jugular bulb. And uh, rarely you can have patients present with uh, spontaneous uh, CSF uh, rhinorrhea because very chronically raised ICP, what it causes is gradual erosion of the dura, thinning of the dura, and they can be they can present with spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea. But I think you should focus on these, uh, the first lot of symptoms. These two are very rare symptoms. So coming to headache. So headache usually in patients with raised intracranial pressure uh, is has a diurnal variation, as we all know, and there is an early morning worsening. So why does that happen? So when we sleep during the night, there is hypoventilation, and this hypoventilation causes increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And when partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, there is cerebral vasodilatation and increased blood volume. So as if you remember the, oh, the first slide that we saw on the monroe Kelly doctrine, when there is increase in the blood volume, there is also an increase in the intracranial pressure, because there is an increase in intracranial volume. And since the patient is already slightly decompensated, there is an increase in pressure. This causes headache. And this headache is usually bifrontal or sometimes it may be hollow, uh, hollow cranial. Um, and if it is associated with tonsillar herniation, they may have severe associated neck pain at that, uh, at that time and neck stiffness. It is usually relieved by projectile and vomiting not associated with uh, any nausea because vomiting is followed by hyperventilation and just the reversal of this happening. 
hyperventilation causes a decrease in PCO2. Therefore, there is cerebral vasoconstriction, decreased blood flow, and decreased intracranial volume, thereby relieving the headache. Visual obscuration. These are transient blurring of vision or loss of vision, which is described as a curtain in front of the uh, eyes. And what happens is this is usually seen in patients with papillary edema. Uh, what happens is there is axonal swelling and increased interstitial fluid in the optic nerve head, and this results in increased tissue pressure and the consequent decreased perfusion through the central retinal arteries and the arteries that supply the optic nerve head. So this causes a transient ischemic uh, uh, phenomenon. Some people also say that when there are herniations, there is transient ischemia to the posterior cerebral artery of bilaterally to both the occipital lobes, and this can also explain the transient blurring of vision. But the more accepted theory is the direct ischemia to the optic nerve head. Diplopia. Diplopia in patients with uh, raised intracranial pressure is because of lateral rectus paresis. So the patient will have a horizontal uh, diplopia with separation of images being more on when they try to look on either side, which is the action of the lateral rectus. So why does this uh, diplopia occur because of sixth nerve paresis? So the sixth nerve here uh, starts from the pons and then comes out and it ascends along the Clivus in the uh, subarachnoid space before entering into the uh, Dorelos canal and then exiting into the uh, cavernous uh, sinus. So at this point of entry and pass, when it passes through the Dorelos canal, it's at a quite an acute angle, and it has got the longest vertical uh, course of any cranial nerve in the subarachnoid space. So that the vertical course is what is important. So what happens is if there, when there is a herniation or there is a pressure on the brainstem from above, the brainstem starts to get pushed down. And there is, in, there is tension on this nerve because of its vertical uh, course. And it's almost like a pulley along the uh, Dorelos canal. There it gets stretched because of raised pressure. And because of that, people develop a diplopia, a horizontal uh, diplopia. The next uh, symptom they can present is this episode of transient loss of consciousness or transient alterations in sensorium. So what happens is intracranial pressure is not a static phenomenon. It's a dynamic phenomenon. And that is why Lundberg in 1970s, he described the three waveforms of uh, thing, the A wave, the B wave, and the C wave. B wave and C wave, uh, B waves are sometimes pathological. C waves are definitely physiological. The A waves are what is seen, uh, also called as plateau waves, where the pressure goes up between 50 and 100 millimeters of uh, mercury. And these usually last for about, up from 15 to 90 uh, minutes. And then gradually when uh, other compensatory mechanisms happen, ICP falls and these waves again return to normal. They remain like that for some time, again they start. So these are the A waves. And during the period when patient is having A waves, they can have intermittent episodes of uh, raised intracranial pressure, severe symptoms. That can be intermittent episodes of uh, loss of consciousness, intermittent episodes of uh, posturing. What it su suggests to us is that there is severely compromised cerebral perfusion and we need to act immediately. Abnormal posture of limbs. This usually happens when the person has had uh, early herniation. So this is important to recognize because very often these abnormal postures are misinterpreted and they are treated as generalized seizures, as we shall see in a case I will uh, discuss. Um, and there are two kinds of posturing. That is, one is a decorticate posturing because of um, upper midbrain uh, damage, which is, corresponds to M3 in the uh, GCS uh, score, motor scale, and the decerebrate posturing because of uh, uh, damage in the level of the upper pons. And these usually happen in once the patient is already herniated. So it's important to catch patients before they go into this uh, stage. And So this is an example of a child who came to us uh, a few weeks ago uh, with a 10-year-old boy who had headache for one month and he had repeated episodes of extension of all the four limbs lasting for a few minutes, for three days. And he was managed elsewhere as uh, generalized seizures and given multiple anticonvulsants with which it was not settling down. And so an imaging was done and it showed a colloid cyst with the gross uh, hydrocephalus. And he underwent a right ventricular peritoneal shunt elsewhere before coming to us. So this is the post-op scan, the pre-op scan, which shows the colloid cyst with the gross uh, hydrocephalus. And the post-op scan shows the ventricles, which are slightly decreased in size compared to, uh, compared to here. However, what you can see here is there is uh, bilateral occipital lobe hypodensities. So this is because the patient has, because of herniation, which is not treated in time, has gone on to develop bilateral PCA territory in FAPS. Okay. And he, when he, when we did the visual field assessment, he complained of mild blurring of patients. We did the visual field assessment. That shows the right homonymous uh, hemianopia corresponding with the left occipital lobe in fact. So this is the importance of recognizing these uh, symptoms of intermittent raised uh, intracranial pressure and managing them appropriately so that we don't 
allow patients to develop these kind of complications. So what are the differential diagnoses? Again, from exam point of view, we are commonly asked these questions. So the differential diagnosis of a patient who presents with raised intracranial pressure without a clinical localization, that is without focal neurological deficits, include temporal polar lesions, anterior frontal lesions, a basic frontal lesion, intraventricular lesions and hydrocephalus, uh, venous hypertension, secondary to either AVMs or dural AVFs that you present. Remember, chronic subdural hematoma. You should never forget that when a person comes with raised uh, ICP without localization. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, these patients can have very transiently uh, rapid increase in uh, uh, intracranial pressure because when the blood jets out from the uh, arterial blood system, there's an arterial pressure that comes into the subarachnoid space. That is what leads to the loss of consciousness in these patients because transiently the sub uh, pressure in the subarachnoid space exceeds the mean arterial pressure. And so there is no perfusion at all for that period of time. Again, diffuse leptomeningeal diseases and diseases in meninges can present in, present with raised intracranial pressure. Either because they go on to develop hydrocephalus or it may just be that the disease is so diffuse in the subarachnoid space they can cause raised intracranial pressure. So this is, again, I've just listed them out. The right or left frontal or temporal polar, intraventricular, hydrocephalus, subarachnoid space, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, chronic venous thrombosis, and venous hypertension, secondary to dural AV fistula. So this is for the exam point of view. So what's the principle of managing acutely raised ICP? So we need to have an imaging diagnosis. Either uh, a CT scan will be adequate in most occasions because these patients will be sick. And we have to have head and elevation because that improves the venous return. So again, going back to the Monroe Kelly doctrine picture, when you improve the venous return, there will be a reduction in the ICP. Anti-edema measures like the astrazolamide or you can give uh, mannitol or steroids. Prevention of hypernatremia, hypotension and hyperglycemia because all of these can result in uh, worsening of cerebral edema. We have to monitor the GCS score, blood pressure and pulse rate. Why? Because you need to make sure that these patients remain in this stage till you have a definitive management and do not progress on to that. And only way you can pick up before they can progress to that is by regularly monitoring their GCS score, a blood pressure and pulse rate and a definitive management to address the etiology. So just two slides about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So this is usually seen in middle-aged and young uh, women who are usually obese. And it's usually largely a self-limiting uh, condition. And there are certain pointers in the imaging that helps you to diagnose intracranial hypertension in general, particularly IH. This is the dilated uh, subarachnoid space around the optic nerves, the tortuosity of the optic nerves, uh, which can be seen either in an axial image or uh, and in the coronal image, the di dilated subarachnoid space around the optic nerve. Uh, and also empty cella. Empty cella is the most common radiological finding, but these other findings may also be present. So we use a modified Dandy's criteria to diagnose IIH, which is signs and symptoms of uh, increased intracranial pressure with no focal neurological deficits except for lateral rectus viruses. There is no mass lesion or dilatation of the ventricular system. And the CSF pressure should be more than 25 millimeter mercury on lumbar puncture. Now here it's important that when we do the lumbar puncture, we normally keep the knees flexed and the hips flexed. Okay. So, but when we are measuring the opening pressure, we have to extend the legs because when the knees and hips are flexed, there would be a uh, increase in intra-abdominal pressure, which in turn will cause a falsely rise uh, uh, opening pressure on the LP. So we have to keep the legs in external position when we me measure this. Symptoms again, headache, decrease in visual acuity and papal edema. And the management initially will start with the medical management, uh, astrazolamide and weight reduction measures. If, they, if this fails or the vision continuously deteriorates, we may have to do surgery in the form of either a thick operatorial shunt or a ventricular operatorial shunt or uh, optic nerve sheath penetration. So to, in summary, raised intracranial pressure can present without clinical symptoms or signs of localization. And abnormal movements in patients with hydrocephalus should be treated as posturing and severely raised intracranial pressure and not as seizures. And apart from mass lesions, uh, diseases of subarachnoid spaces and venous occlusion can present with raised IC. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Muthi, for your excellent talk on this uh, sometimes head-scratching clinical situation. Dr. Suchana, are you ready? So next, Dr. Suchanda will be speaking on examination of an infant. Thank you, Dr. Muthi. 
respected chairpersons thank you manasa for giving the, the this topic to speak because uh, while preparing i realized that i learned many things which i myself don't practice and i think i should do in a more detailed way and i'm done okay so this is a very important thing and uh, we actually don't do and i thank uh, narinder and dr atish for helping me with some videos and but the most important thing when you examine an infant is that you have to know about the normal milestones otherwise your examination will be wrong you have to know the growth chart for boys and girls because uh, dr vivek has rightly touched upon it and you have to know whether the child was born normally or premature most of the times we just see and we just forget the element that the child might have been born premature so your milestone assessment can go wrong if you don't calculate the age so how do you calculate the correct age of the ch of that infant so the thing is that suppose you know that the child was born 2 months premature from the history and uh, the child is now say 10 months old so the child's age will be not 10 months but it will be 10 minus 2 months, that is 8 months. So this thing, always you need to keep in mind when you are examining an infant. So these are the growth charts which are easily available from all, all the you know, textbooks and uh, internet and everything. But then these are the normal, what we are, sorry. What we are interested is, uh, what we are interested is for the head circumference for boys and girls. And these are normograms which has been done. Also lengthen this one, mostly the pediatricians use it, but we should know how to look for the normal. And then they should follow the growth curve. There may be little here and there, like you said, about 35 or something, 50 percentile and all. But then they need to follow a curve like this. The moment you see that there is a two standard deviation below the normal curve, then you know there is a problem in this child. And that is the time when you need to do a neurological examination. So these things needs to be kept in mind. And uh, so you have to know about all the milestones. I'll not go read all this. It's available everywhere and it will take time. But you have to know what the infant does at six months, what the infant does at nine months, what the infant does at 12 months. Only based on that, your neurological examination will be appropriate. Infants cannot be examined as adults. They have immature neurocognitive development, which creates a barrier in examining the neurological function. But so for that, we need to have a very thorough history of present illness, the past illness regarding other diseases, what medications, allergies, familial disorders, vaccination status, obstetric history of the mother, perinatal and natal history, social network, and of course, the review of other systems. So cognitive and development assessment, how do you do that? One slide is missing here, I can see. But okay. So cognitive assessment, assessment of the higher cortical function and developmental milestones. So the age, age, and you have, there are there's certain things called motor quotient, which can be calculated. The pediatricians use it very commonly. And they can see the milestones, which is achieved at that particular age. If everything is achieved, there's a score given to it, divided by the chronological age. And this score will say that if it is above 70 normal and all these things are there. But more than that, what is important is that you have to find out that the child is not in the autistic spectrum, which is increasing day by day so you have to see there is any regression in language any social skills and the development milestones and all these things are important so cranial nerve examination so the first cranial nerve how do you do it is uh, not very often uh, done in adults also so you can just give chocolate or coffee for a little bit not the neonat but a neonat a little bit beyond one month to 12 months you can use this and you can see the grimaces of the face or some uh, movement of the face to understand whether the baby is appreciating that or not. Cranial nerve 2 examination, how do you do that? For visual acuity, you use colorful visual stimuli such as toys or other subject. You have to make them very comfortable in your uh, clinic because you have to make them, otherwise they'll be crying and also you have to be very friendly with them and use a lot of things which will catch their eyes. Uh, one way is to like put some rhymes on your mobile and all or some singing things. And all these things you have to keep in mind that the vision can be assessed 
after 28 weeks of gestation because more and more preterm babies are coming into the picture. You have to know what, what you need to examine when. Then color vision is really not possible in case of infants and visual fields again presenting the visual stimuli in the patient's visual fields. Pupils, again, you can examine light reflex as early as 30 to 32 weeks of gestation in premature infants and it is difficult to examine before that because the iris pigmentation doesn't happen. So what you can do is you can just look and look for an isochoria if it's there. And of course, fundoscopy can be done. But then when the child is sleeping, baby is sleeping, and you have to use a midriatic. But this is important. And most of the time, our ophthalmological colleagues help us because 30% of the patient may have uh, this one, retinal hemorrhage, which are normal in, in the newborns, and, may and they may disappear after following weeks. So third, fourth, and sixth always goes together in examination. You know, like uh, with the position of the eyes, for third, it will be down and out. For trochlear, it will be up and outward. For abducens, loss of lateral movements. You should remember that doll's eye movement can be elicited as early as 25 weeks of gestation. So these things are important. Gaze is also important to rule out any nystagmus or strabismus in case of an infant. So now this is a small video. So the videos are not of me. Videos are not me anyway. Okay, so this is how you can, uh, you make the child comfortable and then this is how you photo see how the baby is tracking the object and that's how you can assess the vision and uh, also the cranial number so two, three, four and six all can be done in this similar way. Same way, can you play the video please? So this is like roughly showing choice on eyes and seeing whether they have a vision uh, or not. Till now five, how do you tell that? Jaw open, the baby always does that while it is working or and then and that uses the muscles of mastication like the masseter temporalis and lateral medial pterygoids, which with the jaw opening you can assess the fifth motor, broke a tongue depressor to elicit pain or light strokes, you know, which simulate the area of B1, B2, B3 can do for, you can see the grimaces on the face. The child will try to look towards that side. All those cues you have to take up and say whether to find for the sensory thing. And of course, light stroking of the face near the nose, cheek and lips can be seen in infants. <laughs> So, next is facial nerve. Facial nerve, how do you examine? Of course, you can examine an infant and at rest and during crying, you can see the facial muscles in action and that gives an assessment of your facial nerve. But little older, when they start understanding, you can ask them to do all those. So you can play with them by asking them to raise their eyebrows and puff their toe and all those things. So, taste can also be examined actually with salt and sugar and uh, on a cotton swab and... What they do, they, they'll, you have to see the reaction of the face and understand whether they're perceiving it or not. So, video, facial nerve, uh, you can examine the patient, see the child is crying, and so you can very well imagine that uh, the muscles are in action and the cry strength, the audio is not there, the cry strength will tell you whether the ninth uh, is also working and tenth is also working. Same way for eight play the video, you will put the stimulus of sound on a particular side. So somehow with this, uh, some problems are there, the video, audio is not coming. So the thing is that uh, so sounds you give on that particular side and then you will see that the child will turn to that side that will assess your mind. Then the gag reflex can be elicited when the uh, Baby is in a comfortable position and also that tests for the 10th and 10th reflex as well. And if there is only one side 10th gone, then you will find that there will be hoarseness in the cry. That is one way to know that the 10th is involved. And then, of course, cranial of examination 11, you ask the child to look on one particular side. Play the video, please. And then you can see on turning that side, you can see, you can see that the 
you can see the prominent you can see the prominence of the sternocleidomastoid here you can see that so that is one way of assessing turn to the opposite side and you can see this sternocleidomastoid is actually uh, prominent so that's how you can see for the 11th nerve and uh, as I have said, for the 12th nerve, you can see that uh, you can ask the, like you do for adults, you can do that, like, or while the child is opening the mouth, you can look for fasciculations and position of the tongue. And that's how you will know. And also the sucking reflex is an indirect way of saying that the 12th nerve is working. So motor system, now abnormal, how do you examine the motor system in an infant? Physicians must approach with much and delicate handling is required. Inspection through posture and spontaneous movement should be assessed with the infant lying supine. Abnormal posture like the cross feet or ankle means simply stone of the hip adductors. Stone power reflexes all can be examined. And play the video please. And you can see that here you can see this, uh, the child. Right. You can see the the feet is crossed. So obviously there is some uh, increased hip adductors in this particular child. So you know that the tone is very high in this particular child. So that's how you can assess for the motor power. So tone. now tone is defined, for all of you know, as muscles resting resistance evaluated against passive motion and it correlates with the gestational age. A sleeping or resting infant might have lower tone. You have to know that. So 20, so when the child is active only, you can assess for tone. 28 weeks gestation, there is evidence of flexor tone, but at term only, at birth term only, you get the extensor muscle tone. So all these things are to the easiest way to assess upper, upper limb tone is by knowing, doing this curve sign. It's simple like you uh, put your hand against on the opposite shoulder and you will see how far the uh, hand goes towards the opposite shoulder and that's how you know positive scuff sign means there is hypotonia, upper limb traction and recoil maneuvers or other ways. I'll just show that. So play the video. So you hold the arm of the shoulder and try to put it, take it to the opposite side. So if it goes easily and reaches the opposite shoulder, you know that there is no resistance. So it is it is scored this way. Arm reaches the contralateral axillary line, the contralateral nipple line, the xiphoid, ipsilateral or ipsilateral. That's how you can grade it as how much the tone is there. Then next is arm traction that is another way of seeing upper limb tone like what you do is uh, you arm there is again a grading like arms remain straight with no resistance slight flexion or flexion to the shoulder when it is more than 100 degree or and maintained and the shoulders are lifted and like this you there are various ways actually if you see show the play the video please so you hold the child and you just lift the arm. I mean, I could not take good videos of this thing, but uh, yeah, you do the arm and then you can see that the arm is almost there. There is not much tone in the arm compared to the lower limbs. So that's, these are ways of seeing uh, tone. Then arm recoil is a very good test. Like uh, you put the arm by the side of the body and for, for three seconds you hold and suddenly release it. And then you can, calculate the angle also play the video so all our videos huh? so whenever it comes you play it so so you see the arm flexes immediately so in this way you can actually you can grade it like angle of flexion can also be seen as well as you can grade it as uh, uh, in the same way as whether it uh, it was a flexion or there was a minimal flexion or there was an extension. The same way you can do the leg recoil test for looking for the leg muscles with no flexion, incomplete flexion, complete slow flexion, complete first flexion and difficult extension with snap to flexion. So all these are ways to assess for the leg recoil. Like you flex the hip as well as the knee and then you leave it, extend and leave it. See that automatically it goes into flexion. This is normal. So these are the ways how you test for uh, tone of the uh, leg. Then again leg traction. If the leg remains straight and no resistance felt, slight flexion. Again, flex until the buttocks are lifted. And this way, there are different grades and you can grade them of how you do, like play the video. So you just lift the leg 
while you uh, divert the attention of the child and then you will see the flexion angle you have to check and also how much the buttocks is lifted. So this way you can grade for the, these are the ways of examining the tone of the leg muscles. Then of course, as we lift up, you measure the popliteal angle and these are the grades with which you can angle. Then axial and neck tone. Now you have looked at the arm, you have looked at the lower limbs and now how can you see for the axial and neck tone that is with the lifting the head off the surface of the bed. Again, there are four grades and this you can do play the video. You lift the head, you will find that the child uh, child will not is not able to lift the head. So this way uh, is not able to do when you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is the way you can do it to look for the axial tone. And uh, ventral, then axial tone is seen by the ventral suspension tep, uh, test where a 0 is a curved back, a 2 is a slightly curved back, 3 is a straight back. And this is how I play the video. And uh, this is how you look for the ventral suspension. On the arm surface, you put the child and you see this child has an increased tone. So this, uh, there is, you can see the black back is almost straight and is uh, this one. So it's almost at grade three. So this is how you look for the axial part of, now comes power. Power is very less reliable, but these are the way how you look for slight ev evidence of contraction, active movement against gravity. All this you can do actually, but you need time to sit and do it cannot be done on an OPD basis. You have to admit the child, spend time, and then only you can do so the power sign. So mobility again, poor is when the child exhibits only stretches, normal when the infant displays variable alternating movements of arms and legs, abnormal is continuous, exaggerated, synchronized, or jerky movements. Next is deep tendon reflexes. So these are the ones which you can do. One important thing is the adductor reflex. Sometimes you can get a crossed adductor here. You do on the medial epicondyle of the femoral. The rest are the same as the adults, so I will not read through them. Sensory examination, again, by the tactile reflexes and uh, all the primitive reflexes which you have in your hand to assess them and stroking, and you see the change of the face, demeanor, and all these things. So primitive reflexes, important are rooting and sucking reflexes. I gave the time frame when they come, three to four months and until seven to eight months, you can see them. Same is the sucking reflex where you can put your examiner's hand can be put in and you can see the baby can suck this and not. They, as I said, fifth and 12 now can be seen. Moro reflex, as early as 25 weeks, you can see, but they disappear usually by six months. And uh, this is how a loud nose or a sensation of falling suddenly causes all these things. And you will see there is an abduction and, and then again flexion. So this is how you look for more. Then stepping reflex and placing reflex that looks for the legs like it comes during the first six weeks of life and disappear by two months. And placing is like you try to put the leg on the, this one I'll show you a video. So please play the video. So, so you try to put the edge on the edge of the table. You try to put the leg. You see the child you will try to put it on the table. This is called the placing reflex. So then you know that the motor system uh, development is all right for that particular age. So this is how you do a placing reflex. Then all this, you know, Palmer Graf's reflex is present as early as 28 weeks. And uh, plantar graphs, same way you do. You tap, you put pressure behind. Uh, beneath the toe and the great toe and then you will see the same like it is trying to curl downwards in a plantar flexion way that is called the plantar grasp like the palmer grasp Bobinski, as you all know it's uh, present uh, up to two years of age because of the mild brain immaturity and myelination thing and landio reflex again infant is placed either uh, facing down which causes the infant to extend his or her legs this is a play the video please and this is how this has been contributed by Narinder, and you can see, like, as you do that, you can see the leg movement. This is an example of a landu reflex. So, all these things help you indirectly or directly to see glandular sign or the blinking reflex, which you all know how to do it. Then, uh, that is also seen in the children, in uh, infants, and uh, neck writing reflex, asymmetric neck tonic reflex, all these things can be seen that are seen in the infants when they try to roll over and get up and sit. So these things help you in understanding the examination of the 
this one. Now this with all the all these things, it is very difficult. You try to lift up in the air and try to drop. You see, the, you see the parachute reflex. So, but this is very confusing. And how do you? I mean, to remember all these things because we don't do very regularly is very difficult. So there are now easier ways of knowing them, and you have to know this Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination Chart. Everything is there, and all the scorings are there. You need to have it in your, if you have to examine an infant, this is a very good chart which all the pediatricians follow. And uh, these are the scores given, there are the pictures given, and you can see all these parameters is beyond my, this one to go through the, all the parameters, but you can download it and keep it with you. And all the marks are given and you can assess with all the pictures, you can see how your baby is doing when they come to your clinic. And these are the ways you can just score it. And uh, this is what. So in summary, this is a very important tool. If you keep it in your hand, your habit becomes, and then it becomes easy examination of an infant. Patience is required to neurologically examine a child or rather in infant. Habit is to follow some chart which helps in standardization of examination. And clinical clues complements with confirmation of the radiology finding in case of infants. And one word that the radiology has to be reported by a very good pediatric radiologist. Because there is a lot of myelination and non-myelination which happens during the time. So an expert can only explain the proper thing in an infant. Thank you. Yeah, you, you deserve real compliment. You did a very good job. You know, examining approach to an infant is not a very easy task. Thank you, uh, Suchanda. Now we'll go to the last topic, Jabin. Dr. Jabin, thanks for waiting for your turn. <laughs> now Dr. Jabin is going to talk on status epilepticus post-operative patients. Approach and management. Good morning, sir, and uh, good morning, everyone. I know today the attendance is less because it's a Sunday uh, compared to yesterday. I would, uh, what is the relation of a neurologist and a neurosurgeon? Like I am talking about a neurology resident and a neurosurgery resident or a neurologist and a neurosurgery. What is the best description, do you think? It's like a Tom and Jerry. Because you see, I, I you can obviously see who is a Tom and who is a Jerry. Neurosurgeon surgery because they are not available and only neurologists are after neurosurgery for decompression, EVD, VP shunt and we are repeatedly requesting and requesting the neurosurgeon. But this is the only time where the neurosurgeons are after neurologists because the, the moment they say status epilepticus, they want a neurologist to see. So, uh, uh, I'm starting with the case Vignan. It Here is a 84-year-old man experiencing dizziness and headache for two weeks. And he was admitted to our hospital with history of trivial fall one month ago. He also had chronic kidney disease and uh, was on conservative management. Of course, he was a hypertensive since 15 years. On examination, GCS was 12 by 15, no focal neurological deficits and planted for bilateral extensor. So it was a typical history. And the, immediately, of course, the scan was done in the emergency department. And he was found to have bilateral subdural hematoma. Of course, this case was immediately taken by neurosurgery resident. And he had put a bilateral bar hole and uh, he drained the uh, subdural. Patient improved in sensorium initially and was discharged on day three. On post of day five, patient was admitted with convulsive status epilepticus. So convulsive, I am not uh, dealing with uh, uh, partial convulsive or you can say uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus because that's a different topic altogether. So this patient had generalized convulsive status epilepticus and this entity you can call it as post-neurosurgical status epilepticus. So from this case, Vignet, the questions which come to our mind are, what is the incidence of post-neurosurgical status epilepticus? So when the neurosurgeon needs a neurologist, what is the outcome of PNSD? What are the predictors of PNSC, patient-related or procedure-related? And is there any role of prophylactic anti-epileptic in intracranial neurosurgery? And how do we manage post-op status epilepticus? So in the next few slides, I will try to answer these questions with the evidence which is available. And when I was searching the literature, I could find uh, this is the biggest, uh, largest study where uh, post-op neurosurgical status epilepticus was analyzed. 
this study was a retrospective cross-sectional longitudinal study and it was uh, uh, there the cases were included from 2007 to 7 to 2015 and more than almost like 2 lakh intracranial surgeries were included and uh, it was like a retrospective study so all these patients who develop status epilepticus they were divided into two that is early and late early means before discharge of the patient which is usual in the days whereas late it can be e even years after like a patient had previous neurosurgery and after that he will uh, he can come anytime with the status epilepticus and all the parameters were analyzed and predictors were identified so the results were that incidence of early pnsc is 0.32 percent so it is very less so out of two lakh surgeries very few surgeries like 600 surgeries were having early pnsc and late pnsc was a little more it was 0.56 percent and but the important thing is the mortality is very high in patient who had status epilepticus compared to the people who did not have status epilepticus and when they tried to analyze all the factors for an early PNAC, so which patient you are going to identify for developing status epilepticus? It is craniotomy when it is done for infection, trauma, hematoma, or elevated ICP are associated with increased risk. So this trauma and uh, trauma will be mainly admitted under neurosurgery. But many of our neurological patients, like stroke patients or patients with tuberculous meningitis, and uh, sometimes. Uh, Raised density, which is common to both, they can all develop early PNSC. Whereas tumors, so which tumor is more likely to have uh, status epilepticus? When they analyzed all tumors, and this is not only this paper, the other papers have also seen that craniotomy for meningioma is associated with high risk of status epilepticus compared to other tumors, especially the primary brain tumors and metastasis. You know what is the reason for this? Because it seems that during the meningio meningioma resection, there is a damage to the adjacent brain tissue, which causes inflammation, and they are more likely to have uh, status epilepticus. So prophylactically, probably a meningio meningioma patient should receive anti-epileptic drugs. And coming to infections, abscesses, and CSF diversion. So this also we have seen in the practice that people who have CSF diversion procedures like VP shunt, they tend to have incidence of late PNEC. So this is an illustrative diagram to show the same. The highest incidence is in infection followed by the uh, tumors and trauma. So the conclusion of the study is that occurrence of early and late PNEC is associated with high mortality. So th there is no exactly uh, clear cut risk factors, but to our knowledge, basically, tumor, uh, hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, either due to subarachnoid hemorrhage or due to hypertensive hemorrhage, and CSF diversion was associated with high risk of early PNSC. So then coming back to, uh, as a neurosurgery resident, you would uh, there is always confusion because you may be asked in the viva, what is the definition of status epilepticus? So the traditional definition is that status epilepticus is more than 30 minutes. And how this 30 minutes magical figure has come is that after 30 minutes, usually there is no chance of reversion to normalcy. So most of the times it becomes established and neuronal damage is maximum after 30 minutes. So this 30 minutes was the traditional definition. But later on, over a period of time, they realized that you can't wait till 30 minutes not to intervene because the high mortality increases as the time is going on. So there is another definition called as operational definition of status epilepticus and that is more than five minutes. Why five minutes has come again? Because most of the seizures which we see even in video EG labs, they don't last more than two minutes. So generally seizures, they abort by themselves and they abort within one to two minutes. So any seizure which is persisting for more than five minutes, especially a GTCS, is unlikely to abort. So that's why this five minutes was considered for generalized convulsive status epilepticus. I would also like to introduce this concept called as T1 and T2. Where else you have found T1 and T2? T1 and T2 is also seen in MRI. T1 and T2 is in electrodes of the EEG. But there is another T1 and T2 in status epilepticus. So this diagram is not so clear. 
but the blue line is generalized convulsive status epilepticus. Here, five minutes is the T1 time. That means you want intervention at five minutes. And 30 minutes is the T2 time. So damage is very, very, um, very severe after 30 minutes. Whereas the same T1 and T2 does not apply to focal or non-convulsive status. So if you are seeing a focal status or if you are seeing a NCSC, suspected NCSC, you have more time. So you should not be in a hurry and you can, the management will be similar, but you are more, you should be more active and very, um, in the case of convulsive status epilepticus. Coming to another definition, refractory and super refractory. This is also important. Why? Because refractory means that patient, normally the management, as I will be telling you, it includes benzodiazepines followed by first line anti epileptic drugs. I mean, that is called a second line anti epileptic drug, which includes phenytoin, valproic acid, levetiracetam. And usually, if they fail, you directly you have to go to anesthetic agents without wasting time. So this concept that once you are loading the drug with levetiracetam or phenytoin, if the seizures are persisting, immediately you call it as refractory status epilepticus. Whereas after starting IV anesthetic also, if the seizures are not coming, it is super refractory. Generally, this is super refractory. does not come in neurosurgery. It comes more for neurologist. <clears throat> A little bit about pathophysiology before we go into the treatment because what happens during the this is a landmark paper in Lancet Neurology where you can see that the how the pathophysiology affects the management of status epilepticus. So as the status epilepticus is progressing we can see that the GABA receptors which are present on the postsynaptic membrane they become internalized. So they become less after some time. See you can see the number of GABA receptors are less. Whereas the number of NMDA receptors increase. So what does it mean? It means that drug which act on GABA receptors like benzodiazepines and barbiturates, they become less effective as the status epilepticus progresses. And the drugs which act on NMDA receptors like topiramate, parampanil, or ketamine, they become more effective after some time. So any status epilepticus, this is already I have been told. So we are going to, this is, we are not going to make, uh, waste much time, but always ABCs are important. Vitals are more important. If the patient is unconscious, you will obviously intubate the patient if there is a hypoxia. And the most important thing you have to check is serum electrolytes, arterial blood gases, and anti-epileptic drug levels. This is important if the patient has already received an AED. <clears throat> Coming to anti-epileptics, the first line, as I said, will be lorazepam. So if in the previous patient, the patient was came to EMD. So immediately you will administer IV lorazepam or IV medazolam. Most of the times lorazepam is not available. So we give medazolam. And immediately patient will be loaded with anti-epileptics. So which drug do you use in practice? Levitaracetam, I think. So the levitaracetam is the popular drug. But I think uh, uh, lacosamide has almost replaced phenytoin. So most of the times you can safely use IV lacosamide also if levetiracetam is not effective. And another drug, so phenytoin has been replaced by lacosamide. Valparate has been replaced by levetiracetam or brevaracetam. So at the second line, you can use this drug, but don't keep on using this drug without going to intravenous metazolam if the patient continues to have GTCs. If the patient is fine, there is no recurrence of seizures, you can wait. But if there is a seizure recurrence, then you have to go with IV metazolam. And you can keep trying the previous drugs if necessary. So what is the role of newer AADs and immunotherapy? So as I already told, parampenil, it's an AMPA receptor antagonist. So recently, previously we were using more of topiramate, which can be given as in the orally with the loading and followed by maintenance dose. It acts on NMDA. Nowadays, we are using more of parampenil. So parampenil is again given in the doses of 32 milligram per day in cases of status epilepticus. But all this is usually more often for focal status epilepticus because you have some time. And coming to steroids, why are steroids important in status epilepticus? I think this is the trick which everyone has to learn that in this pathway, steroids were not mentioned because the evidence is weak. 
but most of the times what we do is once this uh, the second line drugs are failing we give little bit of steroids here either you can choose dexamethasone or methylprednisolone but dexamethasone will be much safer why we are giving steroid <clears throat> now we have realized that there is a co added component of inflammation in cases of status epilepticus so there was evidence that IL-1, IL-6 and cytokine levels increase and there is microglial activation. So to combat that, steroids can be safely added at this stage and continued with the anesthetic drug. Coming to the first question, whether that patient should have been put on prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs. So this is a systematic review which says what is the role of perioperative seizure prophylaxis in brain tumor resection? They realized that it is more important. Uh, there was not much difference between people who were given prophylactic anti-epileptic and which was not given. Contradicted to another trial, in this trial they found more useful. So it is left to the neurosurgeons whether they want to give prophylactic anti-epileptic or they don't want to give. And coming to, uh, pay, this is the Indian study uh, from um, KGMC Lucknow. They have also advocated that prophylactic anti-epileptic uh, would probably uh, save patients from developing a post-op status epilepticus. So the evidence is still weak. There is need for randomized control study for prophylactic anti-epileptic to decide and which patients should be given. But the, what we have to understand is management of PNAC is similar to in the lines of status epilepticus. So I will conclude by saying that time is brain and neuro <laughs> neurosurgeons also may need neurologists. Thank you. Thank you, Jabin, for your uh, excellent presentation within the time. That is very important. Everything now. Now we are moving on to the FCQ test. May I request Dr. Sandhya to come at that test? Let's move on to the third quiz of the day. Can we have the pin, please? Okay, we have the top 10 now. So here are the top 10 for today. We have three more quizzes lined up. Can we have the pin, please? Okay, it is five three eight nine two eight zero. Twenty-two. 
So we have 100. One not one. Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, shall we start? So we have 16 questions. The first one is tremors related to cerebellar dysfunction can be brought out through all the following tests except finger nose, finger test, heel knee shin test, drawing the Archimedes spiral or Romberg's test. Choose the wrong one out. So we have 66 people with the right answer, Romberg's test. We have all new players now. Second question. One of the following is a less predictor of post-neurosurgical status epilepticus. Surgery for CNS infections, intratentorial surgery, resection of the parenchymal primary brain tumors, resection of the focal cortical dysplasia. Which is the less predictor? Intratentorial surgery, we have 67 people with the right answer. Can we have the top five, please? Okay, we have two more. Yeah. Third question, earliest when vision can be assessed? 28 weeks, 32, 34, 36. So this is just from the immediate presentation. Eighty seven with the right answer. We have Chandeshekar and Dr. Harish very close. Fourth question, please. When the third cranial nerve is injured completely, we find down and out position of the eye, complete ptosis, dilatation of the pupil, all of the above. Ninety-three people with the right answer. We have Kevin J.S. and K.P. now. Fifth question, please. Scarf sign is used to assess lower limb tone, upper limb tone, axial tone, none of the above. Upper limb tone with 93 people. Next question, please. We have a very close competition. The sucking reflex assesses which cranial nerve indirectly? Facial and trigeminal, trigeminal and hypoglossal, facial and hypoglossal, only hypoglossal. Trigeminal and hypoglossal. Can we have the scoreboard, please? Okay, KP and Chandrasekhar. Next question, please. Behavioral disturbances as an adverse effect is seen with which of the following anti seizure medications? <coughs> Levitracetam, parampanil, clobazam, all of the above. Okay, all of the above. KP and Priya in the lead. Next question, please. Nearly what percentage of uh, persons with epilepsy develop drug-resistant epilepsy? 10, 20, 30, 40.
So 30 person, 36 people are right. Can we have the scoreboard, please? Priya, Kirti, Pooja. Next question, please. How do you combine two anti-seizure medications for rational polytherapy for epilepsy? Combine drugs with different mechanism of action. Combine drugs with similar mechanism of action. Any combination can be done. None of the above. It's a straight question. Ninety-seven people with the right answer. We have Priya and Pooja and Kirti again. Commonest etiology for drug resistant epilepsy in adults is FCD, gliosis, HS, or low grade tumors. HS is the right answer. 54 people are right. So we have Priya standing with Kirti and Chandrasekhar. The most commonly seen clinical sign in patients with raised ICP is bilaterally dilated sluggish reacting pupils, bilaterally impaired adduction of globe on looking down, bilaterally impaired abduction of globe. Bilaterally impaired abduction of the globe. We have Priya, Chandrasekhar and VSJ, nuclear again. One of the following is not an anesthetic medication. IV midazolam, IV magnesium, IV propofol, IV thiopentrum. IV magnesium, everybody is right. Okay, we have a close competition again. Next question, please. Management of post-operative status epilepticus doesn't include correcting, connecting EEG to rule out NCSC, doing video EEG to locate the seizure focus, protection of airway, breathing and circulation, early administration of IV anti-epileptic drugs. Doing video AG to look at the seizure focus. It's a very close competition. Can we have the next question, please? Only two more to go. Lesions in the cerebellopontal angle produce ipsilateral gait ataxia because of involvement of floclonodular nodular lobe, involvement of superior cerebellar peduncle, involvement of middle cerebellar peduncle, or the involvement of dentate nucleus. Uh, the right answer is involvement of dentate nucleus. It's an exclusion criteria. We have Priya, Jabs and KP. The next question, please. Which intracranial tumor is associated with maximum incidence of early post-operative seizures? Glioblastoma, ependymoma, meningioma and metastasis. The answer is meningioma. 83 people are right. Can we have the scoreboard, please? Okay, we have Priya, Jabs, and VSJ. The last question. Which AD has least anti-tumor properties? Lacosamide, valproid, oxcarbamazepine, and brivaracetam. It's ox karma mazepine. 
can we have the winners please chandrasekhar at 3 jabs at number 2 and this is dr priya can we have the winners please dr priya jabs and chandrasekhar Well taken. We have two more to go. Uh, all the best for the next. Uh, four and five, please. Can you just display it once? Uh, four is BSG, sir. Five is KP. Who is BSG? BSG. I think online. You are KP. You are from which college? Okay, okay. KP. We'll we'll follow with the next sessions. Thank thank you, ma'am. Uh, May I request Sastri sir to come onto the stage to hand over the mementos to the speaker, sir? I request Dr. Sandeep Mohindra. I request Dr. Sandeep. I request Vijay Sardis, sir. Great. I request Dr. Suchanda, ma'am. Thank you, sir. We are heading on to the next uh, the session that is going to be the last session for today. Uh, I request Dr. Prakash Rao and Dr. Malleshwar Rao sir to come on to the stage for chairing the session. Dr. Prakash Rao and Dr. Malleshwar Rao sir, please. This is a small announcement. Uh, there are twenty-three rooms are yet to be checked out, and we request people who are available here, and people who are not available here, please do inform your friends to do that. Thank you. <laughs> The first topic they have cancelled eh? this the Easter's topic. School. Change, change, change. So change is there, huh? Oh, oh. So uh, I invite Doctor Yeswar. His topic is how to identify brain death. Chairpersons uh, and esteemed members of this audience, as you know, there is an increasing recognition of the fact that brain death is real, and also that organ donation from brain dead donors, what is called as the deceased donors, is happening in our country. Uh, Let's look at, uh, you know, there is an organization called as the National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. This is under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And under this central organization, every state has got what is called as the SOTO or the State Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. Um, also, not many of us are aware of the fact that there is a rule which has been passed, enacted by the parliament of our country, which, which is the Transplant of Human Organs and Tissue Act. This happened in 1994, and it has been refined in 2014. 
and some more additions have happened in the last few years. Uh, in fact, the NOTO is driving all the states to go ahead with procuring organs, declaring brain death and procuring organs from brain dead donors. Now, why is it this important? Unfortunately, in our country, there is a huge racket which is run where the financial misery of some is used to exploit the poor to come forward and donate organs. The government, including the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister referred to this in one of his monkey bath programs, uh, where he implored people to come forward and donate the organs when they are brain dead. Now, let me briefly introduce you to this topic and so that when you pass out and start your practice, when you are asked to declare brain death, you should be aware of that, you should be aware of the law and you should be on the right side of the law, especially in terms of the paperwork that you have to do. Now, I'm sure everybody knows about death. Death entails the irreversible loss of essential characteristics of life. So there are two things about life. One is the capacity for consciousness and second is the capacity to breathe. So this is how uh, you do it. Capacity to be remain conscious and to be breathing. So there is an interesting science called as thanatology, which is the science, the study of death and practices associated with it. This is also gaining a lot of interest. Now, when it comes to us physicians and surgeons, there are, death comes in two phases. One is cardiocirculatory death, what is called as a somatic death. And second is brain death, which is actually the cessation of the brain's functions of the brain, brain, brain stem, which includes the midbrain pons and the medulla. Now, so when do you say that there is brain death, brain stem death or brain stem death? Both are used, you know, you know interchangeably. Brain stem death is brain death. Brain stem death occurs after a neurological injury when the brain stem has been irreversibly damaged, but the heart is still beating and the patient and the, the body is kept alive. We, I, I use the term body because once brain death is declared, the patient is legally dead. So body is kept alive with all the other organs working with the help of a ventilator. Now, when do you call it as brainstem death? When coma is there, with the failure to respond to external stimuli, absence of brainstem reflexes evident on testing, apnea, which means respiration supported by ventilator. So this is the situation setting in which most of us have to identify brain death and declare it. Now, why is it that brainstem death and brain death has become, has gained a lot of prominence in our country? Uh, back in the 90s, when I finished my house agency, there was hardly two or three ventilators in the hospital. It, it had a thousand beds, but about three or four ventilators. Today, post-COVID, the nation is producing ventilators, ventilators at a frenetic pace. Every ICU and every government hospital has got multiple ventilators. Ventilators definitely are game changers. And along with the press app availability of ventilators, what has changed is a speciality known as intensive care, which has come. So along with brain death, then came the, which opened up an avenue for organ donation. So all of us will be confronted by this in our ICUs when you start our practice. So be prepared for it. Now, when do people suffer brain death? This is for a common person. When you, when somebody is found hanging and then you resuscitate, when you have a cardiac arrest and then you come back to life, not your brain is still not working. Brain hemorrhages, brain infarctions, brain tumors, and last but not the least, the most important cause for brain death, and that is head injuries. So all these is these are the common list of things with which patients come to you and are declared brain dead at times. Now, we also have to look at the mimics of coma, okay, and this includes, you know, uh, a locked-in state, like when you have patient is quadriplegic, ventilator dependent, but patient has vertical eye movements. This happens in pontine infarcts. And then there is something called the vegetative state or the persistent vegetative state, where there is an absence of responsiveness and awareness, and overwhelming dysfunction of the cerebral hemispheres with sufficient sparing of the midbrain 
and brainstem to preserve autonomic motor reflexes and sleep wake cycles the classic example of this was a lady called as vandana shanbag you know she was a staff nurse at the km hospital in the 1970s uh in in the basement of uh, her hospital wards when she went to change into the official clothing there was an attempt to rape her and this attempt led to her being throttled by a dog chain dogs were used for animal experiments in km this left her hypoxic and this hypoxia led to her to be in a state of vegetative ex existence for about 40 years the staff nurses in km kept her going her sleep wake cycles were present there were some there were no meaningful uh, movements only autonomic motor reflexes were present in fact uh, there was a lady called pinky virani who went to the court to say that euthanasia should be practiced on vandana shanbog but the supreme court said this is this is not brain dead this is persistent vegetative state and she passed away in the beginning of the this decade now another state is called as a minimally conscious state unlike a vegetative state is characterized by some evidence of awareness of self or and environment and patients tend to improve so just rule this out when you before you declare coma and we also need to rule out you know patients who have been with ben brain stem encephalitis the guillain barre syndrome encephalopathy associated with hepatic failure uremic and hyperosmolar coma and more importantly the role of depressant drugs so before you actually declare a patient as brain dead you wait for four to five half lives of the depressant drug so in your checklist before you declare a brain death there should be this part that is if propofol has been given if thiopentone has been given is five half lives over if five half lives over the impact of the medicine medicine on the brain is not there so you can go ahead and declare the brain death now <clears throat> i don't think i need to teach you about the neurological tests for confirming brain death of course the pupillary reflex i'm just narrating them for recalling pupillary reflex conjunctival and corneal reflex dot side movements these three related to the eye and then you go for the gag reflex and the cough reflex um then you do give painful stimulation at three places one is the suprapubic area second is the sternum and third is the finger bed of the finger and then once this a series of tests are done you go for the calorie tests and then last but not the least is the most important test the apnea test now the principle of the apnea test i am just narrating for the sake of ex people going for examination um you principle of apnea test is you raise the carbon dioxide level it kicks the brain stem into action and there will be a respiratory effort now how do you kick the the the, the, the medulla into action you raise the carbon dioxide by disconnecting the ventilator for 10 minutes and before we do that the baseline carbon dioxide should be evaluated with a blood gas analysis it should be between 40 and 50 and then you can raise it to up to 60 mm or demonstrate a rise of over 20 mm so if the baseline was 45 it should be more than 65 if the baseline was 40 it should be more than 60 the absolute value for which when when we can declare brain death is when the apnea test is positive is when there is no respiratory response when the pco2 goes beyond 60 so this is the most important test now how do we do the apnea test this is a brief thing about the apnea test first of all you pre oxygenate the patient with 100% oxygen for about 10 to 15 minutes and then you draw the baseline abg then once this is done you disconnect the ventilator so deliver oxygen at the rate of 6 liters per minute through an intratracheal or nasal cannula um, watch intratracheal is the best intratracheal cannula because a patient intra endotracheal tube cannula and then you watch for any respiratory effort the, the duration of disconnection is 10 minutes so pre oxygenate for 10 minutes disconnect attach the oxygen cannula wait watch for 10 minutes okay by the 8th minute start draw the first abg and it, that should demonstrate a rise of 20 mm of base, uh, carbon dioxide or which beyond the value absolute value of 60 now why 8th minute is chosen is 
if the eight month value is not reaching the appropriate levels you can do it again at the 10th minute so you draw two uh, two uh, abg blood samples for arterial blood gas analysis okay. so this is the way in which the apnea test is done now there are times when you cannot or you have to abort an, the apnea test how do we when do we stop the apnea test one is when there is a precipitous fall in blood pressure if the bp is dropping the patient is on supports don't continue with the apnea test you can abort the apnea test and two when there is an fall in oxygen saturation if the pcp uh, saturation falls below 60 70 don't wait till it, you know by the time you reach the 80 itself you reconnect with the ventilator this is my experience from certifying more than 100 brain deaths for the sake of organ donation and the more and third but not the you know third is the appearance of any cardiac arrhythmia so these are the three red flags if you see that you discon stop the disconnection reconnect to the ventilator okay now when how do you interpret the apnea test the apnea test is positive if there is no respiratory movement noted during 10 minutes of ventilator disconnection so that means there is absolutely no respiratory effort you're watching the abdomen as well as the thorax the neck chest of the patient to see if there is any respiratory effort now there is always a fallacy when you connect it to air beds the movement of the air beds can create a false respiratory effort on the monitor so always disconnect the air bed before an apnea test is done so positive apnea test is no respiratory effort not a negative on this thing okay negative respiratory uh, apnea test is when respiratory movements are seen okay now there are some ancillary tests also i will just in a narrate about it before i sign off so when when do we you know according to the law of, of the kind passed by the parliament all you have to do is clinical testing but unfortunately many a times you will not be able to do the clinical testing especially if you have a facial max patient with a facial max injury or if you know if you know you can't check the pupils or anything also if you cannot uh, do the apnea test you have to abort the apnea test in those circumstances you can go for the ancillary test so what are the ancillary test first ancillary test is eeg now the problem the eeg should report an electrocortical silence but unfortunately the gadgets inside the icu can give rise to false signals so eeg is not the best one but you can still do that then there is something called ct angiography ct angiography is does not reveal the presence of contrast in seven major blood vessels in the brain so if that means that there is no brain circulation now ct angiography can be false negative when you have an intraventricular drain or when you have done a decompressive craniectomy so in those circumstances don't rely on ct angiography now transcranial doppler you insinuate bedside test simple you can insinuate the temporal uh, area and get the flow in the anterior cerebral artery as well as middle cerebral artery many a times it, the there are technical challenges to doing this so it may not be reliable the last but not the least radionucleotide studies unfortunately this is not available in many countries including us okay now let me also talk about a sign called as a lazarus sign which is when a patient is actually brain dead there can be flexion of arms which happening there it is named as lazarus lazarus was a man who was brought to life by lord jesus christ and so the bringing to life that event was called as lazarus sign this is seen as a sign of life no but when lazarus sign is present it means a patient is actually brain dead now according to the law of the land who can testify a four member team first person there are four people who should do the test at least one person should do the test and the other should watch and four people should sign the signatures are very very important in our country because there are times when the certificates have appeared in the court been presented in the court of the law where one or two signatures are found missing and the law the people will haul you over coals if you miss that okay now the first person to sign is the treating doctor the person who treats the patient the second person is the rmo the resident medical officer the medical superintendent or deputy medical superintendent from the administration then the third member is the from a panel drawn by the state organ and tissue transplant organization and the fourth member is a person who can be a neurologist a neurosurgeon or a critical care specialist now 
when does the organ harvest take place as soon as the patient is declared brain dead so the time of death is actually the time when the final abg is withdrawn to show that the apnea test is positive okay and conclusion brain stem death or brain death is real because many of us the there is a lot of ignorance among the medical community about brain stem death so we you guys will change that perception about it testing for brain death brain stem function includes neurological test and apnea test ancillary tests are useful when there are doubts or indeterminate there is in that in there are some in, there is an indeterminate status sorry <laughs> excuse me uh when there are doubts about the clinical testing measures you know last but not the least there is delight in death and that is to help the living let's take that delight as part of our work thank you very much professor garu and dr manas on basics of ct scan Yeah, good morning, chairpersons and uh, and friends. Uh, when I sent the topics to all the faculty, none of them picked up basics of CT scan, and uh, so and uh, then as the uh, host, so we had I had to pick up CT scan, and uh, though it's not a clinical topic, it and I could not give uh, so many topics to Dr. Anand Ram Radhyaajit, and uh, because people think that uh, CT scan is something is. Uh, uh, so common that uh, we don't have to read or how it has to be taught uh, i'll just do a simple exercise uh, we have not given tea break so i will request all of you to stand up and uh, just wish the person behind you ask his name just stand up wish the person behind you please all of you stand up and ask his name just not the person adjacent to you behind you Okay, you have done. Oh, can you please sit down? Please sit down. So, uh, no tea break. So you had a walk. Now, how many of you knew the person behind you? Can you raise your hand? Only two. Can how many of you knew the person sitting behind you? One, two, three, four, five. so that's the problem with the new world now we do not know what is going on around we know everything what is happening away from us we know all the advances advance in mri advance in neuroimaging and but we don't know what is basics so uh, so i'll speak on basics uh, i picked up uh, very few things in ct scan uh, because my resident didn't answer so i picked up that topic and uh, but before uh, i go to the topic a little bit of uh, the first question and uh... we do we want your speeches to be moving we also want to keep it moving so speech goes on too long this year we're not going to play you off stage instead we have a group of performers from the movie all the more who are going to dance you off stage If you go too long, we're going to Hollywood bomb show your ass. So let's get this going. Please welcome our first presenters of the night, Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt. Teaching. Um, if you. So we we are excited about RRR, but the, but I have added one more R. the first thing in means for one and a half days people have taught you after assimilating all the information and given you but i will in this 10 minutes i'll tell you how to assimilate that thing how to how to work in your 3 years 
to make life easier for you. The first thing, many times what we do is when exam comes, we just finish the book three times, four times, ten times. At the end, in front of exam, you are still blank. So how to avoid that? The first is read, never revise. So what you have to do is recollect, don't revise. First recollect, whenever you come to the recollect what you have, what is your residual knowledge. Uh, after you recollect, whatever you couldn't recollect, you revise that part. It will reduce half your time of your reading. And after you revision, then you reproduce. And that is what is the exam. So if you follow four hours instead of three hours, that will make your life easier throughout your residence and throughout your life. Now, this is the first scan I'll show you. Now, the first scan, can I'll have a volunteer. Can, can anybody interpret the scan for me? Um, yeah, Nemo Cephalus. So, and what is this? No, this one. What is this? Patient was operated for Nemo Cephalus. And you can see the craniotomy. And still has Nemo Cephalus. What you will do? Reoperate. Huh? Oxygenate the patient. Uh, now, what are the differential diagnosis of this? That is one. Second. Now, I'll show the, uh, another X scan. Now, this is the bone window. What is your diagnosis now? post up the same patient same time i have not given oxygen so what do you see you see one the uh, the air in the frontal sinus but the pneumocephalus has disappeared there is a small air bit here how do you explain can anybody, anyone explain this you see every day yes yeah. huh correct so so what is the so how so what is the difference in the previous scan and the present scan? What is the so can you tell what is this round I have made? You need to what is this? There is some WL and WW written. Can anybody tell what is WL and WW? Yeah, window. No, you people are not allowed. <laughs> yeah, anyone from BJ Medical College. Frame, no? You are frame. Okay. What is WL and WW? Tell me once I'm 15 minutes over. Huh? I don't know. Anybody else? So if I can explain you WL and w, uh, w in this, my job is done. Now, what is WL is window level and what is WW is window width. Now, this is every day we see. How many of you see have seen 100 scans in your residency? Can you raise your hands? So many have seen 100 scans, but we never read what is WL and WW. Now, the windowing and window level and window width is the most important thing in any CT scan. Means uh, all the CT scans, what we see is gray and human eye can only 16 shades of gray and this gray scale is actually what it depends on the Hounsfield unit. Now all of us know what is Hounsfield unit. Now, the Hounsfield unit is related to the composition of the tissue whether it's a cortex or a white matter or a bone or, or air. Now that is also called CT number. It is named after who invented Hounsfield and it, it it ranges from minus 1000 to plus 1000. And uh, so these are the different Hounsville levels of different tissue. Air is minus 100. Calcium is plus more than 1000. This is minus 1000. Gray matter, because it has blood, it is around 40. White matter, it is less dense, less, no blood. This is 30. Blood is 80. And CSF is zero or water is zero. Fat is again minus. So it depends on what tissue you have to see. You have to change your window level and window width. And 
interpret that's how radiologists are smarter than us so we also have to learn to become smarter like them so how do you decide what window level and what window width you will use to see the scan it depends on what structure you want to see if i have to see the gray matter and white matter i will i'll place the window level at 40 because i know gray and white matter is 30 and 40 and the window width is plus or minus 40 so i add so the window width becomes from 0 to 80 so all structures having then ct number or hounsfield unit of 0 to 80 will be seen in my scan if i need to see bone i know the bone is 500 or 1000 so i Keep a window width of 2500 and the level at 500 or 1000. So I'll see only bone. Whereas if I have to see blood, if I keep the window level as 80 or 90, because I know blood density is 80, and then I'll pl plus 80 minus 90. So that will be my window width. So how do what a specific when you do a scan CT scan this has this is a standard CT scan all of us go and see and this is how the patient is taken a CT scan. Now why why do we do a CT scan parallel to OM line? It is because we don't want radiation to go through the orbit because multiple radiation can cause cataract and all the uh, problems with radiation. A, a CT CT scan has multiple. Uh, uh, detectors compared to an x-ray which has one x-ray source and one detector in an x-ray but in a ct scan you have a ring of detectors all around and when we tell 16 I means the the uh, accuracy or the resolution depends on how many detectors the ct scan has so whatever the images it acquires with the 3d rotation is finally depicted in what we get the final uh, result in our CT scan. So the next is uh, where do you find what is this ST here? Can anybody tell what is ST? Slice thickness. Now why it is important to know slice thickness? Volume. Yeah, correct. It's very important in neurology. So uh, how do calculate before I go to that? How do you calculate volume of uh, blood? Because you decide in emergencies, they said we are not available, but it's the other way. Neurologists are not available, <laughs> the neurosurgeons are always there. So, decide the surgery depending on the volume of blood. And the standard is supratentorial 30 ml, infratentorial 20 ml. How do you calculate the volume of blood in a, in a CT scan in, in emergency? Can anybody tell? I've already given the formula there. Can anybody just stand and repeat what is written there? How do you calculate the volume? How do you decide emergency surgery is required or not? Or do you have to always call your consultant? You tell? You're nodding your head. No, no. He's nodding. How do you calculate the volume of blood? A, B, C by 2. So to calculate A, B, C by 2, you need for A, B, C, in the axial cut, you know A and B. For C, you need the slice thickness and the number of slices to decide what is the volume of blood to decide surgery. We don't need AI, rapid AI. Neurologists use rapid AI to know the volume of the stroke or to decide thrombectomy or not or to decide surgery is required or not. So you should have rapid AI in your brain so that you can give urgent consultations for ne to neurologist. You don't have to wait for the consultant. Sit down. No, please sit down. So how do you interpret scan? Now, before interpreting scan, you should know some artifacts. The artifacts, you can have a motion artifact, streak artifact, beam hardening effect, or partial volume or ring artifact. Now, when is there, whenever there is a foreign body, you can have a lot of uh, streak artifacts like this. The beam hardening is because of the petrous bone. Normally, you see in a CT scan, you have hypodensity uh, along the petrosis. That is called beam hardening effect. The other is a ring artifact. It's a, it's a problem with the machine. So if it may not persist in all the slices. And then uh, and then interpreting a CT scan. This is, the, this is a CT scan of an elderly showing the this is the 
central sulcus and this see the bone csf and the sulci now this is a diagrammatic representation of telling that what happens in cerebral edema in cerebral edema because of widening of the gyrus there is obliteration of the sulci and that is what you see in a ct scan whereas in a tumor the there is widening of the gyrus with obliteration of the adjacent sulci whereas the other sulci will be normal so if you have a diffuse edema like this hemispheric edema all the sulci are obliterated like this case on this side all the sulci are obliterated but here you have the sulci preserved and yet there is widening of the gyrus here with obliteration in tumor on this side everything is preserved that's what you do a scan many times you just uh, nowadays in night any ct scan is always followed with an mri it's not all the time required mri for doing emergency uh, at least decision making and this many times you can have multiple lesions it can be uh, multiple lesions most likely can be differential diagnosis so when you keep reading you make a, uh, you when you study make a list of differential diagnosis of multiple lesions because that will help in in evaluating looking for that cause like if it's so infection or neurosurgical sarcosis metastasis abscess glioblastoma glioma this is this will be recorded you can revise it in the youtube and the most important is you have to make a notes for yourself to learn similarly if in a pineal region tumor for any region you have to any tumor you have to find out what are the common tumors what is your homework is find what in a region what is the commonest tumor and so that will be the commonest diagnosis when you think of or interpreting the ct or mr and then again you have to divide depending on the age also so that will make your life easier in suspecting what or interpreting what is the diagnosis in ct and mr so frequency as well as depending on the age also one has to make a notes or read about that this again i'm giving an example of a supracellular tumor and then you first identify list out tumors of the supracellular they count according to commonest pituitary followed by cranio and meningioma then cyst then you think of uh, inflammatory lesions uh, infectious lesions then vascular lesions so if you think of one one tumor in each category like tumors infiltrative infectious vascular and miscellaneous you will always have 10 diagnoses for each reason and then think of what are the uh, commonest five and then make chart of differential diagnosis of the common three or four lesions and if you make at least one reason in a month at the end of three years you will have everything with you to to for which will be helpful for you in your lifetime so take home message or take homework not message is make presentations of lesions like like cp angle lateral ventricular third ventricular for each for yourself don't just do google and but if you do google also read and write make a notes for yourself and understand and utilize ct scans before asking for mri thank you for your attention Thank you, Master. Uh, I, I didn't get questions because I asked questions only. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Manas. The reading of CT scan is uh, it becomes very simple if you understand the physics and if you know the anatomy because uh, the tissue character and the attenuate values are fixed for the tissues. Reading CT scan or mastering CT scan or uh, making a comment on CT scan is quite simple. But the basic thing is you should know the anatomy thoroughly before commenting. So next we will be coming to the basics of MRI. This is a little bit difficult and uh, I request Dr. Anantaram to uh, speak about it. So when I was about to prepare this talk, uh, I was worried whether I'm making too much of uh, basics. But uh, after the CT talk, I think I have made it uh, correctly. That is what I feel.
Okay, okay. One point before that, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, from the previous talk, whatever uh, Dr. Manas sir has told, that the acquisition of the CT and MR will be a little bit different. So we should not always try to compare whatever we are seeing on the CT matches with the uh, MR always. So. So uh, the imaging planes for the CT and brain are a little bit different. So CT, as it is mentioned already, that we take care into account that we should not try to expose the orbits and give a radiation to the orbits. So that is what uh, the primary concern or planning will be in the in case of a CT. But if you come to the MR, it will be mostly based on the bicommissural plane, that is anterior commissure to posterior commissure. So that is what uh, which is taken whenever we are trying to plan in any MRI sequence. So again, based on that, wh what is our area of interest? So suppose if you are uh, trying to look at the uh, optic nerves in the interest or hippocampi in the interest, then we try to ch change the plane a little bit differently. So here we want to get uh, whatever the optic nerves into the uh, plane of our interest. That is one thing. Second thing, if it is the hippocampi, again, we tend to change the plane of acquisition. So whatever the angle we are trying to acquire the images will change uh, depending on our region of interest. So that is what uh, which will happen. So whatever appears in the CT may not be appearing in the same line with an MR. So it might appear a little bit anterior or posterior, depending on our plane of acquisition. Here we are trying to show the uh, motor cortex with the hand knob area in case of a CT and in case of an MR. So same uh, patient where a CT and MR was done, but the plane of acquisition will be a little bit different. So that point we should always try to keep in mind whenever we are trying to interpret a CT and MR side by side. So uh, to, uh, to put it very short, what happens in case of an MR is whenever we put a subject in case of an MRI, whatever the protons which are there in the subject they align to the magnetic field. So that is one thing. There is an alignment to the magnetic field and what we call pulse sequences or the RF pulses they flip the magnetic field from the alignment to a different plane. So once they align, you flip them by giving an excitatory pulse. So uh, whatever the speaker, what we are trying to put is to try to excite the audience. So we try to excite the audience and flip it in a different plane. So, and then you switch it off. Once you switch it off, they will relax and come back to the normal plane, which is the longitudinal plane. That is one thing. And when they are trying to relax, they come back to the main plane or they relax in the transverse plane. So whatever relaxation which happens in the transverse plane is utilized by the T2 weighted sequence. And whatever relaxation which comes back to the main or longitudinal plane is utilized by the T1 weighted sequence. So that is what a T1 and a T2 weighted sequence. So if you start seeing here, so there is an alignment to the magnetic field we give an RF pulse by means of a transmitting coil or something, we flip them. Once we flip them and we switch it off, then they relax. So one, it happens in the transverse plane. One, it happens again coming back to the main plane. So whatever which happens in the transverse plane is what uh, a T2-weighted sequence will take into an account. Whatever which happens and relaxes back to the main uh, longitudinal plane is that T1 weighted sequence. So that is what happens in case of a T1 weighted sequence or a T2 weighted sequences. 
you flip them excite them and they relax back take out the pulse they relax back whether how they are happening in the transverse plane is the t2-weighted sequence how it relaxes back to the main plane is the t1-weighted sequences so this is very brief and whatever the flipping which happens uh, if you ask me what are the main sequences there are only two sequences one is a spin echo sequence second is a gradient echo sequence so rest all the sequences are modifications of these sequences only spin echo it does a complete flip of 180 degrees you try to remember gradient echo sequences it tries to flip only a partial angle so partial angle flipping is done by the gradient echo sequence complete 180 degree flip is done by the spin echo sequence and again the next step is whether you are trying to acquire the brain in slice by slice that is what we call it as a 2d or 3d sequences whenever we are trying to acquire the brain as a single volume set so that is what so spin echo gradient echo and type of the acquisition whether slice by slice that is 2d or 3d entire volume in a single acquisition so most of the times this is the routine sequences whatever there will be a t1 there will be a t2 there will be a t2 star or a gradient echo sequence t1 spin echo t2 spin echo flare is an again spin echo with a inversion application then gradient diffusion and a 3d top for mr angiogram so if you ask me these will be the very basic sequences which will be done for most of the uh, subjects so coming to identifying them, how can we identify a T1 weighted sequence, T2 weighted sequence? So you start seeing the CSF. So CSF, if it is dark, it can be a T1 weighted sequence or a flare weighted sequence. If the CSF is bright, then it is a T2 weighted sequence. Then how to differentiate a T1 versus a T2 weighted or a flare sequence? So one thing we remember is most of the pathologies, whatever we tend to see is they are hypointense on T1, hyperintense on T2 and flare sequences. This is what most of the times T1 hypo, T2 and flare hyperintense. So what and most of the things they happen in the white matter or in the adjacent as CSF. So we can see something better when there is a complete contrast. So when there is a... Uh, background of a white background the blacker thing appears very prominent same thing or you keep a black background the white thing appears very prominently that is what we are trying to take a black and white photograph you are trying to increase the contrast very up to the maximum level so t1 weighted sequences white matter will be white or hyper intense so the lesions which are hypo intense they can be seen very better the same white matter on a T2-weighted sequence or a flare, it becomes dark so that the hyperintense lesion stands out very clearly. So that is what first you observe the CSF, then you see what is happening to the white matter. T1, it is very bright. T2, it is very dark. So this, if you start seeing here, so whatever it is there, this is a T1 weighted sequence where the white matter is very much white. That is one thing. Gray matter is something like a gray or intermediate signal intensity. Apart from it, what, are, what else structures will be white is orbital fat will also be white. This is the subcutaneous fat also will be bright. So subcutaneous fat will be bright. Orbital fat also will be bright. White matter will be very much white on a T1 weighted sequence. T2, again the CSF is very much bright, CSF is bright, T2 weighted sequence, but if you start seeing white matter is almost dark. So whatever stands bright in the white matter, it will be almost very clearly seen. So that is how the T2 weighted sequence is designed. Rest of the planes of acquisition, most of the times they are uh, there to see the lesions very well clear, which are there in the midline, or to see the low bar or not, characterize the, these things. Again, this is the T2 weighted sequence. 
which is sagittal and a kernel. Again, the same principles they apply here. CSF should be bright and white matter should be dark. So this is what will apply for a T2 weighted sequence. Then this is a T2, this is a flare sequence. So what is done in case of a flare sequence is the fluid, wherever it is there, it is suppressed so that whatever lesions which are there, which are abutting the uh, fluid surface like a ventricular surface or sulcal spaces, they are seen very clearly. So flare is one sequence where a fluid is suppressed on a T2 weighted sequence so that whatever the periventricular or the lesion suggestion to the CSF, they can be seen very bright. Again, except for CSF suppression, again, the white matter is dark only. That is what. So whenever the white matter uh, CSF is dark, then you tend to see whether it is a T1 or a flare sequence. So to summarize, again, we have seen the orbital fat, it is bright. Again, the white matter is bright on a T1 weighted sequence. T2 weighted sequence, white matter is dark. So that whatever the hyper intense lesions, they are made prominent against this dark background. Again, the CSF is flare sequences where we try to suppress the CSF and then whatever our area of interest in the adjacent to the ventricles or sulcal spaces, they stand out very clearly. Then there is a gradient sequence what we have seen or susceptibility weighted sequence. Susceptibility weighted sequence is mostly a gradient but a 3D sequence. So the name itself says susceptibility because it is very much susceptible whatever slight changes which happen in the brain parenchyma. Suppose there is a calcification or a bleed which is happening. This sequence is very susceptible because these uh, calcium or blood, they change the local magnetic field. So and these things are highlighted very well on a susceptibility weighted sequence or a gradient sequence. So here, if you start seeing this is a thrombus within the MCA where it is blowed up much more in size when compared with an T2 weighted sequence. Whenever we are trying to say blooming means whatever is there on a T2, it has bloomed up or increased in size or it has become prominent on a gradient weighted sequence or a susceptibility weighted sequence. Same thing that the fragmentation of the thrombus which has gone into the cortical branch. Again, there is a bleed which is there in the parenchyma, which is made prominent on a susceptibility weighted sequence and the blooming of the cortical veins where the thrombus is present and also the superior sagittal sinus. The same thing which has been confirmed on the MR venogram uh, MIP images. So it brings out whatever it is there more prominent on a susceptibility weighted imaging, the calcium or bleed. Then diffusion weighted sequence how we identify the diffusion weighted sequences again the gray matter is it overall it is a low resolution image the gray matter is gray white matter is still darker than the gray matter and csf is black so everything is on a low resolution on a black uh, background so that whatever we are trying to say diffusion restriction it is white and it stands out against a black background. So that is what the diffusion weighted sequence will, will tell us. You will have three sets of images, diffusion, ADC and B0 images. So uh, this is the CT scan where we are not able to see the uh, delineation of the infarct very clearly. Very uh, flare, we can see the sig slightly brighter signal when compared with the contralateral hemisphere. But coming to the diffusion, on the bl black background, everything has standed out very bright. So we always tend to compare and see whatever tends to be bright on diffusion. If it is completely dark on ADC, it is acute. If not, it can be subacute, like the lower one. So there is a complete brightness here. We don't see that much of uh, darkness on an ADC image. This is what we tend to call subacute. This is more in lining with the acute, in fact. So whatever the acute pathology, whatever we are trying to say diffusion restriction is there, we want them to be lightened up, to be brighter against a darker background. So and ADC is nothing but uh, we take out the T2 effects and we'll tend to show whatever diffusion restriction we are seeing, whether it is in the acute phase, subacute phase or just a T2 brightness which is carried on the diffusion images. 
then most of the time said there is a base vascular imaging so we have to remember most of the mra mrv we do or without giving any contrast yes you can do by giving a contrast but basic mra mrv sequences are done without contrast they are taken into account that naturally the arterial and venous system has got some flow to it so it takes into account of those effects and it will lighten up the arterial and venous system mostly for mr angiogram we do a 3d top time of light imaging that is what for venogram we we do a phase contrast venography yes you can do, give a contrast and again do an uh, angiographic imaging even with mr also so remember that uh, they are taken into account whatever the flow which happens into our region of interest in a particular direction so if you see here this is the box where we have drawn we wanted what what is happening to vessels in this region of interest and then there is a blue colored slab so it takes into account whatever blood which goes in this direction and then there is a suppression band to prevent the signal which is coming from that direction so it suppresses the venous signal shows us only the arterial signal which is present in our area of interest then these are called what we get is mip images the maximum intensity projection images are showing the only intracranial vasculature same thing phase contrast mr venography is done which you have to remember again these are non contrast based techniques whenever we tend to give a contrast uh, currently sometimes we want to see what is happening within the lumen also or within the wall of the uh, blood vessel so that is also taken into account so this is how the mr venography image looks like and this is the mr angiography image same thing something like a lateral plane of an angiogram so the projections are there the next thing is the inversion recovery sequence whenever we tend to do a inversion recovery sequence they are basically done to suppress some tissue so that they don't alter or interfere with our image interpretation most of the times we see a stir sequence which is a short inversion recovery sequence which is used to suppress the fat so fat in case of a stir for a spine uh, it appears black whereas csf mucosa vitreous they appear bright and again it is a very short inversion recovery sequence flare is to suppress the fluid it has got a long inversion recovery sequence so short inversion recovery for fat long inversion recovery for an uh, uh, fluid so this, this is spine t1 t2 and again stir sequence where we try to suppress the fat which is there but rest of the things they appear bright only csf or vitreous then this is a post contrast fat suppressed sequence again to highlight our area of interest very much better sometimes fat suppression yes sir i am done fat suppression can be used for an t2 weighted sequence so this is what again a revision which is happening so whenever to identify a post contrast t1 weighted sequence we should see whether nasal mucosa is white and fat is getting suppressed so this is a t1 weighted sequence this is a fat sat sequence where fat is getting suppressed and the region of interest stands out better finally to identify a gradient echo sequence most of the times the 3d sequences are a gradient echo sequences the basic uh, point to identify this the blood vessels they appear very bright on a gradient echo sequence the fiesta or cis whatever we are trying to tell they are also a gradient echo sequences again to identify them the uh, blood vessels will be bright and you remember that uh, most of the sequences they are alteration of these things to stand out whatever our area of interest stands out very prominently here in case of an epidermoid and whatever the advanced sequences what we use are all the gradient echo sequences because gradient echo sequences are very fast and the but one disadvantage is they are very susceptible for an motion so somebody if they can identify what is this sequence csf is bright last slide my white matter is dark t2 okay this one csf is dark white matter is bright t1 this one 
flare this one where the csf is dark not a high resolution white matter is dark dwi this is again a b0 and sw yeah done i am done with my talk thank you Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Nice talk. And CT angiogram brain basics by Doctor Sandeep Mohindra. Uh, I think uh, we are already getting late and the audience and especially the students are becoming apprehensive. So I'll just, now this is a radiological topic, basics of CT angiography, but I'll be telling from the clinic clinician's point of view, like rather mere of a surgeon's point of view. So CT angiography brain, what is the procedure basically and how it is different from the in in investigations of angiogram like DSA. It's basically a non-invasive technique that allows visualization of internal and external carotid arteries and vertebral arteries. And the prerequisite is, which you should be very careful regarding is the renal function tests, glomerular filtration rate, creatine and urea. Any patient coming to you with an intracranial bleed in which you are suspecting an intracranial pathology and you are subjecting the patient for angiogram, be careful with the renal status of that patient. The patient must not be having a single kidney or some renal pathology, chronic glomerular disease, because intracranial bleed is one of the factors associated with the renal pathologies. Once it was the patient, these patients come to you, and then you uh, abruptly advise CT angiogram without bothering about the urea and creatinine. The patients are not aware of it. Be careful. So prerequisite is renal function tests. Patient is laid supine with their arms by their side and slightly flexed head. Scan extent is from aortic arc till vertex, and the scan direction is cordocranial. It can be performed craniocordal also to minimize venous contamination in the head portion of the scan, often utilizing the slower scanners. So contrast injection considerations are monitoring slices, region of interest, from where we are interested at that particular area. Standard dose of around 120 ml of contrast medium is injected into the anticubital vein. In this case, it's not an invasive procedure. So a contrast is directly inje injected into the anticubital vein, just like an intravenous injection. The scan delay is there. May need time for extended cases in case there is a slow flow into the intracranial vessels after a major intracranial hemorrhage by two to four seconds, there might be a delay. In respiration, end of the respiration, it remains suspended. So the parameters, uh, 16 slice, 32 slice or 64 slice CT scanner detectors are there, which they detect. So these are three different types of um, uh, machines, Siemens, General Electric and Philips, which are uh, installed at our centers, varied machines are there. So how the it is analyzed? Remember, once the contrast has been injected and a number of axial scans are picked up by the computer and then they are reconstructed. CT angiogram is a reconstructed image, but we people are seeing. It is not a D, not like DSA in which you are seeing it live. It's not like that. So the observer or the the uh, the person who is on the console on who is reconstructing has got a major hand in it to reconstruct what he is constructing. It's not like DSA that this scan whatever the flow is going through the vessels you are seeing. It's not like that. So it is highly dependent upon the person at the console. Involves the evaluation of raw data, axial images, and multidirectional reformation, MPRS, using a work workstation. Reconstructs coronal and oblique sagittal thin slab maximum intensity MIPS, what we call it, of both carotid bifurcations at 1.5 millimeter thickness, leading to 40 to 50 images. It exposes the, the uh, patient to huge amount of radiations too. Three-dimensional volume rendered or surface shaded images are reconstructed using dedicated workstations. See, the first, first one, the topmost image, those are MIP images for anatomy and relation with the bone. So they are quite advantageous to the us regarding the location of a pathology, how far it is located from the bone. Just see that MC aneurysm, which is being picked up on the CT angiogram in a MIP image, 
you can clearly make out it's uh, just just below the be, below the tereon you, you make a classical tereonal craniotomy nib, nibble of the resonant ridge and you will you are going to find the aneurysm over there that image is of great help in that case the lower one is the volume rendered image that is again the surface structure of that aneurysm which which gets reconstructed through the raw data what are the indications of doing ct angiogram why we do it why the clinicians are often prescribing ct angiogram these days the subarachnoid hemorrhage remains the commonest indication the sudden spontaneous bleed intracranial bleed in which the ct scan is showing subarachnoid hemorrhage we are prescribing ct angiogram intracranial hemorrhage like cerebral par parenchymal hemorrhage to assess the presence of a vascular malformations like avms or ongoing bleed ischemic stroke to de detect the occlusion and thrombosis transient ischemic attacks to detect the carotid artery stenosis or abrupt cut off of mca follow up scans after vascular interventions so localization of arteries and veins in relation to tumors for surgical planning in some highly vascular sunoid wing meningiomas we uh, we people are prescribing in which the external carotid artery is is highlighted and the flows through the sunoid wing meningiomas can be made out in case it is there you can always think of temporary clamping superficial temporal artery or external carotid artery even in the neck so in those cases ct angio is of help in cases of sunoid wing meningiomas which are very vascular tumors of vascular origin with rich vascular supply or involving vascular structure like major vessels what are contraindications to the ct angio allergic to the iodinated, iodinated contrast material in pregnancy we usually do not uh, advise ct angio because of huge uh, radiation exposure Al altered renal function tests and widely unstable patients what are the advantages of ct angio ct angiogram can provide rapid minimally invasive evaluation of a broad spectrum cerebrovascular disorders rapidly data gets acquired widespread availability is there low risk to the patients and good bony anatomy correlation is there limitations as i earlier told you it gets the, the distortion of images is there during 3d reconstruction so motion artifacts are there false negative results are there inability false negative results in a sense that a subarachnoid hemorrhage case in which the ct angio is negative in many of the institutions there is a practice of uh, going ahead with the dsa in those cases but in some institutes we are prescribing ct angio repeat after 6 weeks it depends upon institute to institute policy inability to select a single vessel because it will show complete vasculature it it images the vessel at only one point time point does limit the ability to evaluate the flow related features of the complex malformations it also has a lower resolution than catheter angiography making the assessment of subtle wall changes such as those seen in dissection vasculitis fusiform aneurysms more difficult to identify compared to mr angiography its main disadvantage is, is the need for both ionizing radiations and intravenous contrast so both can prove lethal or fatal at point aneurysms in ct angio a pure surgical neurosurgical interest its sensitivity is nearly 97% is quite good the parent vessel status can be known the aneurysm size shape relation to the parent vessel adjacent arteries can be made out aneurysm neck size regularity you can rotate the image on the console you can go to your neuroradiologist friend he can he can revolve the whole ct angio uh, image and show you the complete architecture along with the associated vessels perforators and the neck of the aneurysm can be clearly made out and you can even pre plan the type of clip which you will be using in these cases presence and location of vasospasm can be made out to identify ruptured aneurysm in case there are multiple aneurysms the uh, surface of the aneurysm can, will will help uh, you to identify that the which one has ruptured the more the irregularity more bulbs demonstrates relation with the nearby bony structures which can be imported in surgical planning so this is in fundibulum which can be picked up even on ct angiogram funnel shaped bodily passage or opening i'll skip it so blisser aneurysms are micro aneurysms which are usually found on internal carotid artery these are the bomb shells which most of the senior neurosurgeons must have encountered in their lives and they have opened up and the ic gets just blown out these are less than 3 mm of diameter broad base and the moment you try to put the clip and the whole vessel blows uh, out typically occurs along the internal carotid artery these are usually detected by ct angio these get detected fragile and have pro propensity to rupture during manipulation even during dissection of the ic only so this is the avm does the ct angio is 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 it 
okay for a pace patient like this 65 year old male ectus two days back with a ct showing left frontal ich and no obvious deficit and this is the ct which is showing a large blood clot we were suspecting it to be a ruptured acom aneurysm but when the angiogram was done it shows a flow flow related aneurysm as well as a large avm inside the left frontal lobe so this is the surgery was undertaken for this. this is no surgery is not of our concern in this present. Uh, this is the follow-up MRI. The aneurysm has also disappeared and the AVM has been excised. This patient, patient was managed purely on the basis of CT angiogram. So this is an example of dural AV fistulas. Even dural AV fistulas can be detected on CT angiogram depending upon the flow. For paraclinoid aneurysms, this is uh, this is this should be uh, taken with a pinch of salt. At at our institute, for example, this case, 55-year-old female, first eight to seven days back, no focal neurological deficit. Then this is the CT showing subarachnoid hemorrhage, fissure grade three. And this is the CT angiogram showing uh, aneurysm projecting from ICA medially towards the, uh, medially, medially projecting uh, ICA aneurysm. And this is the aneurysm which is being seen. This is the aneurysm. So now we have a CT angiogram for this patient, 55 year old female with CT scan ruptured, uh, so-called uh, the superior hypophyseal aneurysm. So at our institute, we have got a policy of all these cases to undergo DSA with cross compression so that we are very clear about the bony anatomy related to the aneurysm. And in case of even 1% doubt, we get neck control. There's no compromise on these situations. Exter external, now we have shifted from anterior clinoidectomy to in uh, internal uh, clinoidectomy to the ex extra, uh, extra dural clinoidectomy and neck control. DSA was done for this patient. Just to show this, that it is not the CT angio which is adequate in cases of proximally located IC aneurysms. Please go for DSA. This is again an ophthalmic segment aneurysm. It cannot be a cakewalk. It, it can be a spine chilling ordeal for in some of the cases. It will not go simply every time. This is an ophthalmic segment aneurysm with the cross compression done. There's no cross com. There's no cross flow at all. So this is an example of this is a, this is a CT scan which the patient had presented giant thrombosed ICA bifurcation aneurysm, and this is the angiogram which the patient had brought, and this is the DSA. D, even DSA is showing a very small amount of small aneurysm. But it had to be a very large because CT had already hinted us to be a very bigger in size. This is an example of large DACA aneurysm. See the CT scan and the corresponding CT angio. And how nicely CT angio is picking up the relation with the bony architecture. And we can easily plan the craniotomy for this case. Again, the same case. Just see. In this case, we are mentally prepared that we are going to open the frontal sinuses. The aneurysm is sitting just below the frontal sinus. So this one is the distal DACA. This is A2, A3 junction, the upper, upper part. In this case, from this CT angio sagittal image, you can make out that this patient is going to require parasagittal craniotomy, not the anterior and interhemispheric approach is suitable for this patient. See this, the aneurysm has gone far behind. So this is the position for it. I'll just skip it. This is the post of CT scan. So this is a large, this is a giant MC aneurysm. This is the this is the CT scan which the patient had presented and now the corresponding CT angio. See the size of the aneurysm. This one. This is in our whole series of around 2000 cases, three cases with the recurrent ACOM aneurysm. CT angio picked up even this. Good person who is managing the console on the angiogram, the radiologist can even reconstruct this image and let us show that the recurrence of ACOM aneurysm below the placed clip around 10 years back. Thank you. I think next talk, Dr. Anand will be uh, better <laughs> equipped for the <laughs> CT angio basics. As far as uh, the CT angio concerned, in particularly in uh, brain death cases, do you have any uh, CT angio is concerned regarding the brain death declaration? Do you do the same way or any special things See, you mentioned? For brain death declaration, we are not doing CT angio. No, no, some centers they are resorting it, but uh, it is not validated. But still, when you order, 
do we need to give any special instruction or it is just routine? No, I think Dr. Ishwar must be knowing about it. He uh, described about brain death. City enjoyed brain death. Mike. At our place, we are not, we have never done so. Most of the countries they are not accepting, except probably the France they accept. Uh, there is CT angiogram is now the most commonly used ancillary test for confirming brain death. That is, they have a seven point scoring system. Is the contrast the basic principle is when you have brain death, there is absolutely no flow of blood in the blood vessels of the brain. So when there is no flow, the contrast will not reach the blood vessels of the brain. So there are two occasions when the contrast can still reach. That is when you have a decompressive craniectomy or an external ventricular drain. Those situations only, the contrast will reach in spite of patient being brain death. So the absence of flow in the major blood vessels, the two ACAs, the two MCAs, the internal jugular vein, and the basilar artery. So this seven-point scoring system, there are many scoring systems. This is a simple basic scoring system. If you have no contrast evident on the cerebral vasculature, means patient is brain dead. And I'm just asking about the injection pressure and other things. No, it's, a, it's the same as in uh, the other country. There is no, absolutely no difference. It's like a normal uh, CT angio. In India, are we doing CT angio to, de to declare brain death? Absolutely, because... It is not, but I think it is the, not mandatory, but it's it used as an ancillary test when the apnea test is indeterminate or you cannot do it or when another test is not done. When in doubt, do a CT angiogram because Madras Medical College does a lot of this. They are doing it, but it is not accepted. It is not validated it except is, in France. That's why no it, other country yeah, is accepting That it. is why it is called as an ancillary test, not a main the test. Ancillary test is DSA. DSA is the gold standard. Yes. Unfortunately, DSA is not available no, or cannot, the patient uh, cannot be shifted to far away places. For the law, we cannot say that we did DSA because it is not valuable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next to Yes, there's a small change in the program. So may I request Dr. Radhi Pindra to come onto the stage. So now we have MCQ test followed by two other talks. Good afternoon, everybody. PIN for this one is I think everybody heard this. Who all will be staying only, they will be getting awards. No, no online people, no Mr. Vankar will be trans. No blinkets. Anybody to join that? Shall we start? Anybody is a penny? This is an ultimate round. Try to compensate all those things. The first question is the C CT angio for cerebral aneurysms, all are to accept. Sensitivity is less than 85%. Parent vessel is identifiable. Option three, size and shape can be made out. Fourth is vasospasm. 63 people are right here. Can show the list. 
Dr. Ashok is a new entry here. So could we continue second question? Points to identify T1 sequence. Fact is white, CSF and vitreous are black and the nasal mucosa is low signal. Next option is CSF, vitreous and nasal mucosa are bright. Third option is nasal mucosa is white, fat is white and CSF and vitreous are black. For T1 sequence. 46 people are right. Can you show the winners please? So again, uh, Shok is picking up. The next question. Which of the following is not inversion recovery sequence? Steel sequence, play sequence, frequency selective fat suppression, and FGA TIR sequence. Oh, it is. 51% of right. Can you show the again the shoot? Yes. Okay. Ray stands for first. No. There's the next question, please. Okay. Limitation of CT angel is all except. Straightforward question. Now the Chandrasekhar has come up. Next, please. Choroidal point of PIC. PICA. I am also thinking the answers. But still, 26% have made right. one fourth of people in the right. New face, Arish has come up. The next, please. Reference to identify cortical PCA branches. Forty-eight of them, right? <coughs> All new new names are coming every time. New question. <coughs> All the I think this question is there. All the true about CT and UX. It was very simple, I think. Next, please. Sorry, score. Manjar against running for second. Analysis of CT angel or all or line X. The rest continues. The next, please. Identify the angular artery, terminal and for branch. Next, let's go. Okay. Maybe then just the names and all this little, so many times we are seeing all the rest of them. Identify the posterior parietal artery, MCA branch.
I think the number of people are answering this rose in this round is less. You know, around 70, 80 only. All the time I used to see 130. So score please. Kevin. Next, please. Dominate anterior cerebral artery segment. Very colossal artery. What is this question? I have not been able to understand this question. Look at the question and the answer. Dominant and the segment. Different segments of that uh, ICA with branches. Sir. Indications for CT and is all X. Support, please. Next, please. So the penultimate question. Fiesta is a BFP sequence application. I think Anandram sir spent a lot of time on this explaining this Fiesta is sequence. Straightforward. The last question and discussion ends in MCQ rounds also. Kevin is standing again now. So next, please. Non-contrast sequence used for vascular imaging for all of them. Next, please. Japs, who's Japs? No, please. Okay, we can just go through. All three are there, or? So, uh, at the end of this session, you will be, uh, the results will be announced. Please don't, don't leave early. So, be curious. All the best for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are moving on to the next speaker. Ana Anantaram Ji. Topic is cerebral angiogram anatomy. <laughs> So, uh, I would like to go ahead with this talk. So, uh, vascular anatomy usually it starts from the arch of aorta, where we see the major or great vessels, what we see a uh, brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid artery, and left subclavian artery. So, uh, this is what uh, we tend to see a, a brachiocephalic trunk, then uh, uh, left common carotid artery, and left subclavian artery. So there can be some variants which will be there that we have to keep in mind. Uh, sometimes the left common carotid artery uh, has a common origin with the uh, brachiocephalic trunk or it can arise as a branch of the brachiocephalic trunk. Left vertebral artery can arise slightly from the arch of aorta. And uh, with age, what will happen to the aortic arches? It becomes elongated. This is what... Uh, so... Uh, uh, DSA image looks like this, a uh, brachiocephalic trunk, then a right common carotid artery, left common carotid artery, left subclavian, and a left vertebral artery. So this is what. Mm. 
uh, if you see the classification of the uh, ICA, uh, uh, the most simplest and the most uh, uh, easiest classification, but practical point of view is dividing into four segments, cervical, petrous, cavernous, and supraclinoid segments. So these are the uh, uh, four uh, segments of the ICA. So same thing, uh, most of the times we don't uh, see any branches which are arising from the cervical petrous segments. Then we start seeing some uh, branches which are arising from the cavernous segment and then the supraclinoid segment. So uh, what will be the usually the angiographic uh, transition from cervical to cerebral vessels is where it pierces the dura mater. Angiographically, we take it as an uh, uh, ophthalmic artery. So whenever we tend to see that ophthalmic artery, that is what uh, we tend to see that uh, transition from uh, cervical to cranial segment at the level of the clinoid process, uh, anterior clinoid process. So that is what we usually take into account. Uh, from the supraclinoid segment, if you start seeing, there will be three major branches which will be arising. One is the ophthalmic artery, PCOM, posterior communicating artery, and the anterior choroidal artery. So these are the three things uh, they arise in order one, two, and three. So usually when we see the ophthalmic artery, uh, it courses uh, inferiorly and lateral to the optic nerve, and then it crosses it. Either it crosses from below or it crosses from above. And then it gives three branches, ocular, uh, orbital, and extraorbital. Most important branch, what we have to keep in mind is uh, from where the central retinal artery, which is the ocular branch, is arising. So where it tends to cross, that is the point uh, where it tends to arise. So if you see it, this is the ophthalmic artery, where there is a abrupt bend what is happening there this is the area where, which is where it is trying to cross the optic nerve so from this segment only usually the central retinal artery will uh, arise so this is the micro injection uh, selectively where it is showing the uh, central retinal artery and the choroidal blush so where there is a abrupt change in the shape of the ophthalmic artery the, that is what we call it as a uh, uh, point where the central retinal artery arises. So until this point, you should be very careful and uh, because it supplies the uh, ocular area, then it becomes a safe point. So sometimes we have to see what is the safe point and what is the dangerous point in, it, in any artery. So this is how it either it tends to cross from below or it tends to cross from above. So this is what the abrupt change, this is what, what we call it as a bayonet, which will be there for an uh, uh, gun. So this is what the shape of how it looks like the change in the direction of the ophthalmic artery. Then coming to the posterior communicating artery, usually we see that PCOM is smaller when compared with the caliber of the P1 segment of the PCA. That is what usually we expect. But whenever it is of the same caliber of the P1 segment or a little bit larger, then we call it as a fetal origin of the PCA. So that is what, uh, depending on the caliber, we tend to see whether it is an adult pattern or a fetal pattern. Then the third branch is the anterior choroidal artery. How it courses is usually it runs first medially, then it courses laterally, which will be surrounding the cerebral peduncle and then runs in the cystinal segment. Then after that, we will not be able to see it clearly on an AP angiogram. So uh, this is what a initial course will be like this, then again a lateral course, and then it will keep merging with the perforators of the MCA. Then this is the lateral view where we tend to see the C is the cisternal segment where it runs in the uh, cistern. Then we see this abrupt bend once it enters into the plexus or the intraventricular portion. Plexus or the intraventricular portion. So until this segment or this bend, it all supplies the vital segments which are necessary. Once it enters this one, this is the transition from a uh, uh, safe to the uh, dangerous segment. So this until occluding this segment will be very dangerous, then this can be a safe segment. So this is indicated by a uh, plexus uh, or a plexal point or an acute change in the bend in case of an anterior choroidal artery. Again, if you start seeing three branches, one is the ophthalmic artery, lateral uh, ICF projection, which is going anteriorly. Then this caliber of the PCOM is almost the same of the PCA. This is the fetal PCA. 
then the anterior choroidal artery and this bend it is again showing the plexus point plexal point so one two and three are the branches which usually arise from the supraclinoid segment of the ICA. So same thing on MR angiogram also just to show that the anterior choroidal artery it courses in the cistern. So this is what it is coursing in the cistern and then it is taking a bend and then it is entering the plexus or the intraventricular segment. So there is a cisternal segment then it takes a bend then it enters into the ventricular system. So coming to the ACA and MCA branches, this is the uh, AP projection. One, there is an horizontal segment, then there is a vertical segment of M2, then there is a lateral deflection, M3 segment, and M4 is the cortical branch segment. So horizontal, vertical, lateral bend, and then again it goes vertically. Same uh, in case of an ACA, there is a horizontal, vertical segment, and then there is a A3 segment. A2 and A3 almost they see uh, on AP projection more often vertically. So once we try to identify most of the cortical branches, it is more or less uh, our area of interest is the lateral angiogram what is happening. So this just a diagram showing that uh, what we tend to forget is most of the times what is happening to the perforator. So in any A1 segment of ACA, MCA or PCA, the perforators, what, what is actually happening to the perforators has to be kept in mind. So this is the recurrent artery of Hubner, which usually arises from distal portion of A1 or proximal A2 segments. Then it comes back and supplies the antero-inferior aspect of the basal ganglia. So this is what a recurrent artery of Hubner, which supplies the head of the caudate nucleus and the internal capsule. This is the anterior choroidal artery, medial lateral deflection, then it is going like that and merging with the perforators of uh, MCA. So three segments of ACA, one is the horizontal segment, uh, then the uh, vertical segment, and then the segment, A3 segment is what, uh, from where the uh, pericalosal artery and caloso marginal artery, they uh, take a takeoff, and from there we call it as a A3 or distal branches. So this is the a1 segment, then what is happening? This is the A1 segment, which is coursing medially from the ICA bifurcation. Then this is the anterior communicating artery or anterior communicating artery segment. Then this is the A2 segment, horizontal. Then it is the vertical segment. So lateral angiogram, if you start seeing what are the branches which we usually see, the first branch from the A2 segment will be the orbitofrontal artery, then the frontopolar artery, then the pericalosal artery, this is what uh, most of the times we'll definitely identify the pericalosal artery. And this one is the callosal marginal artery, which gives rise to internal frontal artery branches, anterior, mid and posterior. So most of the times we definitely identify the pericalosal artery. Callosal marginal artery can be there or may not be there, but definitely we'll identify the uh, pericalosal artery and Depending on the dominance of the pericalosal artery, these branches arise from where it is decided. So two branches from the A2 segment, orbitofrontal, frontopolar, then the pericalosal artery, which is usually the larger or major dominant branch of the distal ACA branches. Caloso marginal artery, it is the smaller. As I told, it will tend to give three branches, anterior, middle, and posterior. And if you start seeing this, uh, whatever this is the callosum marginal artery, three branches has been uh, arising from it. Sometimes the PA or the paracentral artery, it can arise from the callosum marginal or pericalosal artery. But usually paracentral artery, it arises somewhere if you see the genu and splenium midway. So paracentral artery usually arises in the midway. Here, this case, completely there is absence of an callosum marginal artery. Whatever cortical branches are there, they are arising from the pericalosal artery itself only. So that is what. So if you start seeing a la lateral angiogram, the first branch or the smaller branch will be the orbitofrontal one. Then the second branch will be the frontopolar branch. Usually they arise from this A2 segment. Then rest of the branches which are arising or they, are, they will be arising from the A3 segment. So these branches are the anterior and middle uh, internal frontal branches. Then this is the posterior one. Then the uh, mid one will be the paracentral. 
superior and inferior internal parietal branches but if you start seeing a lateral angiogram most of the times when you want to read about the ac anatomy there will be definitely a significant overlap with the mca branches so that creates a confusion so whenever you want to see the aca branches sometimes a mca occlusion is there or non opacification of the mca secondary to avm or this thing that is the case where you have to take and study the what are the cortical branches of the aca so most of the times so this patient had an mca occlusion here if you start seeing all the branches are arising from the aca itself and only from the pericalosal artery so except this branch which is an ac uh, mca branch all the branches are arising from the aca only so all the frontal internal frontal branches then the small branches which are arising from the a2 segment or everything is arising from the uh, uh, aca only so whenever we want to study aca anatomy with the absence of mca it de definitely you will be able to identify the cortical branches much more better coming to the mca again the mca cortical branches if you start seeing uh, mca cortical branches uh, we can uh, so if you start seeing the first one is the orbitofrontal branch then the prefrontal precentral central anterior posterior parietal angular occipitotemporal then the four temporal branches so there are temporopolar anterior middle and posterior so this is what so there are four here then four here then four here so completely there are 12 cortical branches if you start thinking there are uh, totally there are 12 cortical branches coming to the segments so m1 segment is the horizontal segment M1 is a horizontal segment, so it can include a pre and post bifurcation segments also, as long as it is uh, horizontal. Then the M2 is a vertical segment, and when it takes a lateral turn, then the M3 segment it starts to appear, and then M4 is the cortical branches. So the importance of an early bifurcation has to be kept in mind whenever there is we start seeing before the upward deflection we start seeing the bifurcation of the mca most of the perforators they tend to arise from here or here so that is what we have to keep in mind where, whether there is a early bifurcation is there or not so and depending on the branches so anterior division mostly it supplies the frontal lobe posterior division supplies the temporal lobe we say whichever is the dominant division is based on which it supplies the parietal lobe so parietal lobe, if it is supplied by anterior division, we call this as a dominant one. Whether if it is supplied by the posterior division, we call the posterior division as a dominant one. Same thing for a superior and inferior, it uh, tends to apply. Sometimes if there is a trifurcation like this, the tri third branch will supply the parietal lobe. So if you take a, something like a clock and if you tend to place the arteries, the central artery, which usually remains in 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock angular artery, 6 o'clock middle temporal artery, and 9 o'clock the orbitofrontal artery. So this is what central, angular, middle temporal, and orbitofrontal. So clock, uh, if you're trying to divide it. So, so whenever we tend to see the inferior divisional branches on an angiogram, most of the times they will be supplying the uh, by the PCA. So we are selectively cannulating one vessel and we are trying to do an injection until there is something in case of an AVM. Here we can see the inferior divisional or temporal branches which are becoming very prominent, anterior, mid and posterior temporal branches which are supplying the AVM. Uh, so uh, whatever the point what we are trying to say is uh, uh, how to identify two of the important branches one is the posterior parietal and the angular artery branches so angular artery usually it has got an upward convex curve because it tries to turn around the Heschel's gyrus and then it comes out that is how we tend to identify the uh, angular artery and Parietal branches, anterior and posterior, the dominant one is the posterior parietal. Once we identify the posterior parietal uh, artery, usually one to two centimeters anteriorly, the central arteries will run. So here, if you start seeing the posterior parietal artery, which is an 
very uh, bigger caliber when compared with the anterior parietal larger one which courses up and posteriorly so this is how we tend to identify the posterior parietal artery angular artery by a bump and a upward convex curve which will be there that is how we tend to identify the angular artery apart from the clock position as i told the angular artery usually comes in the three o'clock position so this is how we tend to identify vertebral artery four segments it has got one is extra foraminal uh, then intra foraminal then the v3 segment and the v4 segment so there is a little bit controversy which is there in the uh, literature regarding the v3 segments but if you start seeing once it comes out of the foramen it takes a lateral bend then it goes up and then it goes through through the c1 transverse foramen and then it goes up uh, along posteriorly along the sulcus of the uh, c1 posterior arch then it turns down and it takes an upward bend and then it pierces the dura so this is the v4 segment this is the lateral angiogram where we saw the already the l bend the upward ascent then going posteriorly along the c1 posterior arch then takes an upward curve and then it becomes a v4 segment and the intradural segment so ap angiogram same thing yes sir I, I think I do. <laughs> but I want to see the last slide. Thanks slide. I want to see. Uh, yes. Sir. So I think I want to cover in 15 minutes is really impossible. But if you start seeing the basilar artery and the three important branches, this is the Ica Pica trunk. This is the choroidal point. What we are trying to see that this is safe on the danger point before it, all the important perforators come distant to it as sacrifice can be. Uh, useful PCA again, it has got four segments. Same thing, the most important thing what we need to identify is the perforators which are there in all the segments P1, P2 segments. Uh, so, usually, this is the medial, it has got a three shaped laterally, lateral, uh, uh, posterior choroidal artery. Uh, it has got an anterior convex segment. These are the cortical branches. Calcarine artery is identified by this bump on a lateral angiogram and usually the larger branch is the pareto occipital artery and uh, to answer the question we usually tend to take the stride sinus into an account this is the stride sinus on a lateral angiogram we come back whatever the branches which are going up will be the calcarine and pareto occipital whatever the branches which are going will be the temporal artery branches so uh, to conclude also Whatever I have tried to cover is, it is in very, in short, there are numerous variations which will be there from the angiographic point of view. And important thing is that you have to know about the extra care, external carotid artery anatomy also, where there will be so many dangerous anastomosis which will be there. And venous has been covered already. So I have just uh, uh, covered the important aspects from the angiographic anatomy. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Nice lecture. In the previous slide, you have put on uh, Rangaraya Medical College. Yes, sir. When I was doing my MBBS, you were there as a neurosurgeon there, sir. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, some, I am telling the postgraduates, they will tell MCH from Ames, but they feel inferior to say MBBS from Rangaraya Medical College. But there is one story. When Manas was there in Bangalore, Jogara you remember, he, he did his MD radiology from Rangaraya Medical College. All the neurosurgeons and neurologists used to, uh, they are sought after his advice. Hope you remember Dr. Jogara from, he did his MD radiology from Rangaraya Medical College. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> now, we call the last speaker, Dr. Vijay Sir. Sir, now I call Dr. Vijay Sardi, the last speaker, to speak on spinal cord and the clinical science, anatomical and physiological basis. Good morning, good afternoon. I am sure Nasingda would uh, come to the session because I was his guide. Uh, his, his topic being on spinal cord. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, respected chairpersons, uh, distinguished delegates, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I think this would be rather, uh, I know all of you are uh, hungry and uh, in a hurry to go to airport. So probably I I'll be a little more superficial because it's very difficult to cover entire spinal cord in uh, 
15 minutes. Why do you need this conference? Basically, I think Professor Manas is very, he wants to bombard everything in within two days into your brains. Basically, this is this knowledge is essential in daily practice to avoid unindicated surgeries, unethical surgeries. And of course, most important thing is to enjoy neurosurgery. Neurosurgery is such a beautiful uh, subject where uh, once having got taste of that, you always tend to reborn as a neurosurgeon. So literary meaning of uh, Milo, Pati Mylon is a marrow. Pati is disease. Of course, cervical is narrow. And uh, initially they called a spinal cord a spinal cord because they thought it is to be the side seat of production of sperms. So uh, let me, before we go to spinal cord, let me just uh, have some few slides here on this anatomy of uh, arm. You can see the flexor and the extensors of the forearm uh, muscles and nerves. All of, as a resident of neurosurgery, you should be thorough in this. If your knowledge in this is perfect, you can master any sort of localization. Can somebody tell me what is this muzzle? Which nerve pierces this muzzle? Yes, sir. Kevin. Where is Kevin? Online, huh? Who is offline here? Okay. This is a supinator muzzle, which is uh, perforated by post interosseous nerve. Is a branch of? Branch of? Radial nerve. Okay. Okay, this is the last in the previous lecture I spoke about uh, phrenic now. This is a brachial plexus. Can you tell me which one is a phrenic now here? I told you in which muscle it uh, starts. Scalenus antica. This is a phrenic now, right? It goes, it starts here and crosses the scalenus anticus and crosses the thyrocervical trunk and internal mammary artery and goes down. And these are the Spectral nerves, the supraclavicular nerves, all these things, and this is scalenous medius. You have these uh, nerve, 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 uh, dorsal scapular nerve going on this, and uh, um, uh, long thoracic nerve bell uh, going down on the these muscles. So uh, these are the two nerves on the back of the uh, in the thorax. What is this now? which is supplying the rhomboidus major and rhomboidus major. This is dorsal scapula. That's the reason always C5 radiculopathy radiates to the back of the uh, scapula. And this is the, which nerve is this? <coughs> Excuse me. Supra-scapular nerve, which supplies both supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So the most important thing in the exam, the residents tend to forget the most important uh, you know, the clue to the localization of any spinal cord disease, that is a wasting. People think that is a waste. And it's the most important where C5 wasting looks, C6, C7, C8, and of course, the beaver sign, which localizes to D10, and all the lower limb muscles like L L3 wasting, L5 wasting. And it gives not only to the localization, but also to the diagnosis. Suppose if the nerve is cut, if the axillary nerve is cut, where is the wasting? If C5 root is cut, where will be the wasting? And also it gives a clue to the non-operability. All right? And what is the importance of pectoralis and its importance? All of you should know that pectoralis is a big muscle in front of the chest. And it is supplied by how many nerves? Two nerves, right? Medial pectoral and lateral pectoral. Which one is medial and which one is lateral? The medial pectoral nerve is, in fact, lateral in the, on the surface. It pierces the pectoralis minor. So being supplied by two nerves from C5 to T1, in case if the pectoralis is wasted, entire pectoralis wasting is there, is wasted, that means you are dealing with a long segment lesion in the cord. That means most probably you are dealing with a non-surgical lesion or a long segment lesion, something like astrocytoma. So something you, should, you must know everything about the ligamentum denticulatum. You have how many pairs of ligamentum denticulatum? 21 pairs. First one will be in the foramen magnum. Last one at the L1. In fact, ligamentum denticulatum is a site where you can safely enter the cord. That is in between the two tracts. That is anterior spinocerebellar tract and posterior spinocerebellar tract. And sometimes because 
the most of the false localizing signs in the cord is because of the tethering of the cord to the uh, arachnoid by the ligamentum denticulatum. And initially, when you look at the history of uh, treatment of cervical spondylosis, people, in fact, they thought the clinical signs and symptoms are basically because of the rubbing of the cord over the uh, osteophytes, and they advocated the cutting of ligamentum denticulatum in order to relieve the symptoms. All right. So what are the segments of the cord you, you know of? One is cord, from which root you call it as cord equina? <coughs> yes, sir. Anybody can, can, can take anybody? I don't know your names. You are all using all Elias. Kims? Nims? Yes, Rajiv? No? From which root onwards you call it as uh, cord equina? Which, yes, sir. No. Last. L3. All right. So, from what are the segments of the cord which constitute the epiconus and conus? And let me tell something about the paraconal lesions. Epiconus? Yes. Yes, sir. From which final segment? Kim? What? See, okay. There are four segments which constitute epiconus. But you remember L3. That is from my cauda equina. From next, L4, L5, S1, S2 is epiconus. And last four, S3, S4, S5, C01 is a conus. Why conus is called conus? At least this you should answer. Because of its shape, it's conical, simple. All right. Suppose all of you know that there is a disparity between the cord and the spine, right? D6 vertebral level will harbor which cord segment? You have to add how much? Plus 2. D9 plus 3. Suppose if there is an intradural extramedullary lesion compressing the cord on the right side from the right side at L1. So what are the segments which get affected? Which segments lie at the L1? What are the terminal segments? L5, sorry, S1, S2, S3, S4. Generally, you, need, you tend to get deficits starting from S1, S2, something like that, right? And if I say that the patient has deficits from L1. Is it possible? Not possible. Yes, sir. This is something like false localizing sign because it affects the roots. L1 root will be going along the side. So when the lesion is there compressing the cord from the right side, it not only affects the S sacral segment, but also it affects the Roots coming from L1, L2, L3, right? There's a reason you tend to get a localizing sign a little higher than what you anticipate. All these things are very important in neurology and neurosurgery. Otherwise, okay, this I think you should answer. A 33-year-old male presenting with the adductor weakness, adduction of thigh, okay? So what is the likely diagnosis? Either he'll have a lesion in the obturator nerve or L3 root. Right? So how do you know? How do, how do you differentiate between both? So if you have a weakness in any other muscle which is supplied by L3, that means your lesion goes to root. If the other muscle supplied by L3 are intact, your, your lesion will be in the... This is simply something like mathematics. All right. So what are the other muscles supplied by L3? Quadriceps. Supplied by? Root value? L2, 3, 4. Same root value is contributed by the... Contrib uh, the adduct uh, abstract nerve has the same root value. These are dorsal roots. These are the ventral roots. Okay. This is how you have to... Analyze the symptomatology and signs and arrive at the proper localization in the spinal cord or the peripheral nerve.
C6 radiculopathy exactly mimics the so C6 suppose if C6 radical is involved what is it in uh, it uh, which muscles are uh, involved pronator or supinator C6 is pronator C5 is how do you remember five it resembles S all right so how many pronators are there three what are they one is pronator teres second one is pronator quadratus yes or no okay so okay well, I think the quiz also has the same question. Biceps brachialis are atrophied and you have sensory loss there. So what is the nerve which is affected? Huh? Yeah, this is a branch of musculocutaneous. How do you identify musculocutaneous by the way on the cadavers or of course surgery? It's a nerve which pierces Coracobrachialis. It pierces the coracobrachialis and runs between the biceps and brachialis. So coming to nerves at the palm, all of you should learn A to Z of nerves which supplies the palm. You have how many nerves supplying the palm? Median nerve and ulnar nerve. Right? So how does ulnar nerve supply the palm muscles? It enters the palm above the uh, this ligament or below? Um, what is that? Flex or retinacle? Above or below? It passes. It passes above the flex or retinaculum and supplies the muscles of the hypothenar muscles and it pierces the opponent's pollicis and goes inside and supplies all the all the interosse and medial to lumbricals and also it goes and supplies the adductor pollicis. So, if there is a uh, compartmental syndrome at the opponent's policies, you tend to get hand muscle wasting, which simulates the cervical cord lesion. Okay, all, all these things, I think I have covered it. So, coming to the cervical myelopathy with bilateral hearing loss, neurofibromatosis. If, what is the neurofibromatosis type here? Two. What will be the lesion? Very good. I think I'm done. So myelopathy with visual loss. What would be the diagnosis? The another another possibility is demyelination. All right. So I think all these things have covered my previous talk. Uh, coming to this, I'll just one second. I think all of you know how a extradural subdural sorry extradural compression intramedullary and idm will behave so i'll tell you one um, there's half hazard myelopathy it can be acute or chronic or ascending and descending or a myeloradiculopathy what would be the diagnosis combination of both symptoms acute or chronic myeloradiculopathy ascending descending acute what will if you if you are totally confused if it does is not fitting any of these Three classical descriptions of myelopathy. Yeah. What is it? AVM. A a a spinal AVM. And second thing is demyelination. So unlikely surgical, if you have a myelopathy, which is unlikely surgical clinically is the there is, a, there is an extensive wasting of pectoralis muscles, a lot of fasciculations, and there is absence of sensory loss. These are the candidates. We are unlikely to be surgical candidates. So localizing value in the in myelopathy, you have fasciculations, absent de dependent reflexes, wasting. In extradural pathology, the deformity is the main gluteal localization. Of course, I have covered this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, chairpersons.
and we have arrived to the end of two days of joyful learning. And I would request the chairpersons to hand over the mementos to the, the speakers for the session. Uh, I would call upon um, Manasa to come out to the stage to receive the memento. 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 And also Dr. Anantaram, sir. Okay. I request Vijay Sarkis sir to come out of the stage to hand over the the plan to Prakash Rao sir. Thank you, everyone. Once again, I know we all have been awaited to uh, see the results. And I would uh, call upon Manasar to come onto the stage and to announce the results, then hand over the winner prizes and vote of thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all of you who have stayed back till the end. Um, there's a significance. I've done so many conferences, but uh, uh, there's a significant change in this meeting. Uh, normally, the last uh, here we st yesterday we started with 120, 25 people participating, and today at the end of the day also we have 90 people participating in in the uh, quiz. And that's a remarkable change, only 25% drop. But when you see other conferences, there will be a 75% drop. At the end of the session, only 25% people will be there. And that's what I want to appreciate all the delegates uh, who stayed back and uh, many of the faculty who stayed back. Uh, I'd I like to thank all the faculty who uh, agreed to come on weekend to come and uh, uh, spend uh, time to and prepare to teach with you also. Uh, to teach everything what they know and i'm sure it is uh, it'll be helpful for you in not only in in your residency but in your uh, future uh, practice also and all the chairpersons also who came all the way and uh, two seniors who uh, professor sastri and professor mameshwar rao who uh, stayed all throughout till the end to just to encourage because uh, they don't have to learn from us but but their presence makes us everybody uh, feel uh, energetic to continue the program i i like everybody to give a big applause to both of them uh, i had selected faculty from all uh, major institutes who are prospective examiners uh, many times examiners have their own uh, way of asking and expect, expect some specific answers, uh, which if you have worked with them or you have spoken to them only, you can answer. And I'm sure uh, uh, exposure to all the uh, head of the departments and professors of many institutes will help you in your future uh, exams. The uh, I'd like to thank uh, ICON. Uh, actually, it was not my idea they came back came with an idea that they will do a course uh, education course for neurology and neurosurgery but uh, as a neurosurgeon i had my selfish motive that i should do for neurosurgeons because there is al already a neurology course going on in chennai sign every year there should not be conflict of interest and nobody has concentrated on teaching neurosurgeons and uh, so that was the first time and uh, they said they wanted for 200 people i was very skeptical having done courses in for nsi uh, usually 70 people will do and that also we have to keep on telling hod's please send please send people and uh, so i said no no we'll do for 75 they said okay we'll we settle for 100 and uh, but uh, because people always tell the residents are not interested in learning so they'll not come and uh, 
so i also thought okay 100 is fine so we booked this place but then uh, seeing the response of the residents the residents are so much eager it is it is only the eagerness of us teachers to teach them or not but residents were ready and uh, within two weeks our 100 seats were full and then again 50 we had taken request and many people we refused because we didn't have a hall to accommodate and i'm sure yesterday you must have seen we didn't have place to stay and so uh, i regret uh, that i have refused uh, and i'm sure that next year we can uh, do a bigger number and I hope we'll not uh, refuse and uh, I hope ICON has the funds to do it every year and uh, I'd like uh, a note of a uh, note from Mr. Arul Kumar to please come and tell what is his future plan for this unconditional grant, educational grant uh, from ICON to come and tell us a few words on that. Please Mr. Arul Kumar. Thank you very much sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Manas. The moment we started with a plan for this program, he immediately accepted and gave us an opportunity to do this program. And uh, we have been doing this in psychiatry for the last nine years, neurology last two years, an exclusive program for PGs. And the first program which we initiated and uh, Sir has given us full opportunity and uh, I think everyone responded. As Sir was telling, within just two weeks of time, 120 registrations were over. We had to tell to many of them because of the uh, constraints what we had about the bookings here. So in future, definitely, sir, as you told, we'll be taking into a larger number with all the support what you have been uh, or encouraging us. Yes, so on behalf of Icon Life Sciences, I'd like to thank everyone for participating here and giving us an opportunity to host this program. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our uh, uh, office bearers of Brain and Spine Society, um, Professor Sastri, Professor, uh, Professor Suchanda, Professor Subhash Kaur, Professor Sita, and uh, who were actively involved in, in identifying the faculty and making the program. And uh, But uh, before we conclude and we go for the dinner, uh, lunch, sorry, <laughs> And uh, we want to have the award ceremony, but this is uh, award will be given only to our, who are physically present till the last of the session. So people who have left will not get the award, even if they are in the top 10. Online people also will not get that opportunity. Uh, and the first one is uh, Dr. Priya Narwal. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, just identify yourself and take the group. Tell your name, identify which year you are from which hospital. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Priya from Ames, Delhi. and currently fourth year resident. Thank you. Uh, APRCH thinks he's online. Check, check. The third is uh, uh, Kastub Saha. Kustub Saha. Okay, please come on. And uh, please introduce yourself and give a moment. Good afternoon to everyone, uh, respected faculty. I am Dr. Kostub Shah from BJMC Ahmedabad. Currently, second year resident. I request Professor Prakash Rao to give the certificate to him. Professor Prakash Rao. Uh, the next is Dr. Chandra Sekha. Dr. Chandra, please introduce us. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm Dr. Chandra Sekha from Kims. Uh, I am doing final year nursing. Thank you. I, I request Dr. Sridhar Srinivas to keep that.
Dr. Chandrasekhar is from Kims. I thought they are not reading, but I think they started reading. Huh? <laughs> and next is Dr. Pooja Salonke. Dr. Pooja Salonke. Yeah. And they're from. Can you introduce yourself? This from Hinduja Hospital, no? Yeah, just introduce. Good afternoon. I'm from Hinduja Hospital, fourth year student and six years DRMD neurosurgery course. I request Professor Suchanda to come and hand over to you. And uh, the next is uh, Dr. Kavin Bharti Dr. from Ames Guneshwar. No? So, yeah, just again introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Kavin Bharati. I did my uh, MBBS and MS from Madurai, and I am uh, second year resident in Ames Guneshwar. Yeah. I request Dr. Sandeep to give the Okay. Uh, uh, this is means vote of thanks and validatory. If any of the uh, students or faculty want to uh, have some comments on how it can be done better or uh, uh, what should be the duration and how frequently we should do uh, some one or two comments and then we go for uh, lunch. Anybody wants to? Yeah, feedback form is there. Okay. Dr. In this uh, capsule, what we call a capsule. So only uh, one request and comment. Like it, uh, all most of the talks were too rushed up. So I think it is uh, difficult for a candidate to comprehend and rushed up. In my my own talk, like I, self assessment, it was too rushed up. So if it uh, number of topics can be reduced and it can be made more frequent, like six monthly or something, so that we can split the number of topics. So the topics are not rushed up. And at the end of each talk, there was no question answer session from the candidates. So none of none of the residents asked any questions actually, which is unbelievable that in 15 minutes we covered everything and you understood everything. So I think this uh, we can. I have seen that residents don't ask questions. That is why we introduced MCQ. And um, because if you didn't have MCQ, uh, at least they answered that. that they had at least listen. If you had seen at least 70% were answering correctly. Um, but that is uh, what is uh, missing. Like residents have to come forward. When I sent messages for people to uh, volunteer to case, present case, uh, only one person volunteered. And then two, I had to tell my residents. And then finally, on spot, one second resident. So uh, something has to come from yourself. It's not only one way that we only encourage. Uh, you have to uh, let go your inhibitions. Uh, so it's not that uh, you're not interested, but you have, you're have inhib you inhibited. So you let go your inhibitions and come forward to present. Then the then we can actually, we'll, the more doubts you have, the more we read and to clarify their doubts. So uh, that not only increases your knowledge, but our knowledge also. And uh, um, before I conclude, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Ajay, who conducted the whole event properly, very well. And the team of ICON, Mr. Padmanabhan, Mr. Sriram, who did all the Kahoot, and uh, Mr. Manu, whom I know for past 20 years. And uh, so they've been quite supportive in, in these educational activities and uh, all the audiovisual people, Mr. Rami Reddy also. Uh, with this, I'd like to invite all of you for lunch and see you next time.